let's just jump in here. Like we always do with book studies, you know, we, we're going to introduce the book. And what that means is, you know, I'm not going to like give you this long outline. I'm not going to talk all about, you know, date and occasion and all. I mean, I'll say a few things here and there, but what I tend to want to do in these introductory episodes is sort of give you a foretaste of the kinds of things we're going to have to think about, the walls we're going to hit, uh, the, just the, the problems and the controversies that are going to pop up that we're going to have to you know, try to think carefully through, sort of just give a foretaste of, of where we're headed. Uh, I, I will say something because Exodus is part of the Torah, part of the Pentateuch, the, the, the quote-unquote law of Moses. As I've mentioned many times before when it comes to the authorship of the Torah, the Pentateuch, uh, I am what used to be called a supplementarian. Uh, I don't buy the JEDP theory as it's presented. I also don't buy the Moses wrote every word of the of the Pentateuch or, or even you know ninety percent of it. I, I, a supplementarian is one who accepts Mosaic authorship, you know, for parts of the Torah, the core you know ideas, the core episodes, perhaps you know that that kind of thing. That that there's a, there's a definite uh, Mosaic contribution here. There's no reason to think that the you know man Moses could not have written substantially the material that we find in the Torah. And there are lots of reasons why people doubt that, especially critical scholars. And some of, the, some of their reasons make more sense than others. Uh, a, a lot of the JEDP idea is based on circular reasoning. So it assumes what it needs to prove and then thinks it's proven it. So I, I, I sort of reject both poles. And I think mo- you know, what we have here in the Torah is a mosaic core. There, there was stuff that Moses wrote. And then it got accrued to. There were parts added to it later on by other hands. And there were editorial things done to the content as time went on. You know, God used a number of people whose names we'll never know uh, to put the, these books, these five books, into their final form. So again, that... That used to be sort of a mainstream view uh, in scholarship at one point, you know, centuries ago, maybe a century or century and a half ago. Uh, it's not so much now anymore, but I'm still there because I think that just is the best way to account for all the data. So I accept, you know, mosaic authorship. I accept other authorship. I accept editing by other hands, repurposing sources, the use of sources, all that stuff. And what that means is that the, the question of date of the book is going to be variable and, and ultimately indeterminate uh, because they're just going to, you don't know which hand you know, did what. You, you know, we'll hit places, and I'll allude to a couple here in this episode, where it's very clear that, that there's an editorial hand at work. Well, we have no idea when that, that happened. So you can't pin a date on the, the book of Exodus generally, that the Torah uh, generally, you, you might be able to argue well for, well, this part's before, you know, or in this part of Israel's history, this part's in another part of Israel's history. You, you can do a little bit of that. But as far as, you know, like pinholing a date, you know, just, that, that's just not really possible. Uh, I have a, a quotation here from Eugene Carpenter's uh, commentary. He did, you know, the Lexham, Lexham Press did the, uh, it's, it's still an ongoing series, the evangelical uh, exegetical commentary. And Eugene Carpenter did Exodus for us. And, and he writes this, he says, the composition of Exodus is complex and challenging and is inextricably tied up with the broader issue of the composition of the Pentateuch. The way the author editor has compiled the great variety of material in Exodus is an example of literary and theological genius. We're going to return to that theological part uh, in, in a bit. Carpenter says that Moses was, in, in essence, the author of the book as indicated by the text itself. Certainly, Moses' life and activities account for the origin of the book. That others had a hand in its composition even during the Mosaic era is both asserted and implied. For example, Joshua, Miriam, Ithamar, Eleazar, and the Levitical priests. These people contributed to the formation of the Torah. They were not the author-editor in the sense that Moses was. They were, however, inspired and followed in Moses' inspired leadership and composition of the biblical text. Several sources are suggested in the, in the text as well, though not so evident. Certain post-Mosaic statements or features of the book indicate a post-Mosaic date for the final form of the book. So that, I mean, that's a good summary of, of a supplementarian perspective on this. And again, that's, that's the camp I'm in. Now, Carpenter goes on to list a few sort of instances or, or texts that, that suggest, again, multiple hands. And, and he writes this. The text itself ascribes the following writing activities to Moses. At God's command, he wrote the continuing warfare that Yahweh would direct against Amalek. It's Exodus 17, 14, and 15 and recited it to Joshua. He wrote down the words of the Book of the Covenant after presenting them orally to the people, Exodus 24, verses 3 and 4. And he was instructed to record the material in Exodus 34, 10 through 27. The text also tells us that Moses charged Aaron's son Ithamar to keep a careful record of the materials used to construct the tabernacle, Exodus 38, 21. Joshua was Moses' aide, Exodus 24, 13, a term that indicates that he may have served as Moses' major recorder. Joshua stands out as the man who knew Moses par excellence, and it is said of him that he made a covenant, Joshua 24, 25, for the people at Shechem. He set up for them ordinances or decrees, laws or fixed rules and model cases, Joshua 24, 26. Only an inspired and approved successor, such as Joshua was at the time, could have without impunity written these things into, quote, the book of the law of God, unquote. This literary activity coupled with his also writing the law of God upon tablets of stone, Joshua 8, 32, suggests that he may have helped shape parts of the Pentateuchal materials. That's the end of the Carpenter quote. Now, Carpenter has a footnote at the end of that, which says this, the tradition of the Jewish fathers as passed down through Pirkei Avot 1.1 is, quote, Moses received the Torah on Sinai and handed it down to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, and the prophets handed it down to the men of the great assembly. Carpenter adds, there may be more historical truth in this assertion than has been allowed in the past. In other words, this, this notion of succession 
of approved successors, uh, I think, is legitimately the context for the editorial activity, not only in the Pentateuch, but really throughout the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's not, you know, they weren't out there like like Dairy Queen, you know, hiring interns or something. Hey, we need a little work on this manuscript over here. You're just out of high school, so come on over. No. I mean, th- these were community, not only expert scribes who would do this activity, but they were recognized by the community as legitimate successors to the tradition. Uh, and again, in the context, I mean, I've talked to many occasions in the podcast about how I think it's far more coherent biblically uh, to view inspiration as a process, not an event or even a series of events, as a, as a process where that, that God is aware of. He's watching, he's superintending the entire way through, and it, and it could take centuries. God had a sustained interest in the, producing this thing that we now call the Bible. It wasn't just a moment by moment, zapping by zapping interest. If you take that view, and again, I've been quite open with that, that that is my view of inspiration, and I've had a number of lectures that show why that's a whole lot better than you know, the way inspiration is traditionally taught. You, you, go, you look at it you know, from that framework, it makes sense, again, that the community would recognize certain individuals and they were skilled and, and they were just thought to be part of God's hand in producing the final form of whatever, you know, whatever they were working on. In this case, the Pentateuch and the book of Exodus. So again, that, that's how I approach authorship and it has implications you know, for dating. And we'll, we'll hit some of those things as we go through the book. By way of an outline, I actually think it's convenient for listeners uh, to keep this really, really, really basic outline in mind. Again, this is also you know, partly based on, on Carpenter. The book breaks down into three sections really easily. There's Chapter 1, verse 1, up through chapter 15, verse 21. That is from the oppression of Israel to their deliverance. Okay? In other words, those are events in Egypt okay, or, or concerning Egypt. Real easy. You get past 15, 21, so chapter 15, verse 22 through 18, 27. Those are events at Sinai or events leading on the way to Sinai. So we have the exodus from Egypt occur and then the journey to Sinai. So the first section is events in Egypt. Second section is events on the way to Sinai. And that means the last section is stuff that happened at Sinai. That's Exodus 19, verse 1, all the way to the end of the book, chapter 40 through 38. That's stuff that happens while they're at Sinai. So it's, it's a real easy uh, outline. Going to Egypt, going to Sinai, and then they're at Sinai. Book divides real nicely into three sections. But I think more interesting is the kinds of issues we'll run into throughout the book. And I, I'm going to sort of chop this up into two sets of issues. And the second set, I'm going to spend a lot of time on really the lion's share of this episode of the podcast on. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good play. It's, it, we, we need to cover some things in there right from the get-go. The other stuff, the first set, you know, we'll, we'll bump into these things along the way. So I'm only going to say a little bit about them. So the first set of issues is, are related to problems of chronology and archaeology. And within that set, I'm really kind of thinking of two things, two, two, you know, two kinds of, of issues, two kinds of problems. One is the problem of archaeological absence. And that is, does it matter that there is no certain archaeological evidence for the man Moses, for Joshua? I mean, that we haven't you know, uncovered like the grave of Moses and it's really him or, or you know, some you know, you know, Egyptian literary corpus that, that retells the story of, of the Israelites in Egypt, you know, and, and leaving Egypt, you know, and actually uses names like Moses and Joshua and Aaron. Okay, does it matter? There's, there's an issue of absence there. Does that matter? Okay. Secondly, there are problems of archaeological data that do exist and its interpretation. So the first kind of problem is archaeological absence. Second is archaeological data and how that is viewed, how that's interpreted. Now, it's going to take more, you know, you know more than, than one episode and more than one, this, one little segment like this. To really get into the nuts and bolts of chronological debate, you know, the problems of, of you know, how things that have been discovered archaeologically affect the way scholars date not only the book, but date the events, the people, the persons, and so on and so forth. We're going to run into these things throughout the book in different places. Uh, so I just want to reference it here. And I'm actually kind of bringing it up. Again, this, this set of problems about interpretation of data, you know, archaeology and chronology. I'm, I'm actually bringing it up because of the film Patterns of Evidence. I've been asked, I think, in Q&A maybe once or twice about this. I'll, I'll put it. I'm positively predisposed or disposed you know, to the film, and, and I'll try to explain very briefly why here. But I, I want to say, though, having said that, if you think that film solves all or even most of the problems related to the Exodus, you're wrong. Okay, What it does, it doesn't really solve anything. What it does is, is it presents a particular approach to the problems and then offers a a solution. Okay, offers. You know, it, it proposes something. Hey, let, let's. If we consider it this way, then you know things kind of kind of look differently. They kind of work out. It and it, it's drawing on the work of David Roll. That's R O H L. Um, you know, we'll get into all this stuff. The date of the Exodus problem, which of course is tied to chronological method. Uh, it's it's also tied to external chronological issues uh, and interpretation of archaeological data. What I mean by that is, if you think the date of the Exodus concerns only First Kings six one. Which, which basically says in the fourth year of Solomon, that was the 480th anniversary from the time of you know, the Israelites leaving Egypt. Well, there the verse gives us the, you know, the date. Uh, it's 1446 BC because Solomon, the fourth year, 976, you, know, you just do the math or you know, whatever, or 966, and you do the math and you come out 1446 BC. Well, that's wonderful. How do we get a real-time BC date for that? The Bible doesn't give you ever BC or AD dates. What it gives you is 
lifespans of individuals. It gives you relative chronology. Well, this king reigns X number of years, and he was replaced by this guy, and that guy reigned X number of years, and he was replaced by another guy. You know, this is what you get. You get strings of year uh, years. You get reign lengths, lifetime spans. Nothing fixes it into real time history. For that, you need to come up with a way to correlate something written in a text with astronomy, because astronomy is how we record and understand and fix time. Our calendars operate on astronomical principles, astronomical observation. I mean, who in the world invented this system? Ah, that's a good question. How did, how did anybody know really how to apply it to the, to the Bible? Ah, that's another good question. What about ancient civilizations outside the Bible? Egypt, Mesopotamia, Assyria, Babylon. They were doing astronomy too. You know, how does their system hook into astronomy? And do all the systems agree? Ah, good questions. Uh, and, and what Patterns of Evidence actually does, I mean, it doesn't get into the nuts and bolts, but, but David Roll was part of what used to be called the Ancient Chronology Forum on the internet. I used to be a chronology nerd. Um, I'm still a nerd, but in other ways. Um, I used to be really into this. And it is so complicated. It is so variable. And frankly, it is so uncertain that I, I have frequently referred to ancient chronology and, and problems and debates about chronology as nothing more than a quagmire. That's what it is. So what Patterns of Evidence does is it presents Roll's David Roll's ideas of how to align uh, certain texts in Egypt with biblical texts that are now separated by about 200 years because of the way these texts are dated and because of the way the dynastic chronology of Egypt is dated. And Roll is saying, well, there are problems with the whole system that allow him to scrunch, to compress the chronology 200 years. If you've seen the, the film, you know, you've seen these really, and they are cool. You know, I, I know, you know, Tim Mahoney, you know, who, who made the film, he's, he's a really good guy. You know, just, again, I, I liked the film because it does a, a good idea, a good job of presenting roles, uh, presentation of the problems in his proposed solution. Um, and it, it has wonderful graphics. And if you've seen it, you know, you, they'll talk about how, you know, the mainstream has this text over here in Egypt and the Bible says this, but they're separated by 200 years because of the way things are dated. And if we could just move, if we could just compress the chronology, smash them together so that these texts would align in their dating, like, voila, you know, it looks like this Egyptian thing is describing what's going on over, over in the Old Testament. Yeah, it does. It does. But the, the, the film doesn't raise this question. On what basis? By what authority? Can we just compress 200 years? We, we can see that it works nicely. It produces a nice result. But on what basis do we do that? Let's say that, yeah, there, is, there are problems in chronology. Well, why, does it, why are we worried more about correlating things in Exodus than actually fixing a real-time chronology? Because the, the, the film only deals with the Bible in Egypt. What about the Assyrians? What about the Babylonians? What about the Hittites? What about the Greeks? I mean, they all have their own chronological systems as well. It's the Mediterranean. They're looking at the same sun and the same moon. They're all doing astronomy and calendar. You know, what if we only compressed it 50 years and everything lined up? Well, that still leaves us with a gap with the Bible. In other words, this is what, this is what happens in ancient chronology discussion. People aren't just trying to relate the external ancient Near East with the Bible. And some of them aren't even interested in that at all. Some of them are trying to correlate the entire Mediterranean, every system, with each other to produce a coherent chronological reconstruction that has no outliers. And there's a lot that can go wrong. There's a lot that cannot be known because there are disagreements all over the place, even in astronomical observation and the way those observations are described. There's a lot of ambiguity in a particular, you know, the Egyptian system deals with something called the Sophic cycle, the rise of Sirius, Sophus. Well, depending on how it's worded, that may refer to an event that happens every year, or it may refer to a cycle of 1,460 years. And guess what? The writers never tell us. People have to guess. Ancient chronology is based on a lot of guessing. Some of it is more educated than others. You know, it, it, there's, there, there's no synchronicity. There's no wholesale synchronicity across the ancient Mediterranean. And, and whole books, whole studies have been written about this problem, these problems. So again, these don't get solved by a film called Patterns of Evidence. Again, it presents Roll's view and it does it really nicely visually, but it, it doesn't inform you as to what gives Roll the authority to compress the whole thing by 200 years. It looks nice at the end of, of, of the compression. It looks really nice. But you have to ask yourself that question, again, by, by what authority? How do we know that, that this is the right thing to do, you know, honoring all of the evidence, not just textually, but astronomically, archaeologically, all of it? And then the second question is, well, does our compression work everywhere else? Aha. Uh -huh. Again, this is a quagmire, but we're going to get into, because we have to, you know, issues of ancient chronology. And, and the best I can do, again, I'm not going to solve all the problems either. The best I can do is explain to you why scholars argue one direction or the other, how it works, what, what's the basis of their conclusions. And then, you know, you can do further research and land where, where you will. But again, that, that's, the, that's the stuff that we'll run into periodically. What I want to spend most of the time, the rest of the time of our episode on here is the second set of problems. And that is, problem, those are problems of historiography and, and literary presentation, how... how how the book of Exodus presents its content. And, and what I mean by here is really, you can put it in a simple question. Is Exodus theology or history? Or is the answer yes? Or a little bit of both? You know, how, how do we view this? Does the existence of a meta narrative, the, the, the laying out of God's salvation plan, does that nullify history or does it require it? 
does it reinforce it? Are those two things compatible? What I mean by, by this is it's very evident to scholars, and if you pick up a, a good commentary on Exodus, that things written in Exodus are hooking back into Genesis, like with the patriarchs. And you will get fulfillments of certain things said to the patriarchs, or you'll get sort of a, uh, a, a progression of like the covenant, covenantal language, language about the land and all this sort of thing. So that, that makes it very clear that the writer of Exodus is presenting theology. It, it, it's presenting uh, God's activity with his people in this particular place uh, to, to propel what he is going to do to reinstall the kingdom on earth and to, again, gather his people back to himself who are estranged you know, from him and the nations and so on and so forth. So in, in presenting those theological points, a lot of people wonder, well, is that the same as history or is he just doing theology? Like, like how do, are these two different things? Are they two related things? Are they compatible or incompatible? Those are the big questions. So that, that again, prompts other things like, well, how should we think about biblical historiography? The, the writing of, of biblical narrative. How should we think about a term like historicity? I mean, what is history? What is historicity? You know, how, how do we how do we view these things? How much precision is required for something to be considered historical, especially by modern thinkers? If we can look at a, a passage in Exodus and we can see that that the passage is, is actually arranged deliberately, or it does something deliberately to convey a theological point, does that mean that the writer had to sort of ignore history to do that, or is he using history? Or is there some other kind of relationship? What if we have polemic mythicizing going on? You know, the writer's taking a shot at, at, at some ancient Near Eastern religious idea or a deity. Well, in the process of doing that, do we have history then? Or is the guy just giving somebody a theological poke in the eye by the way he tells a story? Is the story being told real history? Or is it, you know, a theological punch in the nose? Or are those two things inherently distinct and separable? Or, or do they work together? I mean, these, these are the big picture questions that we have to think about. Now, let me give you some examples here. And there's a lot of them. Again, we're going to run into all these things in the book. And so I'm just going to run through them. Why does Exodus, again, purportedly written by Moses in the 15th or maybe the 12th, depending on what chronology you use, you know, 12th century BC, why does Moses use a word, karuv, cherub, that has a well-known Mesopotamian origin? Why does he do that? The only other place we see the karuv is in Genesis you know, 3. And Genesis 1 11, as I've said before, has lots and lots and lots of Babylonian connections uh, to them. I, I thought the context for the Exodus was Egypt. What, what's he, why is this word there? I mean, the Egyptians didn't use this. Why do elements of the tabernacle mimic Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and Canaanite artifacts? The Ark of the Covenant has a, a clear point of analogy to Egyptian palanquins. We'll talk about with powder boxes, you know, with, with figures of the deity inside them. Okay? The menorah has a very clear Mesopotamian counterpart, the whole tree of life kind of thing that has Mesopotamian roots. Again, there we get Genesis 1 to 11 content. The structure of the tabernacle, the outline of it, though, is very Canaanite. Why do we get all three of these? Why isn't it consistent? In each section, Again, the writers or editors of Exodus will repurpose material found in Genesis to remind readers of things that happened before in God's redemptive plan. Does that make the storytelling artificial? Or is it true history? Is it mythic? And what does mythic even, even mean? Is that history? You know, does it negate historicity? Uh, a myth you know, in, in academic parlance is a story where divine beings, supernatural beings are characters and, and supernatural things happen. Uh, again, does, does that mean it's non-historical? Well, you, know, you say no, of course. You know, God can act in history. I, I agree he can. But the, the bigger question is, does this telling of the story have theology as its aim, or does it have history as its aim? And are those things necessarily separable? That's the bigger question. Here's another one. What about apparent literary polemic that connects whatever's being talked about in Exodus to other ancient Near Eastern stories? How about the abandoned child motif? Moses, you know, the story of Moses' birth, put in a little, little basket, set afloat on the Nile. Okay. There are whole studies on what scholars call the abandoned child motif. There are a lot of these in the ancient world, where the hero of a story is released or abandoned you know, by his parents, gets discovered by you know, somebody else, and then they grow up in completely different circumstances, and they become a hero of the of story. They, they go from rags to riches, that kind of thing. But you have this abandonment as, as a child motif. What about Exodus 24, using language from Baal's you know, courtyard to describe the presence of Yahweh? So you, you get literary polemic that's very obvious. Is, is that something in and of itself? Why, why would the story be told that way? Is it is this like a, if we went back in time, would we, would we actually witness this as a real-time event? Or is the writer trying to make, his only goal is to make a theological point? Again, how, how, how do we view this stuff? Uh, Carpenter asks a few more. Why is Cain in the promised land? I mean, why Cain? Why is Pharaoh never named? We're going to get into this as well, because at a certain point in Egyptian history, pharaohs do get named, but at a certain point before, they don't. Does that affect the dating of the book? Well, it might. Why is Sinai called the mountain of God? Why is its geographical location never pinpointed? I mean, it, it's quite controversial as to you know where Mount Sinai is. Why do terms like tabernacle and tent of meeting at times overlap, and at other times, they're quite distinguished? What's going on there? Why is material at, at times not presented in a chronologically accurate way? Here's a good example. If you go to Exodus 16, 34, you have this said, as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it, that is his rod that budded before the testimony to be kept. Now the word testimony there, adut, is used to the Ark of the Covenant in other passages in Exodus. Guess what? Exodus 16, the Ark of the Covenant hasn't even been built. What do we do with that? It's very clear that, that the term is used earlier than when the thing's actually built for a particular reason. 
And again, you, you know, scholars have you know, tried to figure out what, what's going on here. Why, why this? It's certainly out of order, but that, that's, the, that's the actual question. Why does the writer or editor arrange things out of order? Is there something deliberate that they want to teach? And if the Ark of the Covenant didn't exist, should we look at this and say, well, this obviously can't be historical because the Ark wasn't even built yet? Okay, in that sense, it would be non-historical, but the writer would know that because the writer is also going to work on the passages, or the editor is going to work on the passages where the ark is built. So he, he must have moved the material you know, from this point to the, to the next point. He must have referenced it before it was built for a reason. What would the reason be? So there you have an example of something that would be sort of in real time, potentially, I'm not going to play, play my hand yet here, but potentially non-historical, but still kind of historical because it's just literature. It's just the writer or editor is just taking something from the book and repurposing it in a very deliberate way for a particular, to make a particular point. Is that okay? Like does, does that violate some cosmic rule of how to write a book, a, a religious book? Can the, these are the questions that, that we have to ask ourselves that we're going to run into. Here, here's, a, here's a bigger example. The life of Moses. This comes, you know, I owe this observation to John Curd's commentary, Curd, C-U-R-R-I-D. Curd has a PhD in, uh, I don't know if it's in Egyptology, but it, it might be Bible and ancient history, but, but he, has a, he has really substantial training in Egyptology. He's an evangelical Old Testament prof. In his study commentary on Exodus, um, published by the Evangelical Press, he notes that the early life of Moses serves as a prototype of the entire Exodus event. So he says, what I mean by that statement is that the general and major events of Moses' life while in Egypt and in Midian model and prefigure the salient circumstances in the life of the emerging nation of Israel later. And then he explains, he writes, in the foregoing analysis, the hero of Exodus was defined as Moses or Israel, you know, either one, with Yahweh as the donor or helper. He's the deliverer. What if we consider Yahweh the hero, though? Later biblical references to the liberation generally emphasize God's role, barely mentioning Moses at all. And in fact, the Exodus story is often described as a battle between Yahweh and Pharaoh over who shall possess Israel. So if you keep going you know, through this, you, you wind up, again, in a different place. And so do you we look at you know, Moses as the hero or Yahweh as the hero? If you look at, you know, it's just going to take you in different directions. Back to his earlier comment, you know, if you actually do look at events in, in Moses' life, um, I'll just give you an example. In Exodus 2, Moses is born as a slave in Egypt under oppression and persecution. Then he, you know, in Exodus 2, a little bit later, you know, the, the baby Moses being put in the ark, he he's undergoes some water ordeal and has to be delivered. Then he escapes to Midian later in life. Then he sees a theophany of the burning bush at Mount Sinai. And then he, you know, has this doubt, you know, about, you know, God using him to deliver the nation. Well, if you look at the nation's history, in Exodus 1, they're born slaves in Egypt under bondage. Okay? Israel goes through a water ordeal at the Red Sea and is delivered. Israel escapes to Midian in Exodus 16 through 18. Israel has its own theophany experience at Sinai. And then Israel becomes unfaithful, you know, during the, the wilderness wanderings and so on and so forth. In other words, the circumstances of Israel as a nation mirror those of Moses. Is that artificial? You know, would we read the account, you know, one way if, if we look at Moses as the focal point as opposed to God as the focal point or Israel as the focal point? So again, these are big picture questions that you can see them in a close literary reading that these kind of patterns emerge. So is that artificial? Are we getting real history? Are we getting theologized history? And is theologized history not really history? Again, these are big, big picture questions. There, I, I could go through, again, a, a bunch of other examples you know, about how when you read it as literature, there are things that emerge, patterns that emerge, that hook into not only other parts of the book and other parts of the Torah, but even wider you know, ancient Near Eastern literature outside the Bible. And this is why, why scholars, again, look at Exodus. They're, they're not asking these questions because they hate Exodus, because they hate God. They don't believe that, you know, they don't believe in inspiration. I mean, some of them do. Some of them don't have any time for an idea like inspiration or whatnot. But there are other people who are a little more thoughtful. And the, who accept the idea of inspiration. And they wonder, well, you know, what do we have here? What do we actually have? Because we do see these patterns. The writer is very evidently doing something to us. So how do we parse that? Now, what I'm going to do for the rest of, of our time here is I'm going to take you through part of a presentation I did at the Frequency Conference because it was on precisely this question. I was assigned to, to do a, a presentation on the validity of the Old Testament, which was vague enough that I could more or less do what I want. So I, I didn't do a session on, hey, here's how we harmonize this with that, and you know, just that kind of apologetic thing. Because honestly, while, while that has some value, it, it doesn't address the bigger points. And so I think we need to think better and think well about some of these big picture questions. And so I'm going to prep you for the way I think about these things, because that will be useful the rest of the way through the book as we jump into the book. So I want to drill down on thinking well, and I would say thinking honestly about meta narrative, about this question of is literary presentation, is that artificial, about terms like history and historicity and mythic history. Uh, again, I, I actually, I'll be bold enough to say, I think a lot of the critics who raise these questions, the people who sort of are hostile, I don't think they're being honest because at, at the end of the day, you could take all of their questions and apply those questions to their own life story and they would render themselves unhistorical. Now, that might sound a little odd, but I'm going to show you why that's the case. Okay. So let's start off here. The dictionary of the Old Testament uh, in the historical books says this. I think it's a good, good way to jump in here. The word history is Greek in origin. Its definition as a literary genre and the extent to which its use for biblical material may be anachronistic are questions raised by recent scholarship. History, for most modern Westerners, okay, keep that in your mind, most modern people, history is what happened in the past, and you know that's it. History is what happened in the past. Well, that's a little simplistic. 
history and history writing as a literary genre is an account, yes, an account of what happened in the past. That, that, that's true, but that's not all that we're, we're dealing with here. The latter is judged, again, the way it gets written, you know, there's, you know, these genre considerations. The latter is judged by how accurately and objectively uh, it recounts past events. There's some recognition that historians have their own biases, that no one is completely objective, and that writing history involves interpretation. And all those things are true. If pressed, most moderns probably will admit that it may be impossible to know for certain exactly what happened in the past. Nevertheless, telling exactly what happened remains the goal and the essential definition of the genre of you know, history as it is generally envisioned. That's the end of the quote. So for most modern people, if you ask them what history is, it's, oh, that's what happened in the past. They don't really think too much beyond that. I'll add another assumption that, that many moderns, especially critics, bring to the, to the table. They have been taught that crediting the causation of events, whether directly or providentially, to God, you know, giving, having God as the cause of events cannot be considered history. That's just the way people are taught, you know, academically. And the reason is, they, you know, people will say, well, well we, we can't really be sure objectively, like scientifically, if God exists. And if we can't be sure about that, then we can't be sure about his activity. We wouldn't, how would we know that God's the cause of something if we don't even know that God is, is, is for real? We can't objectively, and that's the key word, we can't objectively, scientifically prove you know, God's existence. So if that's the case, we can't say anything about what he might or might not have done. Now, do you see the potential problems and inconsistencies with these ideas that history is, is a, a record of things that happened in the past? That, that, that's, that, that's the goal of it. That, that's the only thing that, that we should, it's the only way we should evaluate a term like history. You know, this, this complete objective record of things that happened in the past, and then essentially removing God from the equation. Do you see the potential problems? Well, in case you don't, I'm going to go through a few of them. Historical reliability presumably requires then precise accuracy, exactitude, okay? We as moderns assume that to have real history, the account has to be absolutely, utterly, completely precise, or it can't be history. I'm going to suggest that that is flawed. That is way overstated. I'm going to give you some concrete examples in a moment. It also assumes total objectivity is required for something to be truly historical. In other words, there's no intentional bias at all. There's no subconscious bias. We, we have to, unless we can have complete 100% infallible assurance that something is precisely accurate and totally objective, we cannot call it history. That raises an obvious question, at least to me. Actually, a few obvious questions. How precise must you be in order to be considered accurate? Let's talk about sources. How many sources is enough? Because you know, you'll, you'll have people that say, well, we can't really consider the Bible as a source for this event, because we need another source to validate the first one. So if we only have a single source, we can't really see that as history. Well, there are some times where you, when you get two or three sources and they're still not satisfied. You know, if the Bible is one of them, they still don't count it. And so my question is, well, how many do we need before we, we actually take the Bible seriously as a source? How many is enough? How about conversations? Do conversations count as historical evidence? Let's say you know, in your own life, you have a conversation with somebody, you know, your dad 10 years ago. You know it occurred. Nobody else was there. Now, if you were writing your own biography, your autobiography, is that to be excluded as a source because it can't be correlated? Like you just wipe that off the table like it never happened when you know that it did? Well, I mean, if you're going to be completely, you know, that might be bias in there because it was you and your, and your dad. You know, and, you know, we can't really consider that now because you, you know, are you really objective? And boy, we, we wish we had more sources. And then we, then we could correlate that with other sources and deter, determine precise accuracy. Can you see where I'm going here? How about memories? Memories can be accurate even if nobody else was in the room. They really can. I mean, you know, they can be flawed, obviously. It can work both ways. But to rule them out because nobody else was there, is that reasonable? Really, is that reasonable? Since an event and the interpretation of the event are two different things, can the event be made known reliably? If we know about your biases, that's another question. Is reliability made impossible or unlikely if we know about an author's bias? Put another way, does partial information about an event mean that what is said about the event is untrue? How exhaustive and inclusive and objective must the report be to be considered precise and unbiased? Now, when I was at the Frequency Conference, I, I used a book as an example. And here, here's the title of the book. Invisible. Subtitle, The Forgotten Story of the Black Woman Lawyer Who Took Down America's Most Powerful Mobster. And I picked this book because I was speaking to a, a, an overwhelmingly African-American audience. And I, I used this book to grab their attention because the book is about a very obscure black woman lawyer at, at the Luciano, the Lucky Luciano trial. She was behind the scenes, and her, I think it's her grandson, wrote this book about you know, his grandmother and the role she played. Now, here are the questions. Is his history, because it's about his grandmother and he's related to her, is his history less objective than other histories of the Luciano trial? It's, well, it must be because they're related. Well, can you objectively demonstrate that it's biased, less objective, or are you assuming something that you really can't prove and that might be disproved if we you know, look at the transcripts of the court records and all that sort of stuff? So is this history really less objective? Were the lives of all the other people involved in this trial, were they all researched at the same level of detail 
as this woman? Oh, well, to, to be objective history, you, he should have written books on all the lawyers that were involved because then we could rule out bias and then we could cross check information. We could see, you know, we, we, we could get this, you know, super, super precision that we need to call it history. Really? Really? You got, you got to write books on everyone involved to call this one history? Really? How about, were there conversations from which the data are drawn? Okay, there certainly were. This is a courtroom. Were all the conversations recorded? Well, no, in, in his book, you know, he, he, he has, he's interviewed people. You know, people who were there, people who were involved, their conversations, what they're reporting to the author, they weren't recorded. They are memories. Are they all wrong because they're memories, because they don't exist in written form somewhere? Again, it gets a little absurd. So here are some questions for us and, and for historical critics. Is your version of your own life objective? If you're telling the light, your own life story, are you including all perspectives equally? You know, how would your, your first girlfriend in high school, you know, relate this? How would your mom, your sister, your aunt, you know, three, your cousin three times removed, you know, uh, you know, do you have to exhaustively go to all of them and include all their thoughts to really tell the story of your own life and have it be historical? It might be incomplete without them, but that's the question. Is an incomplete accounting, is it still history? Is it an all or nothing proposition? And again, I'm suggesting it's not. It's not an all or nothing proposition. And in fact, there's no way to do all these things because conversations and recollections of events don't all get produced to written form and preserved so that somebody 100 years later can, can fact check them. It just isn't the way life happens. So could you actually even tell your own story by these standards? How precise are your data? Well, you're the only source for that data point, so we can't include it. And if we do include it, then it's not history. Are all the recollections you have cross-checked with other source documents? And how many are enough? And do you have recordings of all your... Again, this is absurd. What about God? You know, does belief in divine activity in your own life, does that make something unhistorical? You know, divine causation shows up in many ancient Near Eastern accounts that are not in the Bible. You know, like Ramses' victory at Kadesh over the Hittite. You know, it, it, they attribute the activity of their gods to the outcome of events. So why do we consider those things historical, but we can't do that with the Bible? Why? Well, I think we, we kind of know. Because if, if, we, if we do that with the Bible, then we actually have to count it as a source. If we count it as a source for our history, and we can't invalidate it, then maybe we're accountable to it because you know, we, we look at the Bible as, as, as something different in terms of you know, our accountability to God and so on and so forth. You know, we, we don't do that with, with Egyptian texts and Assyrian texts and Hittite texts, but then we use a false test, divine activity in the story, to rule out the Bible. When we, we're just fine accepting it on the other side. That's inconsistent. I'm going to tell you my, my own, to illustrate this, I'm going to tell you my own story of how I got my job at Logos. Here we have a few minutes left here. And this, I think, illustrates well the, the, the question of history versus mythic history, including supernatural events and characters in the story, and how they both can be historical. You know, it's not a mutually exclusive idea. So here's how I got my job at Logos. And again, this is me. I'm not embellishing it. This is just the story. It just is what it is. So when I was in my last year at grad school at, at Wisconsin, I'm going to be, I'm going to finish the program in like two months, which means I'm going to lose, I always had two or three jobs, but I'm going to lose all but one job, which means I'm going to lose my health benefits and basically two thirds of my income in two months. So I have been applying for jobs since I hit the dissertation phase, which was four and a half years, almost five years prior. And I'm not getting any nibbles, okay? We could go into details as, as to why that, that may have happened. I don't really know, but I'd only have guesses at that point. But there I am. I'm, I don't have a job. I don't know what I'm going to do. I got four kids, you know, and it's just not looking real, real good. So one of the things I was doing for, for four, almost five years is looking at the SBL, Society of Biblical Literature website, where they post jobs. I know from four years of experience at that time, they only update the site the first week of every month. I've had four years of that. I know it's entirely predictable. So I'm in the middle of the month. I come home, you know, from, from teaching, you know, one day I get home, I got a couple minutes to kill. My wife's not home yet. She's out with the kids doing something. And I'm just kind of bored. I'm a little bit depressed. You know, I'm just wondering what in the world am I going to do? And I thought, well, let's, let's go look at the job board. And I'm telling myself while I'm sitting at the keyboard typing, you're just wasting time. You know that it's going to be exactly what you saw two weeks ago. This is stupid. Do something else, you know, feed the dog, <laughs> just do something else. This is dumb. So I'm having this internal conversation while I'm going to the website and the, 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 the webpage opens and it's been updated for the first time in over four years, in the middle of a month. And I'm astonished. And the job that has just popped in there is the job I presently have. It was the Logos job. So I have everything ready. I've, I mean, I've been doing this for years. I've got my resume. I fire this thing off in an email. You know, my wife you know, comes home and less than an hour later after doing that, I get a phone call and it's a friend of mine you know, now, uh, Bill, his name was, and we start talking about this job. And then he loops in Bob, our CEO, and, and he loops in, our, uh, then Dale is retired now, but Bob's dad, Dale, was our VP of the company. He gets looped into the conversation. We sit there for an hour and talk. And at the end of it, Bob says, well, we, you know, we want to have you out here. You know, come out and visit the office and we'll, we'll do a formal interview. You'd, you'd meet the people that you would be working with and we'll just 
take a couple days and, and, and see what happens. And so I looked at my wife and told her what was going on. And I said, you know, why not? You know, it's like a, like a little vacation. You get a couple days on the West Coast, you know, Northwest. We've never been there. Let's do it. So, okay, why not? You know, we don't have any reason to, to, to say no. So we went out and visited. You know, we did the, you know, we went out to dinner. Bob likes to interview people at dinner. We, you know, we saw, met everybody that I'd be working with. You know, we went through the whole thing. And so at the end of this, I'm expecting, you know, to hear, well, you know, it's good to have you out. You know, we'll, you know we need a week or so to think about what, what you know, happened here and we'll, we'll get back to you. So I walk into Bob's office and he looks at me and he says, well, we've decided to offer you the job. Here's what it pays. Blah, he's giving me all these details. Now I know because I have cobbled an income together for years. I know exactly to the penny what we need to survive. And, and this is like more than that. And I can't believe it. So I'm, I'm like stunned that I actually have a job offer after four and a half years of, of nothing. So, you know, I, I, I didn't really know what to say. And I said, well, can we have 24 hours to think about it? You know, it's a big move. And he's not sure, you know, whatever, you know. And so I, I wind up obviously taking this job. Now I found out years later from Dale that I was the first person to respond to that job posting. It had, it had lived online for less than an hour. So it literally didn't exist when I was driving home from school. It literally popped out of the ether. And, and I saw it, again, having the conversation with myself that this is stupid, don't look, and applied for it. He said, you were the only person we interviewed. It, it, this, it, that was it. We had the interview. That's it. You're the only person we interviewed. The only person we invited out. We're done. Now, I look at that. You know, so let's be honest. I look at that, and I see God's hand in it in you know, half a dozen places. The job literally didn't exist until I got home. And I'm the only one that applied for it, or, you know, that they interviewed, they brought in, they talked to. That was it. And, and we're just, two weeks later, it's just a done deal. That's it. We don't need to have any other conversations. Now, if I attribute divine activity to that, what I'm doing is I'm taking a series of events and I'm mythicizing them. I'm assigning a divine role to things that really happened. Folks, those things happened. It's still history. What I'm suggesting is when we look at a book like the Bible and you have writers that theologize things, they do mythic history, that doesn't mean that the events they are using, that they are attributing divine influence and providence and even direct activity. It doesn't mean that those things are fabrications. Every one of you listening to this can do that kind of thing with your own life. Now, I, I make it to heaven and, and God might tell me, you know, in your reconstruction of what happened that day, you know, I, you know, I really wasn't, in, I was definitely in this thing, but I, that, that other thing over there, that was something else. You know, I wasn't paying it, you know, I'm, I'm being a little silly now. I mean, in other words, I might get corrected on how I parsed that, but it still happened. It's okay. You know, when, 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 we, have, when we have the Bible, you know, that's what we have biblical writers doing. These things happened. The way they tell the story, okay, it, they may not be connecting dots quite, you know, the way God would connect them. Okay, but, but they, they're, they're attributing divine activity to things that happen boots on the ground, and they're telling us the story. I think the Bible's a little more reliable, uh, again, just because I think God has a, a more direct providential interest in, in how Scripture's produced than my retelling of how I got my job. But the idea is the same. Attributing divine activity to a series of events, yeah, that, that's mythic in, in academies, in the academic you know, dialect. That's mythic history. But it doesn't mean it's not historical. And we're going to run into that kind of thing in Exodus all over the place. So maybe what we should do is instead of judging history by modern expectations, you know, this exact precision needed, total objectivity, you know, valid, you can't have one source stand on its own. Again, even those, those criteria would undermine our ability to even tell our own story, things that we know occurred. So maybe instead of having a set of standards that really don't quite work that well in real life, you know, that don't really satisfy our modern way of thinking, maybe we should be thinking about how ancient people looked at what they were doing. You know, when, when ancient historians wrote, they used speeches of people. They used conversation. They used dialogue. And, and, and since none of those things were recorded, yeah, they had to make up conversation. Nobody's following, you know, Achilles around or, or you know, Alexander around with a tape recorder. Historians will capture the gist, the essence of what was said in a dialogue that they invent. But it's faithful to what really happened and what was said. It's just not an exact reproduction. But we still view that as history, and they viewed it as history. I mean, we view it as history when we can put it in the context of our own lives, things that we know happen. If you're going to be this uber critic that's going to discount all this stuff, well, good. I, I want to see you write your own autobiography, and then I'll, I'll take your tests and apply it to, to what you just wrote about your own life, and we'll see if you really exist. It's inconsistent, is my point. So they used speeches. They used narrative. They did meta narrative things. They were trying to capture an event appropriately, but they used literary creativity and even, even artificiality in the way they arrange things, but it still is faithful and is appropriate to what happened. They're still conveying true things. Just because it's non-modern, it's not the way moderns would do it, doesn't mean it's not true. doesn't mean it's not historical. So I think that's what we need to do. You know, we need to recognize that you know, this is the way ancient historians do it. They, they incorporated things that, that moderns would be hesitant to include. They wrote for a different reason. They weren't just you know, writing to recall the events of the past like they were bookkeepers. 
Okay, they're not just going you know, to, we have to be exact precision. Somebody's going to, you know, look, check on our work and, you know, like, like accountants or something. They were writing to convey things that happened and they would, they would get into the, the interpretation, the significance of why these things were happening. And they would parse things through divine activity because they accepted that in their worldview. They, they, they examine present conditions and circumstances. They try to teach things through them, you know, some moral objective or theological objective. It doesn't mean that the thing they're using to teach that lesson wasn't real. They, they're just doing something a little bit differently than, than we would do it today. Uh, so again, there, this is the kind of thing that we're going to run into in the, in the book of Exodus. It's important, I think, to try to be consistent in the methods that we you know, use to evaluate whatever we're reading in the book of Exodus or something else, you know, some other ancient piece of material, and also try to keep things in their own context. You know, that's what's important here. So hopefully, again, this helps prepare us for the rest of the book because we're going to get into this stuff a lot. A lot of things you know about, a lot of things will be new to you. But again, this is where we're headed. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by reading chapter one. I'm going to, you know, up front, uh, this is only going to be part one devoted to chapter one. We're going to have to spend two chap- or two episodes in the first chapter. And when I'll explain why as we get into the content here. But I think the easiest thing to do is just to read the chapter. And once we get into the content, there'll be a certain point where I'll say, hey, this is for part, part two, and you'll, you'll, you'll understand why. So Exodus 1, again, I'm reading from ESV. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his own household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and, Ash- Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh, store cities, Pithom and Raamses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And Egyptians, the Egyptians, were in dread of the people of Israel, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, and made their lives bitter with hard service, in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, and the other Pua, When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birthstool, if it is a son, you shall kill him, but if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this? Let the male children and let the male children live. The midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Now, the very opening here, the Hebrew wording in the opening is of interest, believe it or not. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt, but Jacob, each of his household, colon, and then you get the list. The reason why this is interesting is that the wording that opens the book is exactly the same as in Genesis 46. If you go to Genesis 46, specifically 8 through 27, uh, the, there's a much longer sort of genealogy, much longer explanation. There are lots of other individuals in it, but it starts exactly the, sound, the same way. These are the names of the descendants of Israel who came into Egypt. And ESV renders it a little bit differently, but in Hebrew, the, the wording is exactly the same. Now, that effectively alerts the Hebrew reader that Exodus is a continuation of the Genesis story of Jacob and Israel. It ties the two books together in, in a literary sense. You say, well, isn't that kind of obvious? Well, it, it is on, on one level because in our Bibles, Exodus is positioned after you know, Genesis. You know, we, we read one after the other, but there's more to the idea of continuation than just where something sits. Okay? Now, Carpenter in his commentary, his Exodus commentary, and that's, this is the volume in the Evangelical Exegetical Commentary uh, produced by Lexham Press. He says this, the author's use of the formula, now these are the names in verse one, also parallels the use of the formula, now these are the generations of, you know, that, that occurs throughout Genesis, you know, Genesis 2, 4, 5, 1, 6, 9, 10, 1, 11, 10, so on and so forth. It's a structural device. And so we have a sort of a structural parallel that also ties the books together. Its use here, Carpenter says, suggests that God's goals and purposes for his original creation are now being realized in an incipient Israel, uh, unquote. Again, that's kind of obvious, but there's, there's a little bit more to the continuity here then it kind of meets the eye. I'm just going to telegraph it here. There are things, and we said this in the introduction, there are things in the text of Exodus, in the Hebrew text, that specifically repurpose, connect into, hook into specific passages in Genesis that aim at talking about the fulfillment of God's original promise to Abraham, that he would have a great, you know, he would have a large family, he would have many seed, they would multiply. Uh, Again, he would be the promised seed. He would be the Abraham and Sarah were essentially the new Adam and Eve because God had disinherited, he had abandoned, he had forsaken humanity at the Tower of Babel event and started over with Abram and Sarah. They were the new human family. They were the new Adam and Eve. And their, their descendants were, again, to sort of replace uh, that which God had abandoned. And so that God is committed to this plan 
is made evident when you get these these are the generations thing and they and in genesis they continue a specific line of people specific line you know specific family line and then when you get it here these are the names of the sons of israel the, the story is ongoing god is still committed to it and that becomes important because in this chapter of exodus egypt again i'm telegraphing here which is going to be cast as the new force of chaos the new babel is attacking trying to thwart god's purposes with his new family and is not succeeding in other words, God, and again, the language in the text where it hooks into back in Genesis, we're going we're to see some specific hooks back into Genesis 11, the Babel story in this chapter. The, the, it's telegraphing a theological and a historical point that no, no matter what the, the forces of chaos do, God is going to fulfill his promises. He is absolutely committed to them, despite what you see going on around you. And it, it's, it's just a, it's a big theme uh, in Exodus, again, this, this continuity. Now, as a sidebar to this, because our audience likes, likes these little sidebars, sons of Israel in verse 1 refers to the original migrant group of Genesis, you know, back in the, in the Joseph story. However, when you get to verse 7, the same phrase, sons of Israel, refers to a much larger group. And so ESV has, has it translated the people of Israel. So in one one, these are the names of the sons of Israel, verse 7, but the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. Given the same wording uh, in Hebrew and the connection of verse 1 back into Genesis, the subtle point is again that God has kept his promise to multiply Abram's seed. Jacob was the chosen son after Isaac. So the sons of Israel, okay, in verse 1, are now seen to be greatly multiplied in verse 7. Verse 5, all the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. And that gives us the, the sort of obvious point is that that sets you know, the sons of Israel in verse 1. That puts them back into the Genesis story, in the Joseph story. But there's something interesting about this as well. And I'm bringing this up because sometimes we get hung up on literalism and numbers. Okay, And, and in this case, one is kind of more legit than the other. So Carpenter notes that the number of people who actually came to Egypt back in the day, back in the day of Joseph, is actually more than 70. That means 70 is probably symbolic, again, you know, given the use of 70 and multiples of seven elsewhere. You say, well, that sounds arbitrary, Mike. How can you just say that it's more than 70? Because of what it says in the Hebrew text. Now, ESV, again, those who you know, came to Egypt, you know, these are the, the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt, all the descendants of Jacob were 70. The word descendants there in the ESV in Hebrew is yotza'e, those who came out of or out you know literally out of the body you know out from Jacob himself the man you know out of the loins of Jacob is the idea so it only refers to Jacob's direct seed and you have to get over the, again the, the sort of the, the pre-modern idea of of you know where babies come from in, in the semitic you know the biblical the ancient near eastern world they don't know anything about a child is the combination of two sets of you know two, two you know the genetics you know, they, they just don't know this you know that one set of chromosomes combines with the other and we have x number you know certain number of chromosomes they don't know any of that stuff they, in the ancient world they use the planting metaphor the couple has sex the man plants the seed into the woman where it grows, and then she gives birth to a child. This is why, again, I've mentioned this a number of times in the podcast. This is why the Old Testament knows nothing of male infertility. It only knows female infertility. Well, I planted the seed, so there must be something wrong with you. Again, and it, it, it takes you into in different you know, other areas of, of theology. But in this case, you, you can see it, that these 70, the descendants of Jacob, the ones who came out from Jacob, from his loins, were 70 persons. So in other words, who's not counted? Well, you know, the, the, their wives aren't counted for one. Any other children that you know, might have accrued maybe by adoption aren't counted. Servants aren't counted. Uh, so the, the actual group that migrates in Joseph's day with the 70 that came from the loins of Jacob, it's actually a bigger group than 70. Uh, again, we don't often think about that. But what that means is that 70 doesn't necessarily, doesn't really have a literal correspondence to the, to the caravan, you know, to the number of people who came down. It's actually a subset. 70 is actually a subset. Uh, and it, you know, again, this is just how it's perceived. The ones that count in the count are the ones that actually proceeded from the loins of Jacob, again, in, in, in the way they express you know, birth. So it, it sort of opens the door to thinking differently about 70 and about numbers and about literalism uh, when we read our Bible. Again, we, in this case, we get clues from the text that we're actually not talking our talk here, you know, how we need to think about Israel in Egypt or even, even on that trip in Joseph's day, that there's really not this strict correspondence, again, to the number. It's, it's actually a subset number of the greater, the greater aggregate. Um, you know, and 70, of course, is used in, in various you know, different ways. We're going to see it, you know, uh, we're going to see multiples, you know, in, in the book of Exodus, we've seen them, you know, in, uh, you know, in uh, you know, other books. Uh, when we did the, the whole temple thing with Ezekiel's temple, we did two episodes on that. I mean, the, the numbers there are pretty obviously symbolic, but this, this is, you know, it's not always the case in scripture, but it is often the case that the numbers mean something different than what you'd think they would mean. You know, again, just thinking of this one-to-one, -one, you know, literalism, this correspondence idea. Now that might matter. Here's some telegraphing. That might matter when we start to think about the date of the Exodus. Okay. That's all I'll say for now. Again, our part two is going to really focus on chronological stuff, but just hold this thought, you know, in your head until the you know, part two of Exodus one. Because one of the views of the Exodus is going to have to not take certain numbers literally, and the other one is going to insist on taking numbers literally. So just store that away. Now, verse 8, again, this is what we do in, in our, you know, when we do book studies. I'll, I'll just skip around. We don't do, you know, verse by verse. I, I want to land on things that are interesting, uh, things that need to be understood, or just, you know, again, some of these sidebar issues. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. It's very easy 
to be reading in the book of Genesis. And Genesis 37 through 50 is all about Joseph, okay? And then you get to Genesis 50, and Joseph dies, and he's embalmed, and so on and so forth. And then you flip the page, and you read this in Exodus. There arose a king over Egypt who didn't know Joseph. It's very easy to think that the king referred to here was the king immediately after the king, the pharaoh that Joseph worked under. That is not the case. It can't be. Because by the time we get to verse 8, Israel has expanded exponentially. And we know from other passages in the Old Testament, like Genesis 15, that Israel was going to be captive for at least 400 years. I mean, depending on how you measure when the start began, Paul has a reference to 430 years. And when we get into the, you know, the chronology of that, we could, you know, maybe we'll rabbit trail on, on you know, that, that sidebar. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll just wait and see. But what you have here is you have a long stretch of time between Joseph and between the events of Exodus 1. So if we could know, and we really can't, and we'll get into that a little bit today and, and a lot in part two, who the Pharaoh was that Joseph served under. Even, even the, the era in Egyptian history where Joseph would be placed is, is hotly debated. We can't assume that the Pharaoh of the bondage is the next guy. Okay? And if we knew the Pharaoh of the bondage, we can't extrapolate backward to the time of Joseph because we, don't, you know, we can't just say it's the preceding guy. We've got these, these round numbers, you know, 400 or 430, and going with Paul, um, as to the space of time between Joseph's rise, the, the entry, really the entry of, of the, uh, the family, you know, leaving Canaan and going into Egypt, and then this chapter here in Exodus 1. Uh, Carpenter writes here, this pharaoh, again, this king, there arose a new king of Egypt who did not know Joseph. This pharaoh was not acquainted with the previous history of Joseph and Israel in Egypt, or at least he didn't choose to acknowledge Israel and her past relationships with Egypt. Um, more importantly, Carpenter says, he lacked a knowledge of or refused to grant any significance to the close friendships that Joseph and Israel had cultivated with past pharaohs, plural, and Egyptians. The writer does not give the king's name, nor are the pharaoh's names given in Genesis. So we don't know who this person was. We, can't, we don't get any, any help by appealing back to the Genesis story. We don't know who that guy was either. But for the sake of, the, of our discussion now, there's a long period of time between Joseph and the circumstances of Exodus 1. So it's not just the next guy that all of a sudden didn't like Joseph. No, this, there are hundreds of years have gone past. And this guy, as Carpenter says, either doesn't know anything about Joseph or really doesn't care. Now that brings us, I want to skip down to verses 11 through 14. I'm going to read them again. Therefore, again, the growth of the people of Israel has alarmed the Pharaoh, whoever he is. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. They made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Now, I'm going to focus in on certain parts of this. I'm going to, for the most part, skip the matter of the names Pithom and Ramses. We're going to spend, believe it or not, an entire episode in part two on do those two names help us situate chronologically the time of the bondage and thus the time of the exodus and thus the time of Joseph. It is, as I said in the introduction, a quagmire. It literally needs, and it's hard to cram it into one episode, it literally needs its own episode because there's so much data that is either mutually contradictory or works in a variety of views of the chronology and the, the, the dating of these events or is sort of just ambiguous. Uh, there's just a lot that goes into it. So that's what our part two is going to be based on. But for, for now, I want to just ask you a question. You know, you think about what I just read, what parts of verses 11 through 14 sound familiar, like they might be drawn from the Babel story. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. Okay, that's verse 12. Spread abroad. Okay, that term is used in Genesis 28, 14, the same Hebrew lemma, where it says, your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and the east, the north and the south. And in you and your offspring, all the families of the earth will be blessed. It's a direct reference to the promise you know, given to Abraham and Sarah about their seed. You know, they, again, they're the new Adam and Eve. They are the, the chosen ones after the Babel event. You get other Hebrew lemmas that mean spread out, dispersed, spread abroad in Genesis 11, specifically Genesis 11, 4 and verses 8 and 9. Reading from the Babel story, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed, lest we be spread out, you know, spread out over the face of the whole earth. Well, here, I mean, we're, we're talking about just Egypt and, and, they're, and the, the people, Abraham's seed, are spreading out. And the, and the whole point is that God's original promise, God's original desire that his people spread out you know, everywhere, you know, do as he commanded, that is in operation. You know, we, we talked a few weeks ago, a few episodes ago about how the blessing of Jacob to Joseph actually contains reference to the Gentiles, the seed of Ephraim, okay? If you remember that, if you, if you didn't listen to that episode, you should go back and listen to that. It's in the Day of the Lord episode. Again, all of the seed thoughts, pardon the pun, are in Abram's seed about the people of God, Jew and Gentile, fulfilling God's original wish after the flood at Babel. And, and way back in Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply. You know, you, you know spread out over all the earth because you're, you're going to have to subdue it, bring it in, into dominion. Okay, all of these things are, are textual and conceptual clues that are linked together about what God is doing despite the opposition of Egypt, who's going to be portrayed as the new Babel. Mortar and brick 
okay, that show up here in Exodus 1, verse 14. They made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick. The only place where those two lemmas show up with the spreading abroad idea, again, other lemmas, there are only two places in the Bible where that combination occurs, Exodus 1 and Genesis 11. Again, the writer wants his readers to think not only about, hey, God's keeping his promises, you know, like Abraham and Sarah, we're going to have a, a you know, multitude of families. Look, you know, look, look at that. That's neat. It is. But he brings along with that the context of Babel. It's, it's intentional. It's deliberate. It's the only other place where these things occur. The writing is casting Egypt as the new Babel, the new reference point of chaos, of opposition to God's will. Remember, chaos is opposition. It's, it's a metaphor. It's a symbol in ancient Near Eastern thought. But ironically, again, the harder the new Babel, Egypt, tries to oppress Yahweh's portion, is, or remember Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9, when the Most High divided up the nations, that's the Babel event. He divided them up, he fixed the boundaries according to the number of the sons of God. But Israel is Yahweh's portion. Jacob is his allotted inheritance. So the harder the new Babel tries to oppress Yahweh's portion, the larger it grows. And the message is that Yahweh is fulfilling his promises, no matter what the forces of chaos do. Babel, chaos, all the human and supernatural forces you know, combined, everything that opposes God's plan will not undermine his purposes through his people the very people through whom one will come. Again, one of those seed, one seed of Abraham will come. And specifically part of his mission is to reverse Babel, to bring the nations back into the family of Abraham and all the children of Abraham. You get, you're, you're called a child of Abraham in the New Testament, not because of your physical genealogy, your, your ethnicity. It's not the fact that you're Jewish. If you are Christ's, you are Abraham's seed. It's Galatians 3. Just read Galatians 3, 27 through 29. Really the whole chapter, but those are the verses that sort of deliver the punch. If you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed, an heir according to the promise. It's Christ who reverses the singular seed of Abraham that reverses all of this. So what the writer is doing in Exodus is he, yes, he wants you to think, wants the reader to think about, you know, God is raising up a seed, the seed of Abraham, and, and that's wonderful. But he's also bringing the, again, Deuteronomy 32 worldview context along with it. He's bringing Babel along with it. There are other, you know, part, there are other really, really subtle things that if we were reading in Hebrew, uh, the, whole about, the whole thing about making their lives bitter, it's marar, the Hebrew lemma. Uh, marad is very close to that, and it means to rebel, rebellion. You get that show up in the account of Nimrod, again, who is you know, cast as you know, the, the king of Babel uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, you, know, you, you get these, these little you know, sort of exegetical, you know, linguistic little tidbits, these possibilities of, of what might be going on here. Um, you know, the, again, there are other ones. I don't want to rabbit trail too much on this, but there are things that connect the two. Uh, one more. Leviathan, of course, is a very well-known symbol for chaos in Canaanite, you know, the dragon, all right? And the Babylonian version of the chaos dragon was Tiamat. And everybody in the ancient world knows this stuff. Yeah, you know, if we were Canaanites, we'd, we'd talk about Lotan, Litanu, again, and, and Baal is the one who defeats Litanu and brings order to everything and becomes king of the gods, you know, wonderful Baal, all this stuff. stuff. If you were a Babylonian, you would say, well, you know, the, the, the great chaos monster, you know, Tiamat, you know, the, our equivalent of Leviathan, that's, you know, that's who Marduk defeats. And Marduk does the same thing, brings order, you know, into the world and blah, 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 blah. Well, guess who else gets called Leviathan in the Old Testament? Egypt. It's not a coincidence. In Egypt, not in Exodus, it's in the prophets, but Egypt, again, not only here in, in Exodus 1, but elsewhere, is tarred and feathered, as it were, with the same chaos symbology. And it, it, these things are not accidental. The, the, the writers, whether it's the writer of Exodus or one of the prophets, wants you, wants his readers in those cases to think about Egypt as a, as a chaos force. And that, we get plenty of that right here. Now, to continue on, with, with the, we need to talk about the nature of the servitude here, um, you know, the whole the whole issue of the slavery in Egypt, you know, verse 11, the first part of it, therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's store cities. And then later in the passage, they made their lives bitter with hard service in brick and mortar, or in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Now, Durham, again, has, has a note here about the store cities that may or may not have anything, give us any help, let's put it that way, give us any help with the chronology. But there's also an issue of, of the, <laughs> is this betrayal historically accurate? So there, there, there's kind of there's a couple points to sort of you know cover with respect to the the nature of the slavery, uh, without getting deep into the chronology, which we're going to do next time. I'll just read what, what Durham says here, and then we'll we'll use that as a springboard to get into some of the other points of controversy. Durham writes the specific territory the king has in mind again with these storehouse cities is indicated not only by the accounts of Genesis and Israel's settlement in Goshen. That's Genesis 47. You have the district of Ramses, Ramses, but especially by the designation of the supply cities as Pithom and Ramses in the Masoretic text, to which the Septuagint, interestingly enough, adds on which is Heliopolis. These cities were all in the Delta region and all were associated with the vigorous building and rebuilding projects of the 19th dynasty. Uh, and end of quote. Now, the reason that that's a little bit interesting is Joseph, he, who's the woman he's given to marry? He's given a, a priestess, you know, Asenath, the priestess of, or the daughter of the high priest of On, Heliopolis. So the Septuagint actually sort of pegs this district here in Exodus 111 as being the same. He associates it with Joseph by virtue of this specific reference to On, you know, the Heliopolis, where this, this woman was from. Um, the other interesting point is that 
Pithom and Ramses, Durham says, and he's making a bit of an assumption here, were associated with the 19th dynasty. This is the, this is the dynasty of Ramses the second, Ramses the Great. Now, you know, that's all well and good. But as we discuss next time, that is not, in fact, it is quite far from a slam dunk for associating this time period described in Exodus 1 with Ramses the second, Ramses the Great. Now, I know Charlton Heston, you know, Yul Brenner, okay, it was Moses against Ramses, you know, Ramses the Great. I get it. You know, Yul Brenner's dad, you know, Seti I, who's the king before Ramses II. So the movie, of course, assumes that, that the king here, uh, for both the bondage and the Exodus, which is another mistake, is Ramses II. Even the cartoon, the Spielberg, you know, Prince of Egypt, makes this assumption. This is the dominant view. And as a proof text for that, people go to Exodus 111 and say, look, you know, they're building stuff for Ramses. I mean, who else can that refer to? We'll get to that. We'll get to that in, in part two. Let's segue to a bit of another note. In this note, uh, verse 11, the king is called Pharaoh for the first time in the ongoing narrative of the book. You know, we're in chapter one, so you know, it takes 11 verses, but the king is identified as Pharaoh. The Hebrew term is a transliteration. The Hebrew is, is paro. That is a transliteration of the Egyptian word per a which referred originally to the royal palace and the king's court, but came by the time of Akhenaten to be used also as a respectful royal title for one individual. Eventually, by the 19th dynasty, there we go with the 19th dynasty again, time of Ramses II. By the 19th dynasty, per a Pharaoh, was used as it is here in Exodus 1. And Gardner's, you know, Sir Alan Gardner, famous Egyptologist, the guy who wrote Gardner's Egyptian Grammar, all that, he has an article actually on this. And he, that, yeah, he's right. I mean, that, that's what the data, that's what the data are. Pharaoh is only used to refer to households, sort of administrations. Think of our modern equivalent of White House. Okay, the White House, the phrase White House can refer to an administration or a single individual, depending on how it's used. Well, the White House said today, well, like, if, it, if it was President Trump saying that, well, again, we can do that math. That's the way per a Pharaoh was used from the 19th dynasty, slipping back into the 18th dynasty, if we want to get you know, a little bit earlier. And, and there's some legitimacy for that. But 18th, 19th dynasty onward, the term becomes used for an individual. Now, if you're thinking already about the chronology issue, you're thinking, well, good grief. How can we possibly hold then to the early date of the Exodus? If you don't know what these terms are, I'll, I'll just, you know, here's a little, little parentheses. When we get into chronology next week, I'm going to be talking about the early date and the late date for the Exodus. Early date is 1446 BC. Okay? That's 18th dynasty. It's prior to this time. 1446 BC is a number that comes from 1 Kings 6 1, where it says in the fourth year of Solomon, and basically everybody agrees Solomon got to the throne around 970 BC. So his fourth year is 966. The fourth year of Solomon was the 480th anniversary of the Exodus from Egypt. So you just do the math. 966 minus 480 because we're going backward. 1446 BC, what could be simpler? Well, a whole lot of things can be simpler, as we'll see next week. The late date, though, wants to put the Exodus in the time of Ramses, roughly 200 years later. Okay? And you say, well, how can they do that if 1 Kings 6 1 gives us the math? Well, they would say, well, 480, interestingly enough, is 12 times 40. 40 is a generation. Maybe it just means 12 generations. We don't have an exact chronology. Generations can be less than 40 years. You know, generations really when a, a male reaches adulthood and starts having children. And 40, again, is a symbolic number throughout the Old Testament. Again, that, that's well known. So they don't take the number literally, and they feel comfortable with that because they want the Exodus to be during the time of Ramses II because of verses like this, Exodus 111, and also because of the Egyptological data about the term like per a pharaoh, only used of an individual like it is here in Exodus 111, from the 19th dynasty onward. Okay, we're going to get into all of this next week, but that's just telegraphing. So you know, we, we've got here a situation where, let's, let's agree for the sake of this episode, that the Israelites have tough lives. They're in bondage. Can we just move on now? Well, we could, except that there's a lot of bickering about this description. There are critical scholars out there who will say, look, the only people in Israel that could rightly be called, or the only people in Egypt that could rightly be called slaves are military captives, you know, prisoners of war. They were made slaves. They would say major Egyptian monuments, I catch my wording here, I'm being deliberate here, major Egyptian monuments, and the, and the, the, the wonderful example, of course, of the pyramids, were built by trained, skilled laborers. They were native Egyptians who they were like masons, okay? This is what they did. And when the pyramids were built and other, again, significant monuments, you actually had people move into the area. They built towns to sustain the worker population. They were well-fed. This is the job you wanted because you basically you got more food than anybody else. You were, you were weighted on in that respect. You, know, you, you had to be maintained. You had to be physically vigorous and strong. So this was a, a good life, you know, to work for Pharaoh as a mason, as a, somebody who did, yeah, the labor's hard, but hey, it's a building project. There's going to be another one after this. It's job security. We're good. They were not slaves. And all that's true. Of course, the assumption is that we classify Pithom and Ramses as monuments or you know, major building projects that were looked upon at the same way as the pyramids and certain temples were. Okay, so that, that, that's a big assumption. Uh, but it's often made. Uh, you get uh, you know, scholars, again, that just want to pick at what's going on there, as, as though to say that the, the description of, of the Israelites as slaves is incorrect. Again, what's incorrect is the assumption that foreigners, therefore, were never put under hard labor, forcible, hard labor. That in, in, you know, to be honest with you, and again, we'll, we'll get into some of the data here, that might be actually worse. 
than a slave situation. Um, you know, there, there are indications that what we're dealing with is a little bit different here. It's not, again, a, a work crew, but it's not really a prisoner of war, you know, kind of situation either. So but let me just let me just mention Sarna here. I, I've loaded this article into uh, the news, the, the podcast article archive that you can access if you're a newsletter subscriber. Um, in regard to this idea of some objecting against the recounting of the bondage, again, by saying that the picture doesn't fit. Nahum uh, Sarna has a nice article on this. It, it kind of goes through the, the data pretty well. And he writes this. For his vast building program, Ramses II, again, Sarna is with the consensus. He's going to assume this is Ramses II here at his time. Okay. For his vast building program, Ramses II preferred to conscript foreigners in the area rather than native Egyptians. Such was reported by the Greco-Roman historian Diodorus, Siculus, first century BC, who apparently relied on trustworthy Egyptian sources. The enslavement of the Israelites falls into the category that Diodorus describes. It was not a domestic bondage, the type in which an individual becomes the chattel of a private master and lives in his household, although this type of slavery is well attested in Egypt. There's no evidence that the Israelite women were enslaved or that slavery involved the dissolution of the family unit. Now, if you were a POW, this is me breaking it up. If you were a POW, you, you don't have any hope of that. Back to Sarna. So there's no evidence that the women were enslaved or that slavery involved the dissolution of the family unit. In fact, one text shows in the Bible that the Israelites could live next door to or even in the same house as Egyptians and maintain social relations with them. And he quotes Exodus 3, 22 in this regard. And I'll read it. Each woman shall borrow from her neighbor and the lodger in her house objects of silver and gold and cloth clothing, and you shall put these on your sons and daughters, thus stripping the Egyptians. Now, the point is that when that sort of prophecy is given in Exodus 3, this is, that's, that's the burning bush scene. There's a reference made to Israelite women being neighbors to Egyptians. You know, that isn't the normal, that's not your POW slave lifestyle there. It's just, it's not the same thing. Back to Sarna. What we are dealing with is state slavery, the organized imposition of forced labor upon the male population for long and indefinite terms of service under degrading and brutal conditions. The men so conscripted received no rewards for their labors. They enjoyed no civil rights, and their lot was generally much worse than that of a household slave. So what Sarna is basically pointing out, again, you can read the whole article, there were different kinds of slaves in Egypt. It's not just, again, POWs. So when you see these kinds of arguments you know, made to sort of delegitimize the description of Exodus 1, they, they just don't hold up you know, under the data. So the description of the bondage is not you know, something that is non-historical. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, another issue here, the, uh, the dramatic growth, again, of the population. Uh, again, we, we mentioned this a little bit you know, about how you know, 70, the early reference to the 70 was a subset. Now you've got the people of Israel expanding you know, dramatically throughout Egypt. There, there's an issue here with, if, if we just ask the question, well, is, is there anything like any, in Egyptian history, Egyptian texts, where we have large numbers of Semites, Semitic people living in Egypt, you know, and, and, and specifically in you know, the area of Goshen, which, which is the eastern delta, the northeastern delta region. Um, I guess eastern is probably a better way to describe it. Is there anything like that? And yes, there is. So we have a dramatic growth of a Semitic population in Goshen, in the Delta area. And that has led most scholars to identify the Hyksos period, that's H-Y-K-S-O-S, the Hyksos period, as the backdrop period to the bondage. Now, let me, let me just unpack that a little bit. Hyksos is actually a Greek term, and it's, it's the Greek version of the Egyptian, an Egyptian phrase, hekau kasut, which means rulers of or from foreign lands. Now, the Hyksos period, there was a period in Egyptian history where you had a, a, a a, a numerically significant concentration of Semitic people living in the Delta region in Egypt. That period is known as the Second Intermediate Period. It's the 16th to the 18th dynasties in Egypt. The Hyksos, in other words, it's before Ramses, okay? So try to, try to get this mental picture in your head. If you think the Pharaoh of the Exodus, the Pharaoh of Exodus 1, you know, and, and the Exodus story is Ramses. Well, preceding him, there was this period when you had lots of Semites living in Goshen, living in the, the, the Delta region. And they were hated by the native Egyptians. They were foreign rulers, that's, you know, rulers from foreign lands. You actually had Hyksos pharaohs okay, in, in two of these dynasties. Uh, they, they actually got to that position where they, uh, you know, Egypt was you know, breaking down. You know, if you look at Egyptian history, you have like kingdoms, old kingdom, middle kingdom, new kingdom. And in between each of those, you have these intermediate periods. That's what scholars refer to them as. If it's an intermediate period, it's a time of chaos in Egypt. There's no one pharaoh. There's no central authority. You might have five or six pharaohs, okay? You've, you've got a bunch of guys running around saying, we're the pharaoh, you know, and they're not asking for votes either. They're trying to take over turf, or they're content to just control districts of Egypt. Egypt is fragmented in the intermediate periods, and it takes a strong hand, a strong force to reunite the entire country and usher in a new, a new rule. So that's why you get the old kingdom, that's the pyramid age, then things break down, you've got the first intermediate period. Then you have the middle kingdom, where things are consolidated again, and that breaks down eventually, and you get the second intermediate period, this, that's the Hyksos period. Then after that, you've got the new kingdom. And this is dynasty 18, 19, 20. This is when somewhere in there, the biblical events are of the bondage and the exodus you know, are occurring or thought to occur. So if we look at the Hyksos period, again, the consensus view among Egyptologists and biblical scholars is that the period of the bondage is at the very end. It, it, it actually is, is sort of an after effect of the Hyksos period. So for a few hundred years earlier than this, what happens in Egyptian history, according to Egyptian records, is the Hyksos are finally dealt with. Egypt is consolidated and the Hyksos are literally driven out of the country. They go into the Negev, into, into you know, Canaan, and all this kind of thing. They are, they are literally driven out. They're not chased, like in the Exodus story. They are driven out because they're, they're hated. And, and any that were left in 
Egypt, they enslaved because they hated them. So the consensus view is that the, the period of the bondage follows the Hyksos period. It's part of a reaction against the hated Hyksos Semites. And so they tend to put, again, the consensus view tends to put Joseph somewhere in this, this Hyksos period because Joseph was a Semite. He had to have lived during the second intermediate period, the time of the Hyksos. Now, if you accept all that, you cannot hold to the early date of the Exodus because you have to have Joseph in Egypt before the Exodus. If the Exodus is in 1446 BC, BC that means Joseph is around earlier, and that ain't anywhere near the Hyksos period. If you think Joseph belongs in the Hyksos period, then you have to hold the late date, the non-literal you know, number. You know, time of Ramses, 1250 or so, the Exodus. You have to reject the early date, which is based on the math given, the, the literalized math given in 1 Kings 6.1. Okay? So that, that's what we're dealing with here. Now, the idea, again, just to go over this a little bit more, is not that the Israelites were to be equated totally with the Hyksos. The Hyksos are a, a conglomeration of ethnic groups, specifically, mostly, predominantly, Semites. They infiltrated into the land over you know, a long period of time. Now, this is Sarna's article. I'll quote a little bit from it. They were a conglomeration of ethnic groups. They infiltrated in the land over a long period of time in ever-increasing numbers. They come you know, from Canaan you know, somewhere up there. They were fully in control of the eastern delta of the Nile. They established a capital at Avaris. The Hyksos constitute the 15th and 16th dynasties, again, two of the dynasties in this period. They adapted the style and bureaucratic institutions of the traditional pharaohs. They wanted to be like, like the pharaohs. Gradually, the Semites replaced Egyptians in high administrative offices. And so Sarna believes that Joseph belongs in this period. Now, again, that makes good sense with a late date. It's impossible for the early date. You know, the, the, whole, the whole notion of per a'a, Egyptian for Pharaoh, only being a new kingdom, you know, 19th dynasty, maybe the 18th dynasty a little bit, but onward. In other words, after the Hyksos period, that goes with the late date too. Again, things are looking good for the late date here, which is why we need to spend a whole week, a whole episode on the current chronological issues because the late date has problems. Okay, so don't just, you know, be clicking your heels if you're a late dater and saying, well, problem solved, you know, end of story. No, it, it's, it's a whole lot more complicated than that. Now, in regard to Joseph, Let's just talk about him a little bit. If Joseph is part of this Hyksos period, if the Hyksos period is what we're looking at here in Exodus 1, at the tail end of it, the very end of it, the question is pretty simple. Does Joseph fit what's said about him in the Hyksos period? Does he fit? Or, for the early date, would he fit in the period prior to the Hyksos period? Prior to the second intermediate period, that would be the Middle Kingdom. Does Joseph fit there better? Which era does Joseph fit in? And which does he fit better? Those are two related but different questions. The short answer is you can make him fit in either. Uh, depending on, on how you take certain things, again, especially if you want to support the early date, if you're convinced that, you can get Joseph in the Middle Kingdom and feel good about it. You really can. Um, you know, questions like, does it make sense you know, to have a Semite rise to the height of power like Joseph did in a period other than the Hyksos period? Again, this is, this, this is kind of how the debates go. So just to say a little bit about this, some of the elements of the Joseph story seem to fit the Hyksos context, second intermediate period, pretty well. There's a large Semitic presence there, including a power base, obviously, but there are some pretty serious disconnections. The biblical text, for instance, nowhere states that Joseph was one among many Semites in rulership. See, if you're dealing with the Hyksos context, Basically, everybody in the administration is a Semite. Okay, is that really the picture that emerges from the Joseph story? Well, not so much. Another one. Joseph, when he meets Pharaoh, he has to shave and put clean clothing on. But why shave if Pharaoh was a Semite or used to Semites? You know, there are lots of Semites running around here. They grow beards. It seems to be a native Egyptian context. Now, you could argue you know, on the flip side, well, the, the Hyksos wanted to be like the Pharaohs, so they just kept the rules. Yeah, you, and you can argue that. But it's just it's an oddity. It can go either way. Another example. Joseph has given a daughter to marry of the priest of On, Heliopolis. He, uh, on, Heliopolis, you can probably tell from the name of the city, the Greek version of it, it was a a city dedicated to a solar, a sun deity. However, the Hyksos didn't worship the sun. They didn't worship a solar deity. They worshiped Set. Again, if Joseph has given the daughter of the priest of Heliopolis, the solar deity, that doesn't sound like Hyksos, period. That sounds like a native Egyptian, some other period, you know, because it's a solar deity. Another one, archaeological work has produced evidence of high-ranking Semites in Egypt earlier than the Hyksos period. Now, David Roll, we'll come back to Roll again, especially next week, uh, you know, he's the patterns of evidence guy that they, they build a lot of that video off of his work. Roll uses this evidence, this it's particularly, in particular, a statue, a statue without a face. It's been defaced. There is evidence of Semites that were high ranking in the Delta area. You know, politically, they, had, they, they were rich, they had beautiful houses. You know, it's, it's pretty obvious that they were high servants, you know, Pharaoh. There's a statue with a mushroom type hairstyle that's of particular interest here. And that, that's a hairstyle that's used of Asiatics. That's the Egyptian term for Semites you know, and other foreigners. Um, there's a particular statue with this mushroom hairstyle. And you can see that hairstyle in other Egyptian art in a 12th dynasty palace. That's Middle Kingdom. Now, it suggests that the palace in which this was found belonged to a Semite. Why else would you make a statue of a Semitic guy? It must have been his palace. So Roll believes that he actually believes that the defaced statue is a statue of Joseph. Now that says too much. Basically, you just can't prove that. But at the very least, it shows a high-ranking Semite in Egypt in the Delta before the Hyksos. What about Joseph's titles? Okay, do they jive with the Middle with the Middle Kingdom, or must they be Hyksos? Well, there's plenty of evidence archaeologically and textually for Semites in the Middle Kingdom generally before the Hyksos. You know, you have the Beni Hassan mural. He's Joseph is called the overseer of the house under Potiphar. The Egyptian term, that's, that's evidently, again, a Hebrew translation or transliteration, translation in this case of heri per, which means literally he who is over the house. Again, this, this terminology does show up in Middle Kingdom Egyptian texts. Uh, James Hoffmeyer from Wheaton, who's, a, who's an evangelical tradition, he's an Egyptologist, he was trained in Toronto. 
um, he cites the Brooklyn Papyrus here, which is dated late. It's very late, 660 to 330 BC. But everyone in Egyptology puts that in the Middle Kingdom because of its not only its content, but its writing style. It matches the writing style of Middle Kingdom documents. Genesis 40, 41 has Pharaoh declaring to Joseph, only, with, only as regards to the throne will you be greater, or will I be greater than you? So Hoffmeyer notes that many take this to mean Joseph was elevated to the position of vizier, the highest ranking official in the realm. Most would argue that Joseph's duties, however, don't match the vizier's. There are famous studies on this. Hoffmeyer references them, studies by Ward and Van der Vorn. But Hoffmeyer points out that, that their research focuses on material from the New Kingdom, not on the Middle Kingdom. Middle Kingdom viziership is not as well known. Or there just isn't as much data. So Hoffmeyer says that this office for Joseph, the vizier office, can't be ruled out. He also points out that foreigners did hold lofty positions, including the viziership. There are Semites that actually were elevated to the level of vizier. Uh, there, there's one you know, in, in the New Kingdom, Seti I. He named a Syrian, the, quote, great chancellor of the entire land. And the guy was a Semite. He's a Syrian. He's not a native Egyptian. He's from Syria. He's the great chancellor of the entire land. Isn't it interesting that Seti I, which, of course, the movie has as the father of Ramses II. But again, you can't have Joseph and Moses butt up against each other chronologically. So don't make too much hay out of that because it just doesn't work. But anyway, I thought I'd mention it. Under uh, another example, be under Hatshepsut. This is the, the, the famous woman pharaoh. She named a Semite as her vizier. You know, you can read Hoffmeyer. His, his book Israel in Egypt is, is just chock full of data like this, and you, you can read, you know, his his take on this. He has other examples as well. Another instance we can cite: Genesis forty five eight. Joseph is referred to as a father to Pharaoh. No such title is known in Egypt. Is that a problem? Well, it depends how you look at it. Nearly all Egyptologists consider that phrase, a father to Pharaoh, to be a Hebrew placeholder for a father to the god which is well-known in Egypt. You say, well, how does that work? Well, it would refer to a chief advisor of Pharaoh who is, in Egyptian thinking, a god. The biblical writer apparently thought that the actual Egyptian phrase was either offensive or maybe confusing to his own readers. So instead of writing, calling Joseph, you're, you're, you're going to be a, a father to the god, like to a Hebrew and Israel, that's not going to make any sense, or it might be offensive. And so they, they change it, a father to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's a god, you know, and so you know, one, one works just as well as the other. Now, one of them notes this, in other passages, and this is in the Hebrew Bible, priests and prophets are spoken of as father to somebody else even though they're not literal fathers. It's because, like real fathers, they instructed their quote-unquote sons, their people. It is often surmised that the underlying Egyptian title, again, quote, father of the god, was given to a variety of high officials, such as clergy, who advised Pharaoh. So it's really kind of a common title if you understand it that way. So in short, there's no obstacle to having Joseph in the Middle Kingdom. The early date can work. But there's nothing that rules out Joseph in the Hyksos period conclusively, so the late daters are happy too. This is what you get you know, when, you're, when you're dealing you know, with this kind of material. So in Exodus 1, yes, we encounter a Pharaoh. We encounter the names Pithom and Ramses, which we'll talk about next week. We encounter, you know, contexts that, you know, okay, we've got slavery. Everything descriptively about Exodus 1 can work well, not only historically. It, it, it affirms the, the, the broad general historicity of the account. You know, in other words, are, it's, are the details of the account, do they jive historically with details, with, with what we know of the culture of the place that the story describes? And the answer is yes. Uh, you know, this, this takes us back to our introduction, our introductory, you know, discussion of, well, what's history? What's historiography? What does historical mean? You know, what's mythic history? You know, all these questions. Oftentimes in the Bible, if you're looking for, for, if you're latched onto a specific name like Moses and you say, well, I can't believe that this account is historical, this, this story about the guy Moses, unless I find the name Moses in some other text, that's really misguided. What you ought to be asking is, does the story about this guy Moses, does it fit in all its details with the place that Moses was said to be doing stuff? And the answer here in Exodus 1 is, yeah, there's nothing in Exodus 1 that renders it as unhistorical or as really even as difficult. You've got the slavery issue. Again, it's not just you know, POWs. There are other kinds of slaves. You've got the, you know, the, the Pithom and Ramesses thing. You've got at least the Delta. Again, we'll talk about the names ne- next time. Uh, you've got Semites in the Delta. That can work, of course, with the Second Intermediate Period, right before the New Kingdom, when you know, these events are taking place, or even earlier, the Middle Kingdom. The titles can work. Again, the only, the only outlier in what we've discussed so far is, is Pharaoh itself, Para, again, 18th Dynasty and beyond. But that, again, that'll be an issue. We, I'm saving that until next time. Exodus 1 certainly can be viewed as historical. There's no obstacle to it. Now, I want to hit on two other things before we, we quit for this episode real quickly. And that is, I'm just going to mention this, and you can go you know, elsewhere to other things I've done about this. Inevitably, there are going to be some listeners that think, well, did they, you know, the Israelites, you know, they built the stuff for Pithom and Ramses, and I've seen the movie, and you know, did, did they build the pyramids? Did they build you know, like the Great Pyramid and Giza? And all? No, they didn't. Chronologically, by, by either view, either the early or late you know, date for the Exodus, that cannot work by the Bible's own math. How old people were, X number of years between you know, two people, it can't work. Now, I've actually blogged this. The best place to go, though, is go up to Google, put in did the Israelites build the pyramids? Okay. And then the website fringepop321.com. You'll be taken immediately to an essay about this. I wrote it, and I, I actually developed it a little bit more because of the Ben Carson thing. If we were way back to the, the earlier presidential election, somebody came up with something that says that one of the pres- presidential candidates, Ben Carson, believed that the Israelites had built the pyramids. And he does. He's totally wrong. It just can't work. Uh, I also made a Fringe Pop video about this. So if you go to YouTube, Fringe Pop 321, you'll find a video on this. So that's all I'm going to say about it. No, no. Exodus 1 is not evidence that the Israelites built the pyramids. Okay. 
Let's move on to verses 15 through 22 for the last uh, element here of this episode. I'll read a little bit of it again. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, that's going to be our key term, the birth stool. If it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, what's up? You know, why have you done this? And let the male children live. And they said, well, the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, they're vigorous, they give birth before the midwife comes. Okay, that, that whole thing. Now, we've also, we, we've talked in an earlier episode of the podcast, specifically episode 210, about the ethics of deception. Now, does God use deception? And the answer is, yes, he does. God himself uses deception to punish and thwart evil. So if you want a whole episode on that, go to episode 210 and listen to that. So I'm not going to get into that issue here. We've already covered it. I do want to get into the issue of this term, the birth stool. You say, well, good grief. I mean, what, what, what could possibly be interesting about that? Ah, uh, yes. Well, here we go. The term translated birth stool, and basically all your English translations have something like this, is Hebrew of Nayim. That term is used in Jeremiah 18.3 for the potter's wheel. Remember the famous passage in Jeremiah, you know, potter fashioning the clay and God's the potter, and you know, he makes us and you know, all that kind of stuff. That's important, what I just said. You know, it's used in Jeremiah 18 for, for that imagery, again, the, the potter's wheel imagery. Now, I, I got news for you. But the Hebrews, and the Egyptians for that matter, didn't use potter's wheels to have babies on. They just didn't. And I'm going to reference an article here. Again, I put this in the, uh, the, the podcast article archive. You can get it if you subscribe to the newsletter. There's a, you know, 2003, so it's not that recent, but there's an article by Scott Morshauser called Potter's Wheels and Pregnancies, a note on Exodus 1.16. It's very interesting. Literally in the Hebrew text, if we were looking at this in Hebrew and translating just the words that are there, it would not read the way it does in ESV or other translations. It would say, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and see the birth stool. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why, why would I as a midwife go to a, an Israelite house and just look at the birth stool? Of course, it doesn't make any sense. And so translators insert them into the translation so it does make sense. And you see them, i.e. the Israelite women on the birth stool. That isn't actually what the text says. So you have a, a grammatical problem. You see them, or excuse me, you see the birth stool. You see the ovnayim. And then this whole use of the same term, it's, it's, it's an unusual term. It doesn't occur much, but it does occur in Jeremiah 18.3 for a potter's wheel. How, what are we looking at here? There's another oddity. The midwives make up an excuse. Well, the Hebrew women are delivered you know, before the midwife gets there. Now, the oddity is, given that this Pharaoh in Exodus 1 has been portrayed as pretty ruthless and heartless, why would that answer be satisfactory at all? You know, he, he doesn't retaliate against them. You know, why, why, why not? It just, you know, it just doesn't make sense. The whole way we understand this doesn't quite make sense. So Morshauser writes this, why would either a premature or unattended birth annul the main thrust of the royal command? If one accepts the usual interpretation of verse 16, the excuse offered by Shifra and Pua would not have solved their dilemma. The absence of a midwife would hardly have freed the women from their duty to their sovereign. You, know, you, you killed a boy. Back to Morshauser. They still would have the information necessary to carry out their task. They sure would. However, the next stage in this process, wherein the ruler ratchets up the pressure and demands that his subjects, not just the, the, the women, the midwives, but his subjects, drown the Hebrew infants, makes it probable that the midwives' mission had been formulated in a different fashion. Apparently, their order had been to eliminate the males prior to their birth, but once delivered, they were to be permitted to survive. And that, again, I'm, I'm, that's, I'll stop the quote there. And that explains why Pharaoh has to just tell the, the populace that, well, you know, you got to get rid of the boys. Now, what Morshauser suggests, he suggested the phrase, upon the Avnayim, okay, or, or you see the Avnayim, you see the, that, that, that whole thing. He believes, and this is going to sound a little bizarre, but it actually makes some interesting sense. He believes that that is the Hebrew equivalent of an Egyptian idiom based on a particular, very particular religious metaphor. Think of the potter's wheel here. Okay, Morshauser writes this, the potter's wheel is regularly linked to pregnancy in ancient Egyptian religious literature and art, not for the literal women, but in a different way. He writes, the implement... And this, this potter's wheel was associated with the creator god, Knum, a ram-headed deity who was depicted as an artisan. In mythopoetic text, Knum could mold and shape each human being at conception, quote, upon his wheel, unquote, with the potential child being granted the physical and psychological traits that would define it as an individual, obviously including characteristics of gender. During this time of fashioning, the developing infant was said to be, quote, upon the potter's wheel, unquote, from which it would hopefully be delivered hale and healthy. What is significant is that the metaphor refers to a gestating fetus prior to parturition. We suggest, Morshausen writes, that the Hebrew is an adaptation of the idiom and refers to a child still forming in the womb that has not yet come to full term. And so the point would be, when you look you know, at, at the child, again, just quoting Morshausen again, when you look or determine upon the potter's wheel, and, and what he's saying is, is the Pharaoh is telling them, now look, you go visit the house and you're doing a prenatal exam. What's inside the womb there is upon the, the, the wheel, the potter's wheel of Knum. Knum is forming you know, what's inside there. And he, he's a Pharaoh. He's an Egyptian. This is Egyptian religion. Okay, when you undertake this prenatal examination, if it is a son, then terminate it, terminate him. If it is a daughter, she shall live. Such a procedure would have been within the scope of ancient Egyptian knowledge and practice. Medical texts contain prognostic recipes for determining the sex of an unborn child, as well as prescriptions for ending a pregnancy through droughts and, droughts and potions. In other words, abortion. Uh, you know, the Egyptians had abortifacients. They had a means to determine the gender of 
a fetus, you know, still you know, in utero. And so that Morchausen, you know, theorizes, and I think it makes good sense, especially with the with the Egyptian metaphor about the knum forming the you know the, the contents of the womb on the potter's wheel, and ovnayim in, in the in the actual text in, in Exodus one is the word for potter's wheel. So what what's going on here is that Pharaoh basically says, go into the house, give them the prenatal exam, determine the gender. If it's a boy, you kill him. But what Shifra and Pua say is, look, you know, we went to the house, but they'd already had the kid. And then Pharaoh says, okay. But then he then he you know, he he ratchets it up later. You know, it, it's his plan isn't working. <laughs> again, you know, again, the forces of chaos are not able you know to 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 accomplish their purposes here. The seed of Abraham is still growing. And then he he gets desperate. He says, look, I'm just going to command. You know, generally, General Edict commanded all his people. Verse 22. Pharaoh commanded all his people, not just the midwives. Every son that is born of the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. He, he, you know, he just gets desperate because they're giving birth before the prenatal exam. Now, I think it's kind of interesting. You know, you, you could do a number of things with this in, in regard to the whole abortion issue, because that's really what's in play here. Again, it's, it's not a live birth. You know, that isn't the issue you know, until after the fact. Um, again, it's, it's, just a, it's a point that I think that basically every English translation misses. And I think uh, Morshausen's work here way back in 2003 is really useful here because it, it, it resolves the, the oddities and the incongruities of the passage. So that's our treatment of, of Exodus 1, again, this, this part 1. Again, there was a lot to cover there, but you know, there's going to be a lot to cover just with the chronology. So we had to take that out. Because that's really dense. The weeds are dense. It's a quagmire. I mean, I'm here. I'm using metaphors myself. You know, for the best that this is. But again, I'm hoping that you already see why it's necessary. Again, to split this up into two. But lots of interesting stuff there that a close reading of Exodus one can yield to you. Well, we might as well just jump right in. Uh, again, this is part two of Exodus one, and basically textually, our entire focus is going to be Exodus one eleven. Uh, I will read that in a moment because I, I do want to back up just a tad to verse eight. We 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 mentioned this, and I'm going to read uh, something that I read in the, in the first part to sort of set it up. Uh, but we're going to. Exodus 111 is it. There's just a lot that's going on there. So in verse 8 of Exodus chapter 1, we read, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He's not identified uh, here. He's not called Pharaoh until verse 11. Uh, Carpenter, was this is the quotation I read last time, writes, This Pharaoh was not acquainted with the previous history of Joseph and Israel in Egypt, or at least he did not choose to acknowledge Israel in her past relationships to Egypt. But more importantly, he lacked a knowledge of or refused to grant any significance to the close friendships that Joseph and Israel had cultivated with past Pharaohs and Egyptians. The writer does not give the king's name, nor are the pharaoh's names given in Genesis, back in that, that material that related to Joseph. We don't get any names. What we do get is a reference, and we'll, we'll bring this up again. We get a reference to the district of Ramses, Ramses, in Genesis. But we don't have a pharaoh in Genesis referred to directly as Ramses. And I'm saying Ramses for a, that way for a particular reason. We'll get to that as well. And it's the same situation here in Exodus 1. We've got a building or a you know, storehouse city, a city referred to as Ramses, but not a person directly. Now. Having said all that, we have a pharaoh in view in verse 11. Again, here's sort of our launching pad, and we're basically tethered to this for the whole episode. We read, therefore, the Egyptians, again, the king and his people, his, his administration, they were freaked out by the growth of the numerical growth of the Israelites. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built the people who were enslaved, built for pharaoh, store cities, Pithom and Ramses. Now, we get these names, and if, and it's a big if, if there is any prayer in Exodus 1, and you can throw in, again, the earlier reference in Genesis, even though that's going to mess things up because there's 400 years between Genesis. Just remember to store this away, especially if you're a late dater. This is a problem for you. There are 400 years between the time of Joseph back in Genesis when we get that name Ramses in the text and here in Exodus 1. Ramses II, no part, no pair of the Ramesside dynasty, of course, was 400 years old. And you know, you, you've, you've got a, if, if you assume from out of the gates that the reference to Ramses here in Exodus 111 refers to a person you really have no hermeneutical right to say that it doesn't back in Genesis. The Ramesside dynasty is not that long. Okay, so the late daters have a, I'm telegraphing this up front, they have a, a problem with methodology. And that's going to become apparent as we go. Now, you know, early data's problems, late data's problems, that's why there's a debate. That's why, again, this is like kind of a quagmire, the whole issue. But let's just you know, focus on this verse and the names. And I'm going to be taking shots and helping out, doing a little bit of both, to the early date and the late date. I just want you to see what the issues are and why it's difficult, why there is, is debate. It is not simply solvable by appealing to 1 Kings 6.1 and saying late date and that's all there is. It's just not that simple, although you can make a good case for the early date. So here we go. If we look at Exodus 1.11, the issue, of course, is the, the, the names of the store cities, both of them, but mostly you know, Ramses. Now the name Ramses, the spelling of, of this name in both in Egyptian text and in the, in the Hebrew can vary. Here we have literally Ramses. There's like two A vowels in the pronunciation. It's not Ramses, it's Ramses, the way this is spelled. So I'm going to try to be consistent here and say Ramses when I'm referring to Exodus 1.11 specifically, but I'll also just refer to Ramses II just as a historical figure. 
but it, in the text, this is going to become important, in the text, it's Ra'am sees the way it's spelled. The first major chronological battle of the whole fight over the date of the Exodus, and of course, if you're dating the Exodus, it's the date of the conquest that follows, it'll be Joshua. Really, this is sort of a linchpin thing you know, for how we think we might be able to understand and overlap biblical history, history of Israel, with ancient Near Eastern history, Egypt and Canaan, for that matter. As I said last time, I'll give you the, the basics of the two dates, early and late. Early date says the Exodus happened in 1446 because of 1 Kings 6.1, which says that in the fourth year of Solomon, that fourth year was the 480th anniversary of the Exodus from Egypt. We know on, on very good grounds, astronomical grounds, and because of both astronomy and the, the, the people who used astronomy, especially the Assyrians, okay, they're very good at this. Babylonians, you know, very good at astronomy and then working backward with their kings and where their kings encounter the Assyrian king and all, all this. As I said in the, in the introductory episode, after about 1000 BC, the chronology, you know, at least on the with respect to Assyria and Babylon, works pretty well. It's, it's, it's pretty tight. You can really defend it and link it to astronomy. So we've got here an instance where we can date Solomon with a lot of confidence as taking the throne in 970 BC. His fourth year is 966. Subtract 480 years because you're moving backward in time and you get 1446 for the Exodus. The late date says, well, not so fast. 480 is 12 times 40. So we might be de- dealing with 12 generations and 40, again, a symbolic year for a generation. So we may not be able to just take the math literally and they don't. They have the Exodus occurring during the time of Ramses, which is 200 years later than the early date. And the reason they want to fix it in the reign of Ramses or something in the New Kingdom, New Kingdom is Dynasty 18, 19, 20. Those are the dynasties at least we need to worry about. The reason they want to put it in there is because of verses like Exodus 111, the name reference to Ramses. They feel that that justifies you know, tying, that, that's, a, that's a peg, it's a, it's a chronological peg that we assign you know, to the biblical story and we can back up with Egyptian history, you know, real historical people. And the only thing that it really requires of us, so the story goes, or so the explanation goes, is that we not take First Kings six one literally? So, you know, their defense is you've got stuff in the story. And we alluded to some of this last time. The reference to Pharaoh per Aa using that term, which in Egyptian means great house, it only gets applied to an individual person in Egyptian texts from the 18th dynasty forward. And so here we have it in Exodus one eleven. So they're saying this, this has to be stuff going on in the New Kingdom. Okay, specifically in the Ramesside dynasty, dynasty twenty. Two hundred years earlier, you get the 18th dynasty, and that's where early daters. It's still New Kingdom, but that's where early daters want you know to to have things going on. So you have this two hundred year differential. And I don't, I want, I'm going over this because I want you to see that the late date, a lot of you won't like the late date because you want to take First Kings 6.1 literally. The late date is not just a flim-flam. It's not just, let's throw a, a dart at the board. I don't like you know, biblical literalism. I hate the Bible. You know, so we're just going to throw this number. No, it, it, it's actually based on substance. 40 is a symbolic number. So is 12. Okay, you actually do have Egyptian material that, that can very readily situate and anchor these events in the Ramesside dynasty. That's true. It's real. The data are there. The question then becomes, is, is that the only way to look at the data? Are there other data elsewhere? That can allow the early date to appeal to more than just First Kings six one. They can actually, you know, go into Egyptian material and say, "Look, you know, here, here's the way we need to look at all this," and then defend the early date that way. Okay, this is a substantive debate. It's not the Bible lovers versus the Bible haters. If you've been taught that, I'm sorry, but you need to disabuse yourself of that immediately. It's just not true. So we're, we're not about caricatures here. We're, we're about actually, you know, trying to, to think, you know, trying to understand why these arguments, why these debates are what they are. So Exodus one eleven is our first you know, signpost for all of this stuff. The name Ramses. Now, since the passage describes the Israelites, the passage, the whole first chapter of Exodus, describes the Israelites of the generation immediately preceding the Exodus. So the people who are under affliction in Exodus 1, these are going to be the people who Moses is going to deliver at least 40 you know, years later, because Moses is going to have to be born in Exodus 2. He's going to grow up, he's going to be 40, and then he's going to you know, kill a man, he's going to flee Egypt, he's going to be out in Midian for 40 years, so now we've got 80 years. Again, can we take these dates literally or not, and all that kind of stuff. But there's, there's some distance between the deliverance and this generation that's suffering. So, but you're going to have a lot of overlap here between the people, you know, maybe their children, uh, who are suffering uh, under Egyptian taskmasters in the actual Exodus. So since we, you know, that's pretty well chronologically close, you know, we've got you know, these, these generations that sort of butt up against each other. And since Ramses, again, that particular spelling, is used, and, and he's called Pharaoh, since that name and that title is 18th, 18th dynasty, toward the end of the 18th dynasty and later, people are going to say, this has to be Ramses. It has to be a late date. The early date's impossible. And this becomes really one of the main reasons why this is argued. It is an obvious problem for the early view. It doesn't jive with the math of 1 Kings 6.1. But again, there are problems for it and also things that are pretty nice when it comes to the early view too. Now we're going to throw David Roll in here basically at the end about him. I just want you to know that Roll's chronology, again, he's the guy that's in Patterns of Evidence. You know, that, that film you know, borrows his work or utilizes his work. He also cannot tolerate an identification of Exodus 111 with the Pharaoh Ramses or the Pharaoh Ramses, the second Ramses the Great, but for entirely different reasons. He will be therefore predisposed to be on the early date side of arguments when it comes to Exodus 111. And I'll say something about Roll and his view at the very end. Uh, I don't want to mess with it in here because it's just this is going to be messy enough. So some important points before getting into the actual name Ramses in Exodus 111. Any date of the Exodus, which means any determination of the Pharaoh of the bondage period and the subsequent Exodus from Egypt, has to factor in other details of the biblical text. And here they are. And I'll be honest with you, some of this stuff just gets ignored. You you will read defenses of the early date and the late date, and if there are there are two or three things in here, one in particular. 
or actually two verses in particular, that, I mean, I could, I could just pull books off my shelf right now by leading biblical scholars that discuss the state, and these verses are never cited. But they're really important. Um, so we need to think about a number of things, and, I, and I'm not going to, again, take shortcuts and leave certain things out, but any view, early, late, role, whatever, has to factor in certain things. A big one is Exodus 2.15 and Exodus 4.19. I'm going to read you Exodus 2.15. When Pharaoh heard of it, this is when Moses kills an Egyptian. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought, he sought to kill Moses, right? So you have an individual person, Pharaoh. He sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian and sat down by a well, okay? Now, Exodus 4.19 says this. It plays off that reference there in Exodus 2.15. This is when God is, is talking to Moses, you know, at, at the burning bush still. The Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So he flees from Pharaoh. Again, Pharaoh is used as a, a reference there to one person because we're now in Exodus 2, Exodus 1, you know, started that trend. But, you know, it still means the administration as well. But here's the point. It, it has to include the individual Pharaoh. So when, when Exodus 4 says, when God says, hey, all the men who were seeking your life are dead, he's not excluding Pharaoh. The Pharaoh of the Exodus and the Pharaoh of the oppression cannot be the same individual. You'd be amazed. And I can show you commentaries as well where people just assume that you can have the same guy for both events, like these verses just don't exist. They cannot be the same person. You cannot exclude Pharaoh from Exodus 4.19 because it was Pharaoh, he, who sought Moses' life. You can't, you can't take him out of Exodus 4.19 when he's in Exodus 2.15. So the, these references, again, have to at least include the Pharaoh. It can include others, but it has to at least include Pharaoh. And I would say, again, because Exodus 2.15 is so explicit, you know, that that you, you just can't get around this point. We know that the Pharaoh alive at the time of Moses' murder of an Egyptian is not the same Pharaoh that's alive at the Exodus. Now, Acts 7.23, here's another little factor, tells us that Moses was about 40 years old when he committed this crime, when he killed this Egyptian. Now, that means the Pharaoh at the time of that act may have also been, may have also been the Pharaoh of Moses' birth. But he can't be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. You know, be, so we've got a 40-year span. It's possible. There are some Pharaohs that, that reigned for 40 years or longer. And there's one in the you know, Ramses the Great did, and then there's a candidate for the early date that did as well. Okay, but the, the, the fact is, even if you have a guy whose reign is over 40 years so that he could be the pharaoh at the birth of Moses, you know, he knows Moses, Moses is raised in Pharaoh's household, and he's the pharaoh of the bondage, he's around when Moses kills this guy and then he wants Moses dead. Even though that can be the same guy for Moses' birth and Moses' crime, he cannot be the pharaoh of the Exodus because of Exodus 2.15 and Exodus 4.19. You've got to have a different pharaoh there. You've got to have a different guy. Now, I would also add this. One way Ramses the second, since he is one of these guys that reigned over 40 years, for him to be in the picture at all, he reigned 66 years, to, to be precise, you'd have to make him the pharaoh of the bondage and at the time of Moses' murder, but then you'd have to have him die before the Exodus event. So anyway, you really get Ramses in the picture. You know, he's, he would be the pharaoh when Moses is born, he's the pharaoh when Moses commits his crime, but he cannot be the pharaoh of the Exodus. But if you read late date material, they desperately want Pharaoh, or, or Ramses II, to be the pharaoh of the Exodus because of Exodus 111. Now, you don't have to read Exodus 111 that way. All it says is that the, the Israelites built for Ramses you know, storehouse cities. Now that, he can still be alive then, but he can't be the pharaoh of the Exodus, is the point. So if you like, if you're a fan of Ramses II, if you're a fan of the late date, you can still have him in the picture, but you got to be careful, again, with, with how you use him. Now, another way the name in Ra of Ramses in Exodus 111 could refer to a pharaoh and work with the late date is to say that Ramses is a reference to Ramses I, not Ramses the Great. Ramses I is two kings earlier, two kings removed. Ramses I was the first pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. He reigned two years. Then he was followed by Seti the first, who reigned 11 years. Then Ramses comes along and he's there for 66. So this alternative possibility, it, it honors Exodus 2.15 and 4.19, would posit that the store cities of Pithom and Ramses, Ramses, were built, or at least begun, under the reign of Ramses the first. He then becomes you know, the pharaoh alive at the birth, you know, you're, you're at the bondage and so on and so forth, and he dies, and then we got Seti, then we got, you know, we've got Ramses the second later. Again, you, you can put these two Ramses, these two Ramses pharaohs into the picture. You just have to, you have to be careful not to violate Exodus 2.15 and 4.19. So again, I'm speaking to late daters here. This is what you prefer. Don't skip those two verses. Don't do it. They actually matter. Now let's talk about late date still some more. Let's talk about Exodus 111. What's the late date evidence to connect Ramses in that verse to one of these Ramesside pharaohs, either one or two? Okay. What, what, what's the evidence? Why, when we read Exodus 111, why should we think of the Ramesside dynasty? Of course, the reflex response is, well, it says Ramses. What else could it be? Uh, we'll see. Now, I'm going to appeal to Redford's article here to begin. Donald Redford is a very well-known Egyptologist. I think he's still teaching. He was at Toronto for many years. Uh, I think he was, uh, he might have been Hoffmeyer's professor. I've never actually done the chronology there myself, but he's at Penn State now. He's been at Penn State for a, a long time. He may still be teaching. He might be retired though. But anyway, Redford is, is a, a well-known Egyptologist. He's published a lot of stuff, both popularly and scholarly. And he has an article specifically on the, the names and the store cities uh, of Exodus 111. And I, I've 
I'll just call a few points from that where he talks about these names. Now he says these are more or less his conclusions. He has detailed you know arguments. You know the, the articles are just cluttered with Egyptian words and all this kind of stuff. But he's these are basically his conclusions. He says Pithom is a term used no earlier than the New Kingdom. Again, that helps late daters. Per Atom would be the Egyptian way of saying it. With respect you know, to Egyptian grammar, again, the etymology, per atom, pithom, can work. Again, it ostensibly helps with the late date. Redford says, quote, to sum up, the texts themselves justify us in stating only that the late new king, in the late new kingdom, the name per atom occurs sporadically in connection with the eastern delta. So there is Egyptian evidence, and by that I mean textual evidence, that gets this term. If you're wondering what happened to the R in Egyptian, it's per atom, in Hebrew it's pithom. Again, if you know both Hebrew and Egyptian, you'd be able to follow Redford's arguments on the etymology. You're going to have to trust me here. I'm just reading his conclusions. You got it. You got the name of the Eastern Delta. You got it from Exodus 111, and you have it in Egyptian texts. Again, no earlier than the New Kingdom. Second, when he talks about Ramses, he notes the spelling, and that's going to become an issue here. He says this city. He, he does think it refers to a city. This city in Exodus 111 is usually identified with Per Ra Nessu in Egyptian, the new capital which Ramses the Second built somewhere in the Delta. End of quote. Okay, so it's not that rules out Ramses the First. Redford accepts that the term Ramses refers to the Pharaoh, but doubts though that the biblical name refers to the royal residence, mostly because what we see in the Hebrew text is not a correct transliteration of the city name. Let me just reiterate that again. Redford's looking at the, the Hebrew text of Exodus 111, Ramses, and he's saying, well, yeah, okay. You know, it's usually taken by biblical scholars to say that Ramses refers to per ra Su, which is Ramses II's capital. But if it was, again, and you have, I'm sorry I'm getting into the, little, into the language here a little bit. I'm going to say it again, per ra Su. Are the Egyptian characters. You notice there's two, there's not two A vowels there. It's not per ra a mes su, it's per ra mes su. And so Redford says, hmm, if we have somebody writing about, you know, who, who was familiar with Egyptian, and good grief, I mean, Moses was raised in Egyptian, you know, Egyptian context, Pharaoh's household, he ought to know Egyptian. And it, it, again, if he, if he wrote this, what we have in the Hebrew Bible, ra am sees two A vowels, you know, again, separated by consonants, though I'm not going to get in the nuts and bolts too much here. But what we see in the Hebrew Bible is not a correct transliteration of the, the place of, of Ramses II's palace. It's not spelled correctly. It's not correct. It's not transliterated correctly. You would expect, again, a second A vowel. So Redford asks, is it not strange that if the two Egyptian toponyms, those are place names, were borrowed around 1200 BC by the Hebrews, the element per should be retained? This is another thing. He's like, okay, well, if, if Ramses refers to this city, per ra su, not only do we have an incorrect transliteration, but what happened to the per? It's not like with Pithom, where they, you know, that gets blended with you know, the autumn that follows. It's just gone. And he's thinking, you know, that's just kind of odd. And he writes in response to this. Again, the article is very detailed. It says, biblical, he says, biblical Ramses and the Per Ra Mesu, apart from the personal name, seem to have nothing in common. So he doesn't. He, he thinks that it is a biblical writer's reference to the name of, of the Pharaoh, but he's like, it can't be to the place because they would have known how to write it. If this is a contemporary, this is key. I'm going to come back to this. If this is a contemporary writer in this Egyptian period, it's messed up. It, 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 it's not what it should be. So he's like, okay, maybe, maybe the biblical writer of some other period, okay, some other period, this is going to open the door for the early date, is thinking of Ramses, maybe, maybe that's possible, but it's really doubtful, even if this guy is thinking of the person, the historical figure, it's really doubtful that what they're building back in Exodus 111 is the actual palace of Ramses II. Again, this is an Egyptologist, you know, who, he's not a Christian, he's not a believer, he's not evangelical, he has no axe to grind here on, on any of the dates. He's just pointing out that this really isn't what we would expect to see. Now, Redford believes, again, the Hebrew transliteration we see in Exodus and, and the one back in Genesis too. What he actually believes is that that transliteration reflects an even later Greek transliteration of Egyptian. He adds as well that the Hebrew term translated store cities is also a late term, because in the Bible, it, refer, it occurs only in Second Chronicles and First Kings, you know, in other words, in you know, past Solomon's era, which is way, way past the Exodus. So what Redford is angling for is he says, you know, I think these terms come from a much later period. You can find Ra'am sees in Greek literature. You can find that combination of vowels in Greek. So what Redford suspects is that a scribe living in a later period who could read Greek, and lots of Jews could, yeah, the Septuagint, hello, okay, that that's where they got this transliteration. Now, if he's correct, there's no way to really argue well that Ramses should be, that the, the, the place, Ramses in Exodus 111, must refer and, and, you know, to, to, this, to the actual palace. He thinks that the term wound up in Exodus 111 by what a scribe decided to do centuries later. Okay? Uh, I want you to hold that thought, because that's going to become really important when we get to the early date. It, it, it's actually useful. So, you, you might ask, well, let's just get into it. I don't want to drag it out too much, but what about the early date? The early, early date response to the name Ramses in Exodus 111 and other passages, again, Genesis 47, 11. I'll be honest with you, it's kind of disappointing to me. There, there's a, I put this in the, the protected folder. Again, if you subscribe to the newsletter, you get the podcast article folder. There's an article by Ailing in there, Charles Ailing. I know Chuck, and he's, you know, he, he knows Egyptian, he's trained in Egyptology. Uh, the article is disappointing, though, in that he, it was written in 1982. He does not interact at all with Redford's 1963 study at all. Zero. He never references it, and I don't know why. 
So it's a little disappointing, but it still has some good material in there. But what Ailing does is he follows another scholar, Ray, R-E-A, with how to sort of deal with the name Ramses in Exodus 111. So he writes this. Ray seeks to show that the city of Ramses, Ramses, was not named after Ramses II, but was called Ramses by the Hyksos, an Asiatic group who seized control of the Nile Delta. We talked about the Hyksos last time, by the way. Back to the quote. Ray bases his thesis on three main arguments, the contents of the 400-year stella of Ramses II, the alleged veneration of the god Ra by the Hyksos, and use of Ramses as a personal name earlier than the 19th dynasty. So we're getting back toward the Middle Kingdom here. Now, I would say the first and third of these arguments are the most important. There's this thing called the 400-year stella. It was written. It was created during the reign of Ramses II. Okay? That, that much is known. It was created at the city of Ramses to commemorate an event that had taken place some years earlier before Ramses' father, Seti, had become pharaoh. So it's a, it's a memorial of some event that happened you know, even before Seti was pharaoh. Seti, while serving as vizier of the late 18th dynasty king Horemhab, came to Per Ramses, again, the Egyptian city that Redford was talking about, Per Ramesu, okay? He came to that city to celebrate the 400, 400th anniversary of the establishing of the Set cult. Remember, the, the Hyksos worshipped the god Set instead of the solar deity. Ray believes that this stele indicates that the 19th dynasty rulers were connected in some way, perhaps geneal- genealogically, to the Hyksos. There's, there's no way to prove that, that the pharaohs of the 19th dynasty were, were partly Semite. Okay? He, he, this guy, Ray, that Ailing is quoting, wants to, to sort of argue that he wants to connect the 400-year stele, even though it was written during the period of Ramses, all the way back to the Hyksos. And, and this is just not a very good argument. It assumes that the anniversary of the founding or the, the, the elevation of the set cult that the Stella mentions, it assumes that, that that mention forces readers to conclude that the city in which the set cult was established was called Per Ramses at the time the cult was established, way back in the Hyksos era. There's no way to prove that. That's far from clear. The Stella could just be saying, hey, the cult was established 400 years ago in the place that we know today as the city of Ramses. Yeah, this, this is a non-argument, but can I, these are disappointing arguments when it comes to Trying to, get the na- trying to connect the name Ramses with a period 400 years prior. Because again, the early date doesn't mind you know, having the Exodus be long before the time of Ramses. That's what they wanted. They want the Exodus to have occurred 200 years before the time of Ramses II. And so this is one of the ways that, it's, that they try to argue it. And it's, it's just not a good argument. Fortunately, there are better arguments for the early date. Ailing writes this. He says, while the name did not become popular, you know, Ramses, until the days of Ramses II and later, occasional examples of the name are known from earlier periods. A very prominent figure in the late 18th dynasty, and that's still too, you, know, you, you might massage that with the early date, uh, a very prominent figure in the late 18th dynasty was Ramos, or Ramses. He was a vizier under Amenhotep III and Akhenaten. And that's still a little late for early date, but you know, we'll, this, is, this is what Ailing is, is trying to argue. Another Ramses is known from approximately Hyksos times. So that would, you know, that would be you know, better. And a still earlier Ramses is mentioned on a stele of a man named Ibi A'a, probably of 12th dynasty date. So what Ailing's trying to do is, is say, look, you, know, you have the name Ramses show up a few times earlier than the 20th or the 19th dynasty. And this is what he's trying to do. So, so he's going to take that and say, when we see the name Ramses here in Exodus 111, we don't necessarily have to conclude that this text has the 19th dynasty period in mind. That's the late date for the Exodus. The early daters want it 200 years earlier. And so they're trying to create sort of a, a, an argument by analogy that maybe somewhere in the, in, in the, in the time period that, that we need for the early date, you know, in the 18th dynasty somewhere, maybe there were other people called Ramses there because we've got Ramses's earlier in Egyptian history. This is, this is what the argument that's being made. Now, Ailing admits, though, and he's citing an article by Alan Gardner, again, that the Delta residents of the Ramesides. He says, Gardner, in 1918, published a thorough study on the Delta residence of the Ramesside kings, per Ramses. Again, in Egyptian, it's per Ra Mas Su. While his conclusions as to the location of per Ramses must now be modified in the light of recent archaeological findings, Gardner's gathering of all known literary references to all towns bearing the name Ramses is still extremely valuable. From his list of cities, we can learn several things. It is very clear that the most important Egyptian city called Ramses, more fully per Ramses Mary Amon, translated the House of Ramses, the beloved of Amon, was named after the king, after King Ramses II, and no other person. We are forced to conclude with Gardner that the biblical city and the famous Delta capital, Per Ramses, were one and the same. Now, Redford, of course, doubts this because of the, the spelling. But Ailing, and, and surprisingly enough, Ailing is an early dater. And he's actually in you know, Patterns of Evidence, if, if you watch that. So how in the world can he say that Exodus 111 does refer to this residence? Again, again Redford doubts that. But Redford and Ailing are going to get married and have a baby here <laughs> in a moment. Um, their, their, their notions are actually going to blend and, and support each other. Now, how in the world can you have an early dater say, yep, yeah, Exodus 111 that, that refers to Ramses II. And Redford would say, yeah, you know, it might refer to Ramses II as a person, but it doesn't refer to the residence because it's even later. How, how in the world can you say these things and come out with any hope for a, an exodus that occurs 200 years prior to when Ramses lived? Well, let's see. <laughs> let's see. It's actually going to make more sense than you think. You know, how in the world does this work? Now, what, what the argument basically is, and it's actually building off, in Redford's case, on the notion that, that, that a Hebrew scribe, someone who worked on the text of Exodus, did not know Egyptian very well. Okay, but he was using a Greek text. Again, that actually helps here. In short, Ailing believes that the place name of this store city in Exodus 111 was editorially updated by a later scribe. There's solid evidence that the original place name that Exodus 111 is talking about was Avaris. Remember, I mentioned Avaris in the last episode. Avaris was the capital of the Hyksos. They were Semites. It's in the Delta. 
It's in Goshen, okay? It is right next to, archaeologists know this, it is next to Pithom. It's, it's next to some of the other names associated with the Exodus itinerary. Avaris was the capital. So what Alien is hypothesizing is if Moses would, or somebody else you know, would have written this text at the time of the event, Exodus 111 would have said they built the store cities of Pithom and Avaris. But a later scribe, after, the, after Avaris's name was changed, the Egyptians changed the name to Ramses, Ramses, okay, when Ramses II came to the throne. A later Hebrew scribe, knowing this, knowing that this as a historical fact, later went back to the text and stuck the term Ramses in there so that his readers would know what in the world are we talking about? What place are we talking about? Now, this happens in the Bible in other places very clearly. And the Bible actually gives you the name before and after. Luz and Bethel are kind of the, you know, the, sort of the, the it's kind of the textbook example of this. This does happen in, the, in the, the, the text of the Hebrew Bible. And the Hebrew Bible actually notes it. Before the city was named this, it was named that. It actually, actually tell you. We don't have that here, but the, the sort of the, the exercise, the act would be the same. So that is how Ailing, as an early dater, copes with not only this reference in Exodus 111, but the Exodus 47:11. You had a scribe living later go back and insert the name Ramses so that his readers would know what these, where these places are, what, what they're talking about. So if that's correct, and again, that's reasonable. I don't know that it's correct, but it is reasonable. The place name Ramses is not a lethal obstacle to an early date for the Exodus, if that's correct. Editorial updating would also explain the fact that per Aa was used only of an individual from the 19th dynasty after, because the same scribe who's updating the place name would have known that Pharaoh, par o in Hebrew, per a'a in Egyptian. Oh, now that term is used of an individual. So it's okay if I use this term now of, of one person as opposed to a district or an administration. It also explains that. By the time of the updating, this term had long been used of a person. So it'd be normal to use it that way at the time of the scribal updating activity. Now, we've seen to this point, Exodus 111 is not a death blow by any means to the early date. I want to switch gears now and say, look, we've got to deal. If you're a late dater, you have a problem to deal with here. And I hinted at it at the beginning of the episode. Here's the problem. And I, I think it's a, it's a fairly serious blow to, to the late data, dater. You, you have to explain what, what your method is here. If you believe, as late daters do, that Ramses in, first, or in Exodus 111 refers to the pharaoh, Ramses II, and his residence, and or his residence. Okay, his residence got the name there. If you, if you believe that Ramses there fixes, anchors the story okay, of the, the bondage and then the Exodus in the 19th dynasty, if you believe that, that Ramses refers to a person there, then why don't you say the same thing in Genesis 47.11? Okay, here's Genesis 47, 11. Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land or district, you could translate it, of Ramses, Ramses. It's spelled the same way as Pharaoh had commanded. You have an inconsistent methodology. You're saying it refers to a person in Exodus 1, 11, but you can't say it refers to a person in Genesis 47, 11 because there weren't any Ramesides 400 years earlier. You have a problem. And it's one of method. You can't just arbitrarily say, here it refers to a person, here it doesn't. I'm good to go. It's inconsistent is the point. Now, if you say, well, it was updated editorially in Genesis 47, 11, then why don't you say that in Exodus 1, 11? Well, I'll tell you why. Because that destroys, it undermines your late date position. I, mean, I don't really care one way or the other. I'm just saying you should be consistent with the way you handle the data. Both views, early and late, can work with the data. Each view has to sort of massage things and frame the data in a certain way. They both have problems. But what I'm saying is, is I think the late date, and, and honestly, if somebody knows of a source or an article or something that discusses this methodological problem, I'd love to see it. It's not in Hofmeyer. It's not in Kitchen. It's not, it's not in, in, in the typical go-to resources of why we take it one way in this verse and another way in another verse. You have to, if you're going to take them both as a person, you actually have to, as a late dater, make an early date kind of argument in Genesis 47, 11. Well, there, it doesn't refer to a person. It, 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 I mean, there, it, it can refer to somebody who's not a pharaoh that's Ramses. That's exactly what early daters say about Ramses when they're plucking out these five or six examples, like Ailing does, of people named Ramses. So now you have the district of Ramses in Genesis 40, 11, 47, 11, named for somebody else other than the Pharaoh. Okay, I guess you can do that. You have to do that to disconnect it from the Ramesside dynasty, which is 400 years later. But that's precisely the argument made, the approach taken by the early dater. So the least you can do is not make fun of the early dater you know, for, for the way they approach this problem. You're in the same boat, fella. You really are, because you can't have them both be Pharaohs. So you've got a methodological problem. So I, again, I, I wouldn't say this is a death blow to the late date any more than I would say the, how the early daters talk about the names is a death blow to that view. I'm saying it's a serious problem and you will not see this discussed you know, in, in any detail. You know, I've got a source, I'd love to see it. Um, it's just something I think that kind of gets overlooked. Now let's go, before uh, as we wrap up here, to Roll, David Roll, you know, Patterns of Evidence, the guy that's featured in Patterns of Evidence. It's not his movie, it's Patrick Mah- Mahoney's movie. Uh, I've said in the intro, I, I like the film. I think the visuals are great. It, it, I think there are issues of chronology that might suggest we need to rethink Egyptian chronology, in the, in, specifically in the Third Intermediate Period, that might allow for a compression of Egyptian chronology that helps align certain texts, not necessarily individuals, certain texts in e- from Egypt with biblical texts. Okay, so I'm, I'm on the record as saying I wish that this would get serious attention and not dismissed. But you're going to find out here in the next few minutes why it is dismissed. I said in this episode, Roll is going to be on the early dater side of the discussion of Exodus 111 because he cannot tolerate an Exodus occurring under the time, under the reign of Ramses II. 
Why is going to sound kind of crazy. Okay, Roll cannot tolerate that because he believes, he postulates, let's, let's be fair here, he postulates that Ramses II is the biblical Shishak who reigned after Solomon. Let me repeat that. Roll postulates that Ramses II is the biblical Shishak, the, the Egyptian pharaoh that invades Judah. He believes Ramses II is actually Shishak, and Shishak, we know from the Bible, reigned after Solomon. A Solomon, his fourth year, was 480 years after the Exodus. So you can see why Roll doesn't want Ramses II to be the pharaoh of the Exodus. But how in the world can you move Ramses II all the way down to after Solomon? Specifically, uh, Roll has, Roll's revised chronology has Ramses II's year one, his first year reign, as the 37th year of Solomon. Now his, <laughs> I was going to say his art. There, there are lots of ways. What, what Roll does is, see, what, what you're led to believe, let me start it this way. Let me get into it this way. What you're led to believe in patterns of evidence is that, oh, we just need this slight 200-year compression and then everything works beautifully. And I said uh, you know, in the introduction, nobody ever gets into the question in that movie of, well, what's the basis for doing that? And, and what you're showing in the movie is, well, this guy, David Roll, doesn't really like, you know, the, he says there's problems with the chronology. So yeah, I guess we can compress it 200 years. What they don't tell you is this other stuff that Roll believes. Roll has a whole system, a whole revised chronology. Again, part of it says that Ramses II came after Solomon. Nobody in biblical studies, nobody in Egyptology is going to swallow that pill. There are, there are quite a number of obstacles to it. Now, Roll, again, has this worked out in his head and on paper. You know, he, he, he makes his case. One of his points of evidence is that Ramses was referred to as Sesi or Shesi by close family members. And he finds a text or two that, that has that. So Roll says, well, Sheshi or Sesi sounds like Shishak. And so he, he uses that to unite those two figures because other things he does in the chronology force him to do that. And he has this whole system worked out. But again, you're not told any of this. This is, this is to call this radical is dramatically understated. Again, for lack of a better term, this is, this is a radical shift in Egyptian dynastic chronology forward 300 years from where it is presently, which pulls the middle. You know, imagine that timeline you see in patterns of evidence. If you shift Egypt's chronology, not, not the Bible's, but Egypt's chronology forward 300 years, yeah, if you're looking in the back, if you're look, looking at the back of the garage there, you see the Middle Kingdom inch its way up to the time of the Exodus. And then you have all these Middle Egyptian, you know, Middle Kingdom texts that seem to describe plagues and, and other stuff from Exodus 1. They, they all, now they're in the right category. They're in the right time frame. Yeah, they are. But now you've got Ramses living after Solomon. Oops. <laughs> I mean, when you move time, when you move chronologies, Everything moves. So this is why I say, look, I, I wish that people would take a look at certain things that Roll says. I think, I think that there could be fruitful discussion about some of the real problems in Egyptian chronology and how they affect the way that we look at scripture. But nobody's going to do it because the system, if you just look at what Roll lays out, looks so crazy to Egyptologists and biblical scholars. They look at it and just shrug their shoulders and say, this is a waste of my time. This is just nutty. So what I wish would happen is that they would just look at isolated points that Roll brings up again, that might help in certain ways, fix certain problems. But if you're thinking that patterns of evidence cures the Exodus problem, okay, you got a cure now, and now you got like another disease going on over here. You, if Roll, if Roll knows, knows what he's doing in terms of, of what this means. Roll knows that if I shift everything here, everything has to shift. And so what he does is he, now he's in search of ways to align the figures that have shifted together. He, how can I align Ramses with, with Shishak? How can I align this guy with that guy in this place, with this place, in this battle, with that battle? He has to align everything. He, he has to come up with ways to tie all things together. And his arguments are tenuous. They are circumstantial. Okay, you got a couple texts where somebody in Ramses, maybe his girlfriend or something, called him Sheshi. That doesn't mean he's Shishak. Okay, you know, this is the kind of argument that you get. If he is Shishak, then there are other things about Ramses' reign, which is highly documented, and the biblical story that have to also align. It's not just a nickname. It's so much more. So again, I don't want to like burst anybody's bubble about this film. I feel positively predisposed to the film. I've seen it. I've talked to Tim Mahoney. He's a good guy. He's sincere. You know, nobody's like trying to pull anything here, but, but you're not being given the wider picture. You, know, you can't just reference this movie and say, we're done. Cross that problem off my list. I'm doing apologetics. No, you're actually not. You're actually doing a poor job of defending something that might be true, the early date. And when you awaken to that, is that going to damage you or the people that you've been talking to? That's more of an issue. So again, I know chronology can be boring. You know, Trey says, you know, this tickles my fancy. Again, I, my confession is I used to be a chronology nerd. It's, it's almost like an AA confession. Hi, my name's Mike, and I used to do biblical chronology. Okay? I used to be that guy. And it is interesting. But at the end of the day, what you have is a pile of speculations. You have a pile of things that might look nice, but if you're honest, it's a house of cards. And, and that doesn't just go for, for role. It goes for, for lots of work in ancient chronology. It, it, by definition, must be subject to revision all over the place. And so I, I, I'm critical of people who are against role that say there's nothing to think about here. There is stuff to think about here. You know, don't let roll, you know, like deter you from this or help or, or be an excuse to not see this. There is stuff to think about here. But I'm just, you know, as, as again, critical of, of those who think, well, man, I got, I got a big howitzer now in my apologetics belt. It's called patterns of evidence. No, you don't. You don't. It's so much more complicated. Uh, it's, it's literally a case where you have, you have, again, lots of evangelicals running around here on this subject that literally don't know what they don't know. 
You say, well, Mike, you seem to live in that town. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. That's why, Trey, maybe that's why I have pugs. You know, they just, they just comfort me at the end of the day where I look at all this and say, this is just an inextricable, unsolvable mess. <laughs> but now I'm going to pet Maury you know, and Norman, and I feel, I'll feel better. That's kind of where you know, we, we end up with this. So that's our first foray into the problems, the issues of biblical chronology. We're going to have other ones as we go through this book. Uh, but again, hope, hopefully this doesn't like kill your appetite. Hopefully it whets your appetite a little bit. But again, you realize how difficult and tenuous a lot of this stuff can be. So Ramses II is not Ramses. Ra- Ramses II, the, 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 the king of the 19th dynasty, the Ramesside dynasty. You cannot conclude that Exodus 1.11 refers directly to him and his reign in real time. Okay, it could be an insertion, an editorial change by a later scribe, just so that you would know geographically where this stuff is happening. It's not a chronological linchpin. It might be a geographical you know, linchpin, a geographical point of orient- orientation, but it is not a chronological one. Gotcha. Commenting on some previous content. I got a question or an email a comment from Chris, uh, who's an archaeologist and a specialist in historical geography of the Bible at Bar Ilan University in Israel. And he wrote me and he, he said, uh, just basically, I'm not going to go through the whole email, but he said, I, I've heard Hoffmeyer, Jim Hoffmeyer from Wheaton, who's an Egyptologist, and of course, has the, the very useful book, Israel in Egypt, the evidence of the, for the authenticity of the Exodus tradition, uh, which I've referenced in the earlier episodes a bit. Uh, Chris says, I've heard Hoffmeyer talk about the textual updating idea of Chuck Ayling. For those who uh, have listened to the first two episodes of chapter one, you know what we're talking about here. And Hoffmeyer, he said, uh, counters that it is problematic for Avaris to have been updated to Ramses or Ramses when Ramses was only a major Egyptian town until the 20th dynasty. A late updating during the presumed editorial activity for the Pentateuch, which is the exile shortly a- thereafter, would be centuries later, centuries after the 20th dynasty. And so Chris says it wouldn't mean anything to later Israelites who would not be aware of a city named Ramses or Ramses. In Psalm 78, again, we have a reference to Zoan, which is, which is actually a later name of the same place, or at least the same region that we're talking about here. So he says, in other words, if Ailing's editorial activity is coherent, again, a scribe would have updated the name from Avaris to Zoan, not Ramses. Now, a couple comments here. That, that, of course, is coherent, you know, as it's stated, but there are two possible responses to it. Again, just so that you get the idea that, that Chris is raising here, if, if it's true, that the place, you know, we're talking about these two store, store cities in Exodus 111, Pithom and Ramses, Ramses to be more, for more precise. And we talked during our chronology episode that, you know, the early daters get, you know, address this or get around it by proposing that Ramses as a name is an editorial updating, again, when the, when the Pentateuch was edited and updated. And there are other examples of this. Bethel, Luz is a good example, um, very transparent in scripture. And so they, they postulate this, this kind of thing happened. And so Ramses in Exodus 111 does not force a late date for the Exodus, something in the 1200s. Of course, the early date is the one that takes First Kings 6-1, literally, and that's the mid-1400s BC. So the fact that Ramses is in there and his time period is in the 1200s BC, that doesn't force us to, to say the Exodus was dated to that time. Ramses could have just wound up in the text because of this editorial updating during the exile or shortly thereafter. The 500s, we'll call it, BC. And, and Chris's point is that, well, that wouldn't make sense because if they were updating the text then, they would have used Zoan instead of Ramses. So again, there are a couple possible responses to this. You know, and Redford's article that we talked about when we discussed Exodus 111 notes this on page 402. The presumed editor could still, you could still have an, edit, an editor in the, the 500s BC still inserting or using Ramses deliberately to give the story an archaic flavor. Now, to some listening, that would just seem like fictionalizing something or, or you know, a little, playing a little too fast and loose with, loose with the editorial idea uh, that the writer knows that, well, the city's called Zoan now, but we're going to call it Ramses, you know, to take, you know, to, to, to sort of get back to the original antiquity, you know, of the Exodus event and, and, and preserve that then. Again, that, that might sound like fictionalizing. The problem with sort of looking at it that way, this possibility is books like Job. I mean, Job has a, a mix. Everybody, you know, all scholars who study Job know this. It has a mix of late Hebrew features and early, not only a few early Hebrew features or earlier Hebrew features, but the book itself is set in a patriarchal setting. So you, you could have a, a writer writing late, again, 500 BC, and putting things into the story to you know, give it an archaic flavor. Of course, the problem with that is that people would say, well, Job can get away with that because it's wisdom literature. Exodus is, again, is, is his, historical, and so that we feel less comfortable there. Uh, again, I understand that, but go back to our very first episode when we jumped into the book of Exodus. We asked questions like, well, how much precision do we need to be precise or to call something history? I mean, ancient books, ancient writers do do this sort of thing. And even though we wouldn't do it the way we write history now, they did do this sort of thing. So the fact that they do it doesn't rule out historicity. I mean, in Job's case, there really could have been a person named Job, you know, who suffered and so on and so forth. And then you know, his reason for suffering gets you know, theological dimensions because, you know, how the book begins and theologizing his suffering. So it doesn't rule out uh, Job's historicity. Um, and that's just the way the book is crafted. In other words, the ancient person wouldn't have read that and concluded just out of the gate, well, there was never really somebody named Job. And we know this is just sort of an allegory. A lot of people would have thought there was a person named Job, and then they're getting a behind the scenes look, you know, in the spiritual world about why this guy is suffering when he's righteous. So the fact that this can happen doesn't rule out historicity. So that, that's the first approach, you know, that the writers could still have used Ramses and, you know, to give it an archaic flavor. Second is the longer one. Uh, Redford, of course, again, we referenced his article on Exodus 111. Redford, you know, listeners should know by this point, doesn't buy uh, Hoffmeyer's argument that since Ramses was only a major town until the 20th dynasty, the editorial updating must have been at the time of Ramses or shortly thereafter, you know, like 12th, 11th century BC. Redford doesn't buy it because he questions whether the name itself refers to the town specifically, as opposed to merely associating the store cities with Ramses, the person. 
and Redford Marshall's evidence for the imprecision of equating the name with the actual city or residence. Uh, he, he actually you know, says in a different article, this is actually Redford in Anchor Bible Dictionary, he says this, it's important since Zoan became the official pharaonic residence replacing the old Ramesside capital P at Rameses. And then again, he's going to go on in what he writes to distinguish the sort of the, the place regionally and, and the person Ramses from the actual residence, you know, the, the, the town and then the resident within, residence within the town. So Redford doesn't view all these things as sort of a whole. He, he divides up the parts and then he asks the question, you know, does the name really, is it really about the city, the place? Again, that Hoffmeyer would say, well, it is about the city. It was only you know, the royal residence there until the 20th dynasty. So Redford sort of out of the gate, it just looks at it, approaches it from a different trajectory. He asks, again, Redford asks in his, in his article on Exodus 111, is the name Ramses in Exodus 111 to be equated with Ramses the second's capital, again, the specific site? He doesn't think so. Again, we noted that in the earlier episode, and Redford goes on. Here's one of his arguments. Is it not strange that if the two Egyptian toponyms, place names, were borrowed around 1200 BC by the Hebrews, that the element per in per ra mesu, that's the Egyptian spelling for that one, and per atom uh, for, the, for pithom. He says, doesn't it seem strange that the two Egyptian toponyms were borrowed? If they were borrowed, the element per should be retained in per atom, which is pithom, but suppressed or done away with in per ra mesu. You don't, you don't get pith ram, ramses, you just get ramses. You don't get any, any of that first syllable is gone. So Redford thinks, again, that's just strange. Why keep it with one and not the other? And this is what prompts him to argue that the Hebrew spelling without that per element actually is the result of getting the place name or the name, you know, the name of the person, from Greek material, which is very late. Again, so th- this is the, the logic that Redford uh, uses. Um, something I didn't get into the, in, into in the last you know, episode or the episode we did on chronology, Redford continues. He says, this idea, the idea of very late updating, agrees you know, with other things. Specifically, it agrees with the fact that from the Saite period, well on into Roman times, there was a flourishing city called Pithom in the northeastern delta, while there is no evidence that prior to the Saites, which are very late, there's no evidence prior to them that a city named Pithom ever existed in Egypt. Now, that creates a problem because when you read Exodus 111, we're talking about the store cities of Pithom and Ramses. So Redford's going to say, look, just, just the fact that historically, we don't get a city known as Pithom until very late, he says that bolsters you know, his argument about what to do with Ramses, again, very late editorial kind of activity. So you know, Redford is going to object you know, to this, and, and you know, we really get down to the question of how do we get Pithom as a, as a store city? And how can we reconcile that with all, all that we've just said about Ramsey? So I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, but you know, for Chris, and this is, again, this is kind of geek, geeking out here a little bit. I wish that Hoffmeyer had dealt you know, with some of the contentions of Redford. He deals with somebody, leaves some out. Uh, Hoffmeyer does cite um, the work of a couple other scholars who object to Redford's idea that Ramses did not refer to the capital itself. Uh, that's true. With respect to both the name Ramses, Hoffmeyer objects, rightly in my mind, um, as something we're going to talk about today. Maybe we'll get into this. Um, he objects, Hoffmeyer objects to Redford's argument that ra mes su is different than Ramses because of the spelling. And there's really two elements to Redford's argument there. One is the S, the S letter is different in Egyptian and Hebrew. And also there's a whole other syllable that's missing, ra am sees, as opposed to ra mes su. There's that ah syllable that's missing. The S syllable talk isn't really that important. So I agree with Hoffmeyer that that's not much of an argument, but the missing syllable Hoffmeyer never addresses. And that's important to what Redford is saying. So again, Redford just approaches this from a different perspective. And you can say, well, where does this leave us? Well, as always, with not being able to prove either date by means of Exodus 111. That's just the way it is. You can go back and forth with all these detailed arguments, you know. But to be fair, you know, the late date isn't undone by the editorial updating issue. Uh, it just, you know, you can you can argue to your blue in the face about minutia like letters and syllables in names and whether the S sound in Egyptian. Egyptian has more than one S sound and Hebrew has two. Uh, you know, sibilance in linguistic talk. You know, Egyptian actually has several, actually has more than two. Hebrew has two. So but the fact that, you know, they're inconsistently used when a place name goes from one language to the other and from that other language back to Egyptian. You know, what do we do with that stuff? But that's the level of argumentation you get on this verse, Exodus 111, within the bigger debate of the date of the Exodus. I mean, it's so granular. It's so detailed. And this is why, again, we're going to move on to what we're covering today, but this is why I hope this sort of mind-numbing stuff illustrates something that you should be suspicious when you read something on the internet or something that's not peer-reviewed material, claiming to solve the, the date of the Exodus or claiming to you know, locate a specific biblical site with you know, this particular thing over here. And, oh, you know, this is so obvious. You know, all we got to do is visit there. All we got to do is look at this. All we got to do is think this thought and the problem solved. No, it is these debates are centuries old for a reason, actually for many reasons. It gets very granular, very detailed in terms of linguistic evidence, archaeological evidence. Arguments hinge. They move one way or the other based on, on minutia. And if you're reading something that has not considered the minutia and interacted with peer-reviewed material that does interact with the minutia, feel free to dismiss it. Okay, It is just not up to snuff. Uh, if you're going to be serious about you know, the research, you must interact with the minutia. Otherwise, you're going to overlook something and make fallacious arguments. So let's just take the, again, the granular level of the detail here as kind of a learning tool about how biblical studies is done and that we should not just, you know, all commentary about a subject is not equal. It just isn't. People with a high degree of expertise have considered all the things that need to be considered over and over and over again, and they've interacted with other people just like them. So when you get re- researchers and writers who don't do any of that work, aren't even really aware of that work, don't, don't, uh, you know, don't just adopt what they say. Realize that there are reasons why these debates have persisted. It's not just, it's not easy. It just isn't. So today we're in Exodus 2, 1 through 10. I'm going to read the passage and we're going to get into sort of a, a big item and then a smaller item. 
uh, in the episode today, but we want to start off by reading the actual passage. And we're going to go through the first 10 verses. And it's very, there's a lot to consider here. There's just, again, it's Exodus. There's just so many things going on here. And you know, some, some things that might appear a bit obvious. You know, hey, I, I want to drill down on that. I'm curious about this thing that I can, I can see clearly. And then there are other things that are sort of lurking in the background that you may or may not be aware of that are really crucial against the way academics, the way scholars think about uh, Exodus 2, 1 through 10. So reading from ESV, we read this. Now, a man from the house of Levi or Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister, the child's sister, said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. Again, this is a very familiar story. I think the basic elements of this are frankly pretty obvious. So, you know, we're not terribly concerned uh, about sort of retelling the story and and doing, you know, kind of a a sermon, you know, some some sort of sermonic material on what I want to drill down on are two things. Again, one of them is kind of obvious, the other's not. We're going to do the, the non-obvious first because it's the longest and, and it's probably the most challenging. And then in, at the end, you know, the second part, we'll do that. Then the second one, the one that's sort of easier is what about the name Moses? You know, does, does that, how does that work with Egyptian? You know, does, it, does it make sense? And that's something that always comes up. You, know, you read books about Exodus or the Old Testament, Israel and Egypt, and you get that sort of discussion. Depending on what kind of books, though, you're, you're reading, if you have studied Exodus on your own, you may or may not hit the first topic we're going to consider the big one. And that is, there's a, a genre, a literary issue here. Specifically, there are two aspects to this. When I say a literary or a genre issue, there are a lot of other stories, a lot of them, that feature an abandoned child or an abandoned hero uh, who, in some, in, in some instances, are, the circumstances are very similar to what you read in Exodus 2. And then this abandoned child you know, grows up and does great things. Now, there are a lot of these stories. I'm going to reference yet another article by Redford. Again, Redford is an Egyptologist, so he's taken an interest in Egyptian stuff in the book of Exodus. That's why we're referring to you know, his material more than once. But there's one specific story that has the closest parallels to Exodus 2.10. And I'm going to give you the title of that story now, and we'll get into it as we proceed here. But that is the Sargon birth legend. Now, if you're doing your research on the internet, you're going to read things like the writer of Exodus copied the Sargon birth legend to create the story of Moses in Exodus 2. Again, I think that's drastically overstated, but that's what you get on the internet. But we need to get into the subject, and I think you'll see you know, why uh, pretty quickly. So I'm going to be referencing, uh, when, when I say Redford's article on the exposed child or the abandoned child, the article I'm referring to is, again, by Donald Redford. It's, it's entitled, The Literary Motif of the Exposed Child, Exodus 2, 1 through 10. And this is from the scholarly journal Newman, that's N-U-M-E-N. Volume 14, number three, it was written in 1967, uh, pages 209 to 228. Now, what Redford does in this is he marshals all of the similar stories uh, that that in some way feature a child, a baby, that is abandoned or put under threat, you know, basically disposed of in some way, and, you know, collects those and then makes some comparative comments uh, in relationship to uh, Exodus as part of the article. The entire article doesn't focus on the comparison. What he does is he groups the stories into sort of three categories. And his three themes or his three thematic categories are, number one, you have stories where the child is exposed through shame at some circumstance of birth, like maybe the child's illegitimate, maybe the child has a deformity, uh, maybe the child is, is you know, a quote-unquote you know, hybrid. In other words, the offspring of, of, of a god coming down and copulating with a woman or raping a woman. You know, there's, like, there are some Greek stories like that. So the child is a product of a rape, you know, that, that sort of thing. So that's the first kind of theme, the thematic you know, element of, of his three. Now, Redford provides 14 examples, two of which have a box or container being put into water. You know, the, the, the baby of the child is put into this container and put into the water as an element. Uh, and the, but the, the stories in this category, this isn't actually where Redford puts the, uh, the, the Moses story, because the other features of the stories in this category are honestly pretty bizarre. You've got the infant being suckled by a bear or a wolf or a cow you know, to keep it alive. Uh, you, you've got other really just truly bizarre sorts of elements, but you know, two of them, at least two of the 14, have this box or container in, in water. That, that was the method of disposal of the child. And I hope you're catching that I'm saying disposal, because that is going to be a point of disconnect with the Exodus story. The, the mother of Moses in the Exodus 2 story isn't trying to just dispose of him. There's no shame here. Again, this is, again, part of why Redford does not include the Exodus story in this first category. But again, you'll see on the internet some of these examples that are plucked out. And one of them is the Sargon birth legend. Uh, Sargon is is an illegitimate child. So that's a big disconnect with what's going on in the book of Exodus, just out of the gate. So much so that, again, Redford, and Redford's not an evangelical Christian. He's got no Christian or inspiration axe to grind. He he just doesn't see the similarity here with with the Sargon birth legend. But that's sort of the go-to analogy on the internet and in other popular resources for the origin of the Moses story. But again, here we have a good example of Redford saying, oh, not really. There's just too much that's different here. Now, the second category is that someone in power wants the child dead. 
And Redford provides 13 examples here, three of which, again, have this container or the water threat. Now, this one, I mean, you know, this one applies you know, to Exodus 2 because the, the, the baby, Moses, is under threat. You know, his, his life is at stake here because of the uh, you know, killing off the male children that we've talked about before. So this, this category fits. And again, you have three examples where you've got you know, the container and the water. But Redford opts for category three to, to sort of, this, this is his best, in his view, the, the best you know, analogy, uh, or at least the, the right category for Exodus 2. And that is there's a general massacre going on that endangers the child. And Redford gives us five examples of, of the abandoned child uh, motif that include this element. And so this really speaks to him uh, as being the, the closest sort of circumstance to the Moses story. And so this is where he'll actually list the Moses story in his article. Interestingly enough, he also puts the Jesus story in this one. You remember when Jesus it was taken to Egypt to flee you know, Herod? Herod you know, wants all the boys from two years old and under to, to die. So Redford, again, interestingly enough, puts Jesus, the Jesus story in the same category. And that gives us a total of 32 s- stories with at least some similarity. And you've got again, five or six, you just call it half dozen, that have this container and water thing going on, which is, again, a big part of the Exodus 2 story. But of the 32, we should also mention that fewer than half of them involve mere human children. That means more, you know, more than half of these stories concerns a child fathered illegitimately by a divine being or a rape. And Mo- the Moses story clearly does not fit that. So, you know, right away, we've got, that raises a question mark over the idea. Well, did the biblical writer, like, know a bunch of these stories and then want to pattern his story deliberately after them? Well, a lot of them, if he was doing that, why not have like an angel coming and saying, hey, you're going to have a kid. His name's going to be Moses and this and that's going to happen. You kind of like the Jesus story, okay? Why don't we have some sort of divine appearance or input or something going on? You know, like, like, like with Samson. Uh, Samson isn't part of this, this discussion here, but you know, the angel of the Lord shows up and sa- announces to Samson's parents they're going to have a child. You know, it's just something like that. We don't get that in Exodus 2. So it's a significant disconnect. There's, there's no reason to conclude Moses is anything else but a normal human baby. So over half the examples, again, have a significant disconnection with what's going on in Exodus 2. Now, Redford, again, is obviously well aware of this, and we know where he puts it. He puts it in the third category. And he knows that other scholars have tried to argue that Exodus 2 you know, is an adaptation of this or that specific story. Uh, since he's an Egyptologist, he spends a lot of time in this article discussing the birth of Horus. And, and you know, again, he devotes a good bit of attention to, you know, as an Egyptologist, why the birth of Horus doesn't really provide a good literary analogy, does not, again, provide a good literary analogy with the Exodus 2 story. And he's also going to reject you know, the Sargon story, but we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, Redford goes through the birth story of Horus, and he rejects, again, the alleged Egyptian antecedents to the Moses story as a, as a source parallel. Specifically, he notes that the parallels to the birth of Horus, there is a, a craft, a little, little boat or whatever, of papyrus made of reeds. Uh, the child is hidden in a marsh. There's a villain bent on the death of the child. He, he notes those elements are there. But he points out that those elements of the Horus you know, birth story come from a very late you know, set of texts, very late versions from the Greco-Roman period. And so Redford actually argues that the writers of, of the Horus you know, myth were very likely familiar with the Moses story. And it could have you know, been fertilized the other way around. I mean, Redford is pretty transparent about that you know, with the chronology of the text. And so for those listening, I wanted to mention that uh, because, you know, again, there's a lot of internet stuff, zeitgeist. You know, zeitgeist is typically trying to say, you know, Jesus is Horus or whatever. But you're, you're going to run into, into this as well, you know, with the Moses story. Ah, it's just taken from the Horus story. And Moses is like a, you know, archetypal for Jesus. And so that's why Jesus, you know, gets to be a you know, rehash of Horus. It, it breaks down. And you even have Egyptologists that just say, well, if we're honest here, the material is really late. And so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, uh, you know, again, as it pertains to, to our subject here in Exodus 2. Now, where we want to camp, though, is really the, uh, the Sargon verse story. So I'm going to get, read you a summary of the elements here from Redford's article. Uh, and specifically, this article of Redford is the one about the abandoned child motif. And so on page 214 in Redford's first category, he lists uh, the Sargon story. And it goes like this, just a little paragraph. He says, Sargon is born in secret into a family, which has apparently been at home in upland country. His birthplace, however, is a city on the Euphrates, where his mother puts him in a reed ark and casts it upon the river. Found by a drawer of water, Sargon is brought up as his son. Although no reason is given for the secrecy of the birth, it is clear that it was interdicted by someone. Sargon was probably not the object of a jealous king's search, but simply the bastard offspring of a woman whose station in life condemned her to childlessness. Then he has a footnote where he discusses that. But for our purposes here, there's, there's this thing out there in Akkadian literature, Akkadian and Assyrian Mesopotamian literature, called the Sargon birth legend. And it has these elements. Sargon, little baby, you know, put into a reed box or ark, little boat made of reeds, cast into the river, found by somebody coming down to draw water. And then Sargon you know, grows up to be this great king. This, you know, the Sargon the Great. And this is centuries, you know, Sargon, at least, Sargon the Great. That person lived centuries before you know, the Israelites were in Egypt, centuries before Moses. Now, the question is, though, how old are the texts? You know, we're going to get into that because the, the person that we know from Mesopotamian history, is that, that's one thing. But then what's written about that person is quite another. When, when you run into these texts, not just Mesopotamian texts, but Egyptian and biblical texts, I mean, you have to ask yourself, well, is the writing contemporaneous with the person that we're, we're reading about? You know, we, we, we talked about Job a few minutes ago. You know, Job is set in the patriarchal era, but, but again, by virtue of the language used throughout the book, it's, it's much later. Uh, we, we have you know, the, these sorts of situations where the biblical content is written centuries after the fact of what's being described. And that, that's normal. Again, it, it, it's, it's ubiquitous, actually, in antiquity. There's nothing unusual about that. So again, just a heads up, that when we talk about Sargon the person living at a certain specific time well before Moses, that's different than talking about the literary uh, text or texts from which we get the Sargon birth story. Okay? They're, they're not contemporaneous in, in terms of the time. Now, the elements, again, are kind of obvious. 
and this has become sort of a big topic of discussion you know, in, in popular biblical studies. And I use the internet for an, an example where you get some good stuff and you get some really ridiculous stuff too. There's a dissertation on this subject that is fairly old. It's done in 1976. And it's by a guy named Brian Lewis. It's called The Legend of Sargon, A Study of the Akkadian Text and the Tale of the Hero Who Was Exposed at Birth. The dissertation was done at NYU, New York University, again, 1976. And this is the most detailed study of the Sargon birth legend. It goes through just every aspect of this. And on pages 182 to 184, Lewis writes a few things that I think are really worth pointing out, worth quoting, that sort of gets us into that. So the question before us is, okay, the, the Exodus 2 story is very similar to a bunch of these abandoned child stories, but you know, a lot of them can sort of be winnowed out by you know, one, or, one or more factors. And the one that everybody seems to zero in on is this, this one about Sargon, because the elements are close. You know, we, we have you know, text to this effect. Uh, Redford, again, is, is weeding out the Horus story because the text, textual material is so late. It just, it's, it's basically so late, it's irrelevant. So what we're really left with as, as sort of the primary point of, of attention is this, this Sargon story. So that's why we're going to spend some time on it. So we're going to go through some thoughts that Lewis and his dissertation shared and then just you know, think ourselves about, well, what, what do we do with this? So Lewis writes, in considering the problem of determining the date of composition, you know, when this le- the Sargon legend was written, you know, when we're considering that problem, one is faced with a long period during which the genre to which the text belongs was alive, and little, if any, obvious internal criteria with which to fix a date. Okay? So right away, Lewis is, is admitting, again, this is the most detailed study of the Sargon legend in, in, in the Akkadian, in the, in the original texts that we have. He's like, basically, we, don't, we can't fix a date. <laughs> he continues and says, it may in fact be impossible to establish with any certainty the origins of the Sargon legend based on the available evidence. The text lacks any obvious grammatical, lexicographical, or philological feature, which would allow a precise dating. Unfortunately, aside from its possible mention in two inventories of texts from Kujunjik, which is again a location in Mesopotamia, there are no known references to the Sargon legend in all of cuneiform literature. The copies whose fragments we possess are relatively late. Three fragments belonging to the Kujunjik collection are written in Neo-Assyrian script, and a fourth fragment written in Neo-Babylonian is probably even later. Let me stop there. Neo-Assyrian is going to be 900, 800, 700 BC. Okay, it is not, you know, if Sargon goes back to the 24th, 23rd centuries BC, you're dealing with well over a thousand, a thousand and a half years later is what the text dates to. So again, the person that Sargon the Great, you, know, you, you, can, you can fix a date based on cuneiform literature, you know, Sumerian, Mesopotamian literature, you know, old Babylonian stuff, old Akkadian stuff. We know when this guy lived, but this legend that's written about him is 1,500 years at least later in terms of the text we have. And if, if, you're, if you're looking at Assyrian dates, this is actually going to be after even critical scholar datings for the E material. Okay, Exodus is considered E, J-E-D-P, you know, the whole, back to the whole theory of the Pentateuch. So if you believe in Mosaic authorship, I mean, there's no question. It's either 1400 BC or 1200 BC, again, centuries earlier than the Sargon birth legend. If you, again, go with J-E-D-P, it's still a century or two earlier than the Sargon stuff, than the Assyrian period. So right away, we have a chronological problem for trying to say that the writer of Exodus 2 used the Sargon birth legend. If you're going with the text we actually have, that, that is an impossible argument to be that specific. Okay, it, it's an argument that just can't be made on the basis of data, which means if you're going to make that argument, you're making it up. You're, you're just going with it without data. Right? That's just the way it is. Now back to, to Lewis. He says, the question is, are these late copies of a text which had originated at a much earlier period? So he says, what we have is late. But the question is, are they copies of a much older text that we no longer have? And that, that's an open question. So are these late copies of a text which had originated at a much earlier period, or perhaps the remnants of a late composition which may have only been loosely based on earlier sources of some kind? Now we have seen that the use of the royal epithet Sharu Danu, strong king, in line one, is an anachronism in a text attributed to Sargon of Agad, or Agade if you want to anglicize it here, A-G-A-D-E. For the first occurrence is to be found in the eighth regnal year of Amar Sin, 2039 BC of the third dynasty of Or, and thus follows by 240 years the end of Sargon's rule. Therefore, the ascription of the title to Sargon in this work proves that the legend was written after 2039 and establishes, you know, at least you know, that much, the presence of copies in the library of Asurbanipal, who, whose dates are 668 to 627 BC, provides kind of the latest point. So you have kind of an earliest point, terminus postquam, and then you have the latest point, terminus antiquam of the mid-7th century. But all the tablets we actually have are in that Assyrian period, you know, the, the 800s, 700s, 600s BC. And what, what, what that last comment was about is, is even, even you know, some titles, you know, some, in, this, this, in this case, this one phrase. Yeah, the phrase you know, shows up in these earlier texts, but, but Lewis is saying that Assyriologists think that it's a deliberate anachronism, that, that some later writer just used it, again, to give it the appearance of age. Just like we were talking about you know, earlier with you know, Ramses. Writers do this in the ancient world. They, they, they pluck out phrases and titles and descriptive elements from texts that they know of, because they're scribes, that are much older, and they'll stick them in later texts, the ones they're actually writing. could be you know, 1,500, 2,000 years later, and they'll use the, these older lines and older words and things like that just to give it the flavor of antiquity. But in this case, there's only one of them. Again, you know, there are some other things that, that Lewis goes through, and, and the Assyriological community, those, those who are experts in cuneiform literature, recognize all these as being anachronistic. They don't help. <laughs> they, don't, they, don't, they don't move the tablet back, because if it's discovered you know, in a particular library or a particular pile of cuneiform tablets that clearly date to the Assyrian period, and the script itself, the cuneiform script itself, changes over time, even though cuneiform looks like chicken scratch, 
the chicken scratch of one era looks different than the chicken scratch of another. Again, and people who are into cuneiform understand that they can see it. They 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 create or they have typologies, you know, for all of this kind of stuff. The texts are late is the point. And the, the question of are they copies of something that was earlier? No, well, you know, we don't know. You can make that argument. So what Lewis does in his dissertation from this point on, this from about one eighty page one eighty four on, is he 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 like imagines a scenario for an early origin of the story. Again, text we don't have, but he, he imagines how this might have you know, worked, how you could make the argument. And then he is fair in his dissertation, and he imagines how you would understand how things would have worked in a late period. Now, there are two points I think that are worth you know, pointing out as well you know, before we, we leave Lewis's dissertation here. He says on page 187 that in the Sargon legend text, as far as it is preserved, there is nothing, again, of a lexical, grammatical, or orthographical, the way, you know, the, way the, the characters are written. Nothing of a lexical, grammatical, or orthographical nature that need to be early. Okay? There just aren't. There, there's nothing in there that makes the argument that the story is early. So you are, you are actually on very defensible ground to say that the Sargon birth legend is late, and for the sake of our discussion, later than the Moses story. You can make a really good argument for that. And again, Lewis lays out how to do it in his dissertation. On page 188, he says that there are three idiomatic expressions which occur in the legend of Sargon, and this is important, that are attested only, only at the end of the second millennium, which would be like 1000 BC, or in the Neo-Assyrian period, again, which is this, this late period where the tablets that we have actually come from. He says this provides the strongest evidence available that the Sargon legend was composed in its present form at a much later date than previously thought. Again, he's not writing this. I, I hate to be a little silly here, but again, because of the kind of stuff you run into on the internet, I'm going to say it this way. This guy's not writing a dissertation at a Christian school or a seminary just to reflexively defend the Bible on some point that he doesn't like. This is NYU. It's a dissertation. He's an Assyriologist. Okay, let, let that sink in. He's being honest. He's doing what good scholars should do, regardless of, of what his own personal predilections are. I mean, th- this, is, this is the data. These are the data, I should say. And, and, and this is the conclusion that is very defensible, very late for the story. But you won't hear any of that on the internet. What you're going to be shown on the internet is you're going to be shown the Sargon birth story, and then you're going to be shown the Moses story, and somebody's going to say, see, the Bible stole more material from Mesopotamia. Really? Again, if you run into somebody claiming that, maybe the Ancient Origins website, they love to do stuff like this. You have just found a person, A, with an axe to grind, and B, who isn't a scholar. Okay, It's just that simple. This is why I say primary texts are what you should focus on, the data that actually exist. And peer-reviewed scholarship, where people, they specialize in this stuff. They go through the material. And in, in, in the overwhelming number of cases, regardless of if they're a Christian or a Jew or not a Christian or an atheist, whatever, especially in dissertations, they really make an effort, you know, far and away. You know, it's, it's not everybody, but far and away, they make an effort, to be honest. And, and we have a good example here in Lewis's dissertation. And there's something else the internet won't tell you, and that is the problems of dissimilarities between the two stories, the Sargon legend and the Moses story in Exodus 2. I will, I'll offer one more, um, one more little bit from Lewis's dissertation here. He writes on page 384, so this is toward the end. For a long time, scholars had accepted the premise that the birth legends of Sargon and Moses were unusually similar in form and content. However, in recent years, and this is the 60s and 70s, work by M. Kogan, M. Greenberg, and others has challenged this assumption by stressing the different motivations for the abandonment, by asserting a closer parallel between the Moses story and an Egyptian myth concerning Horus. Of course, Redford you know, essentially debunks that with the late material. But I, I quote that, to, to, again, to say that other scholars besides Lewis, besides Redford, again, have not thought of the Sargon birth story as a really good parallel. Now, Redford doesn't like either. He doesn't like the Horus story. He doesn't like the Sargon story. But some other scholars have, have looked at the Sargon story and go, there's just too much different about it for it to have been a model. There's just too much different. And again, the textual situation is that it, you know, it's very late anyway. So it isn't just one guy. It isn't just Redford. I mean, there are other people who have noticed this and they've tried out the Egyptian story. But like I said, Redford doesn't like that either because the material is just so late. How in the world could this work? So let's go into some of the differences here. Um, there are, uh, here's the short list. There are five. We'll just give you a short list of five. And you know, Lewis you know, summarizes these. The Hebrew story, Exodus 2 in relation specifically to the Sargon story, has some significant disconnections. One, the concept of genocide as the motivating factor underlying the need to abandon the child. Okay, that is not in the Sargon story. Certainly in the Exodus story, Moses is exposed to save his life from a threat to all Hebrew male infants. That's just not part of the Sargon story. Number two, the hero, the child, is hidden for three months. Okay, that's the Exodus story, until it's no longer possible to conceal him. You don't get that in the Sargon story. The role of the sister in the Exodus story, who watches over the hero, the child, from a distance, as the representative of the mother, you don't get that. Four, the use of Pharaoh's daughter to rescue and adopt the infant, and you don't have a royal daughter. And fifth, the hiring of the natural mother to nurse the child. And here are five core elements to the Exodus 2 story that do not appear in the Sargon story. And all you have is the means to float the baby. Well, you know, look, if you lived in the Delta, the Egyptian Delta, and we know that they live there because you have, you know, the whole Pith and the Ramesses thing, Avaris, the land of Goshen, all that stuff, you know, back in Genesis, we, we know where the Hebrews were at, and it's the Delta region. So there's lots of water there, and there's lots of marshes there. If you were going to hide the child from Pharaoh's men, where would you put him? It's at least a possibility you would think, well, you know, I can't, I can't stash the kid at home because it's not like we have Ikea furniture here where we can put him somewhere and no one will ever find him. Okay? You're limited in your, in your options. If you're going to put him outside, hide him in the marsh. And you can't just throw the kid in. You've got to build something. You've got you to create something that'll float. Again, this is just sort of a normal thing. If you think, consider this a possibility, you would just do these things. And that's the only real similarity between the Exodus story and the Sargon story. All this other stuff is different and significantly different because these aren't just, these aren't just sort of throwaway elements in the story. These elements are crucial to the story because the story gives us this, this providential irony. That's a big theme in the Exodus 2 story. 
about how the, 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 little, the little baby sister goes out, you know, to watch and sees, you know, the, you know, little baby Moses taken out of the water and she's right on the spot. I mean, it, it, it's calculated, it's planned, it's ironic. And speaks to the Egyptian woman, hey, can, should we go get a nurse, a nurse the child? Sure, great idea. So, so the, the, the little girl, her sister runs and goes, get, goes and gets his mom. Again, these details are important to, again, telling and showing us how God providentially inverted and really subverted what's going on in Egypt. He uses Pharaoh's household from, from which, you know, the administration, from which the command to kill the, the male children came to save the deliverer. And these are very obvious things. They're crucial to the story. They are not throwaway elements, and none of them are in their Sargon story. Now, I'm going to go to, to Carpenter, his commentary on Exodus. He has a few things to say about this as well, and then we'll transition into our second question. You know, that, that will you know, be the conclusion of our episode here. But Carpenter writes about, the, again, just the, the comparison here. He says, this is not the case of the exposure or rejection of an unwanted infant. And again, that, that just runs through the stories, these other you know, abandoned child stories frequently. This is the purposeful and tender dedication of an infant to the sovereignty of God. The writer editor may have employed the genre form, the genre form of the Sargon legend, you know, just sort of the, you know, structurally the, you know, some of the elements here, but he has emptied it of its mythological overtones and filled it with Israelite history and theology. He has effectively changed its content and structure to fit his purposes, creating a historical narrative even antithetical to the Sargon legend to fit his purposes. It is evident that major essential differences exist between these two ancient narratives. Also, Hoffmeyer is probably correct to challenge the supposed borrowing from Mesopotamian literature, since the whole section, Egyptian or Exodus 2, verses 1 through 10, is permeated with specifically Egyptian elements. Now, the, uh, he, he quotes Hoffmeyer, or he footnotes Hoffmeyer, pages 138 to 140. Hoffmeyer lists six specific expressions, textual expressions, that are Egyptian and not Mesopotamian in origin. If you're just borrowing a Mesopotamian story, why would you do that? If you're writing either in an Egyptian context or the events that you're writing about to place in an Egyptian context, then you would, this makes sense, again, to have these Egyptian elements in it. You know, if you're just doing something you know, much later, hey, I need a good, a good story, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of steal it and adopt it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think, well, let's just throw you know, Egyptian words in there or Egyptian phrases or idioms or something. You, you wouldn't do that. You, know, you, you wouldn't do that. It, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So Hoffmeyer again, says, we, we, have to, we have to look at the Egyptian elements in here uh, to really you know, make sense of it, because the Sargon story by itself would have been perfectly serviceable if, if that's what's happening. Now, all of this suggests that the biblical writer, again, if we take all this as a whole, was not dependent on the Horus myth, certainly. Again, Redford I guess, says, points out that that material is so late. And it also suggests he was not dependent on the Sargon story either. The key word there is dependent. In both cases, the Moses story may predate the presumed source, either the Sargon source and certainly you know, the Horus stuff. It's conceivable that, that the Moses story predates both of those. And if you're looking at it that way, then you, you have to approach the whole subject a little bit differently. And we could ask, you know, well, what if the biblical writer or a later editor knew about the Sargon story? Well, let's just play what if here. I would say that doesn't rule out the coherence of Exodus 2 being an actual event. In fact, it's a perfect way. It's really a good way to frame the birth of the one who delivered Yahweh's people out of chaos. Because ultimately, Moses is going to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and through the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea in the English Bibles. Water, again, the chaos symbol. Linking it conceptually in some way to Mesopotamian material is actually a really good idea, especially if it's associated with Babylon. Now, Van der uh, who's an author of History of the Ancient Near East on page 63, says, the last centuries of the third millennium were characterized by successive periods of centralization of power under two city dynasties, one from Akkad in northern Babylonia in the 24th and 23rd centuries BC, and the other from Ur, in the far south of the 21st century, unquote. Now, Akkad is where Sargon the Great ruled. That's where he's from, and that's where he ruled. And so he is associated with Babylon by virtue of the location of, of, of the city. It's, it's, it's in North, North Babylon, North Babylonia. There would have been a telling irony. Think about it this way. There would have been a telling irony and a theological polemic. If, and we're just playing what if here, if the writer used the legend of Sargon of Akkad's birth story to tell the story of the rise of Yahweh's deliverer, really his savior figure for rescuing his people from chaos, those people, of course, had originated from Abraham, himself from Ur. And this works whether Ur is in southern Babylon, southern Babylonia, or northwest Mesopotamia. It's still Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is the reference point, again, for, for a lot of the chaos stuff we see in Genesis 1 through 11. The irony and messaging is the same. Yahweh is greater than his chaos rivals. In other words, the similarity of the birth stories would draw attention to a literate Israelite or Jew to Yahweh's defeat of chaos. In other words, if you link the birth of the deliverer in Exodus 2, if you link that to something Mesopotamian, even though you know, there's all these Egyptian elements, if you link it in some way, if, if people are reading that, and yeah, the story is set in Egypt, but yeah, this kind of sounds like that Mesopotamian dude. If that's what's happening in somebody's head, then the writer gets to compare and contrast what Yahweh is doing to save his people out of chaos. And it takes your mind back to when the chaos began and where it began, where it's rooted. Babylon, Mesopotamia. Genesis 1 through 11, I've said it many times in the podcast, it's just cluttered with Mesopotamian material for a reason. This is where it's the anti-Eden. There's so much content in Genesis 1 through 11 that responds to, that inverts, that subverts Mesopotamian stuff, okay, and tells the story, you know, of just Deuteronomy 32 worldview, Babel, just, just that one, just Genesis 11, that's the big one, but you've got Genesis 6 with the Apkalu, you've got stuff in Genesis 1 through 3 that you know, takes us back to Mesopotamia. Genesis 1 through 11 is designed to pit God's desire for Eden against the anti-Eden, the forces of chaos, all of the forces that disrupt what God wants on earth. And the metaphor for doing that is consistently Babylon, Babylonia, you know, this, this part of the world. And Sargon the Great comes from that part of the world. That's where he lived. That's where he ruled. And so if you intentionally 
do enough of a comparative work in the way you tell the story of Moses' birth to make people think of that place instead of just Egypt, you have accomplished something significant. You have made the reader see that Yahweh is at work subverting and defeating the forces of chaos that are very, very ancient, more ancient than Egypt. So again, this is just a little thought experience, just a what if. Again, there's no way literarily to prove this, you know, any sort of dependence or cross-fertilization because the material as we have it is late, but just what if. I mean, to, to me, it's really, it's just fascinating that, that a writer could be so clever. And by the way, none of that rules out the historicity of the event. It's just literary strategy for theologizing the event. The event, of course, being Moses' birth. Theologizing an event and the event are not, you know, the history, historicity of the event are not mutually exclusive. They're not. Remember the story of how I got my job at Logos? All those events happened. Now, again, the way I tell the story is I, I'm, I'm making God a character. I'm making God a behind the scenes actor in the events that unfold. And I'm not saying, I'm not telling you that under inspiration, okay? I have no divine guidance to tell you that. That, that was just my perception. But my perception, my theologizing of what happened, my making it a mythic narrative doesn't mean that the events didn't happen. They did. It's just the, the retelling of the story to make a theological point, to make my listeners think theologically important thoughts. And this is precisely what I'm suggesting, that if the writer of Exodus or you know, an editor or whatever had, had knowledge of the Sargon story, it would be really clever to use some of that in how the story is told, even in a deeply Egyptian context, because your literate reader, their mind is going to go back to where chaos began, to why we have the people of God. God selecting Abram out of the, the region we know as Babylonia, whether it was the north or the south, doesn't matter. God selects a person out after he has divorced the nations, severed the relationship between him and them. He plucks this guy out, out of his polytheistic context. We learned he, he was raised in a polytheistic context in Babylonia, okay, from Genesis 11. He plucks this guy out. He makes a covenant with him and his wife to raise up a new family, a new human family. He's not giving up on the original Edenic plan. He's going to use this guy and his offspring through this woman who can't have children. So she's perfect. Again, it's a supernatural event. He's going to use her and him to create a human family. And through them, he makes a covenant that will draw all of these other nations back home. In other words, it will cure chaos. Again, this is really, really clever. But we're just playing what if here. But it does not rule out the historicity. It's a literary strategy. Okay, let's, there's, there are other examples of this. You know, it, again, it's, it's, not, it's not a coincidence that Egypt in other parts of the Old Testament is actually identified with Babylon in other ways. Egypt is actually identified with Babylon in the Old Testament as a chaos agent. For example, Pharaoh is cast as Leviathan in, in Ezekiel 29, verse 3, in Ezekiel 32 too. It's Ezekiel. He's writing from a Babylonian context. He's talking about Pharaoh of Egypt, but he's using Leviathan again, the, the, the wonderful, you know, wonderfully elastic, you know, chaos symbol. The Babylonian context, again, is very evident. It seems reasonable that given the non-bizarre circumstances of the Moses story, the proximity of, Hebrew, of the Hebrews living in the Delta to marshy areas, that we have a story, a real story of a real event, a desperate mother who risked the life of her child on a gamble, that he'd be discovered by someone, a woman of importance. You know, I, you know, I, I call it a gamble, but it's a, it's a faith-based gamble. She's trusting God. There's nothing uncomely about his birth. He's not undesirable. He's not like some divine hybrid. It just seems a reasonable act of desperation by a woman. It's reasonable, at least in its details. She doesn't just set the kid afloat anywhere, toss him in. She has to build a little craft. What would you do? You'd, you'd do the same thing. Egyptians have Hebrew servants. So it's not unusual that the little slave girl would show up, would be allowed you know, to show up and have a conversation. We talked about that you know, when we talked about the Israelite bondage. Again, all the elements are there. There's no evidence as well that the infant Moses was, was circumcised. And so the child would have blended into an Egyptian context. We don't read Moses ever got circumcised. You know, you know, later, you know, we're going to hit some of that where we discuss that. But here, no. It seems reasonable that a really good strategy for linking Babylon and Egypt as chaos agents who will, will be defeated by Yahweh, raising up a human deliverer, it'd be really reasonable to, reasonable to play off the Sargon story and blend in the Egyptian material of the actual historical context. You kill two birds with one stone. And again, you're not fabricating events, you're theologizing. It's extraordinarily clever, is, is really how, how I look at this. It's really, really clever. And the last item, again, we'll, we'll transition here. There's just one thing I want to say real briefly about Moses' name. Um, and I'll, I'll put, uh, I'll put uh, Lewis's dissertation in the protected folder you know, in case people are interested in this. And I'll put this article as well in the protected folder. Even though this one's going to be dense, you more or less have to have some Hebrew or you know, Semitic or, or some language study to really kind of get this. But in regard to Moses' name, there's an article that's a really good one by J. Gwyn, that's G-W-Y-N Griffith. It's titled The Egyptian Derivation of the Name Moses. It's Journal of Near Eastern Studies, Volume 12, Number 4, October 1953. It's about eight pages long, but it, it's a very thorough treatment of how scholars have tried to link Moshe in Hebrew, that's Mem, Shin, and then He, with something in Egyptian and do it coherently, because there are, there are things that don't align uh, in the possibilities. Moses, again, you know, we get this little comment at the end, you know, she named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Well, again, it requires a little bit of thought. And in this article, Griffiths goes through all the options. And essentially, I'm just cutting to the chase here because it's full of Egyptian and transliteration. It's full of Hebrew and all this other stuff. She argues really well. And it's, it's, she's just drawing on other research and answering a few questions that are kind of outliers. That what we have here is Moses is mess, that's M-S, in Egyptian. And it's not a verb to draw out. She believes, and again, she has really good reason for arguing this, and she has really good examples, that th that term just means child. So when we go back to Exodus 2, verse 10, what we see happening is here is the woman, you know, the Pharaoh's daughter, takes the child out of water. And she says, you know, you know, I'll just read it. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. She became his son. And she named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. So the, the Egyptian is saying, I'm going to call him Mes, which means child in Egypt. 
going to call the child child. And, and, and mess in Egyptian was actually used as a proper name. Again, the Griffiths article gives really good examples of this. It's not unusual. It's not odd. It's not unknown. It was also a proper name that would get appended to a deity name like Ra Mess. You know, what we would think of as Ramses. Okay, uh, Ra Mess would be you know like son of you know, of Ra or something like that. Or Ra is born. It, it, Griffiths points out it's usually these names were usually commemorating the like the birthday of a deity, that kind of thing. But in this case, we, if there was an original Egyptian theophoric element, a deity name that, the, that Pharaoh's daughter stuck onto this, the biblical writer takes it off, and we're just left with you know most Moshe. Mess in, in Egyptian just means child. So she names the child child. She calls him child, Moses, we'll just say, because I drew him out of the water. Now, a lot of your commentaries will try to link an Egyptian term for drawing out with the name Moses. I think that's a mistake. I think the point is that Pharaoh's daughter calls him child. And when, when she says, because I drew him from the water, it means because I saved him and kept him. In other words, the drawing out of the child is not an etymological clue to the Egyptian term behind the name Moses. It refers to the event. I'm going to call this child Mess Moses because I saved him. He's mine. Again, it's, it's a much neater solution. Again, there, there are places you can go to read about you know, the other ones. Griffith's article, Hoffmeyer's book, pages 140 to 142 goes through this. Uh, I think Hoffmeyer, Hoffmeyer tries to be diplomatic to Kenneth Kitchen. and He, he had a real, real affection for Kitchen, as did a lot of other people. And having met him once, I can see why. But uh, you know, Kitchen wants to have the, the woman who says, I drew him up out of the water to be Moses' real mom. But Moses' real mom didn't draw him out of the water. It was Pharaoh's daughter. So I think we can lay that option aside, even though again, Hoffmeyer tries to be nice about that in what he writes. But he's well aware of Griffith's article, uh, interacts with it. And I think that's the simplest, neatest solution. Mess, M-S is a very normal uh, Egyptian term. If you're really into philology and Semitic linguistic stuff, get Griffith's article for what happened to the H in Moshe and how the S in Mess and the Sh in Moshe align. There's linguistic coherence to that. If you want to read that stuff, you can. But I wanted to just depend a, a little bit on this because you know people are curious, You know, does this work in, in Egyptian language? It does. It does. And it makes sense in context. So that was a lot uh, to digest. Again, most of our episode at this time you know, focused on the abandoned child motif, but it's really important. Because people are going to use the story here. Like I said, what you're going to get on the internet is they're going to you know, say, oh, let's go read Exodus 2. You got that down? You got it, got it in your head now? Well, look at the Sargon birth story. And then they're going to say, the writer you know, of Exodus 2, biblical writer's stealing material. It's so utterly simplistic and really fundamentally uninformed that you should know about it. And so I wanted to make that the centerpiece of this episode. Well, I guess we wrapped up chapter two this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get through chapter two. So we're in uh, Exodus 2, 11 through 25. That is the remainder of chapter two today. And a, a couple of things again to park on. In the course of this episode, but let's just start by reading the chapter, just so it's in the heads of those listening. Uh, this is when Moses flees to Midian. That's the uh, the, the episode, the, the series of events in which we are following. So one day, verse eleven, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man in the wrong, "Why do you strike your companion?" He answered, "Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian?" Then Moses was afraid. And thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, Ruel, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, Then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. So that is the remainder of Exodus chapter two. And again, as is our pattern, just some things of interest in the passage. I'm not going to sort of rehearse the package or the passage back to you. It's most of it is pretty self-evident as to what happens, but there are some things as usual, you know, going on under the surface. And then there's a few stopping points that really deserve some attention. And the first one of these is in verse, you know, 15. And that is when Moses flees Pharaoh and stays in the land of Midian. So what in the world is the land of Midian is the obvious question. And it's actually a more important question than we might realize because it's going to take us into other areas as we proceed through the book of Exodus, you know, a few other really important topics. And now, you know, again, it just doesn't seem like it's much more than trivial, but trust me, I think you'll see why it's not in a moment. I'm going to start here with uh, Sarna in his Exodus commentary. He, uh, he has a few things to say about this. He says, Moses is now an outcast fleeing for his life. The land of Midian, where he takes refuge, refers to an area under the control of one or more of the five semi-nomadic tribes that, according to biblical sources, make up the Midianite confederation. And he cites a few passages here. Numbers 31.8 says, they killed the kings of Midian. So notice the plural there, the kings of Midian. So it's more than one person. With the rest of their slain, Evi, Rechem, Tor, Hor, and Rivah the five kings of Midian. And they also killed Balaam, the son of Beor, with a sword. So Numbers 31.8 alludes to, again, this idea of a confederation of kings, of rulers, that are you know, all sort of operating under the rubric you know, of, of Midian. So Midian is, is going to be a place where there's, again, more than one domain, more than one ruler. It's, it's going to be this tribal confederation kind of thing. Joshua 13.21 says, 
where it refers to all the cities of the tableland and all the kingdom of Sihon or Sion, the king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, whom Moses defeated with the leaders of Midian. Again, leaders, plural, Evi and Rechem and Sor and Hur and the Ribah, the princes of Sihon who lived in the land. Again, this is interesting because here we have the Midianite kings, Midianite rulers is probably a better way to say this, in the, in the time of Joshua under the authority or you know, some, some sort of lordship you know, confederation that Sion of Og you know, had control over. Of course, he's one of the Amorite kings. We get that gets us into the Rephaim with the giant clan material. Uh, here they're referred to as princes of Sion uh, who lived in the land. So you know, this is the time of Joshua. I mean, this is going to be some years removed, obviously, from when Moses uh, you know, wanders into the land of Midian. But again, for our purposes here, it's like, okay, this is a, some definable or maybe a little bit fuzzy uh, region of land. It has five rulers in it. Again, it's this confederation idea. And it is interesting, again, that you know, Moses winds up here and later this region is going to become you know, infamous because of its association in some way with Sion of Og, again, this, this king of the Amorites. Now, if you remember in Deuteronomy 2 and 3, this is the area of Bashan. Well, Midian is, is considerably south of that. So how to reconcile these two things? Again, it's a little bit far afield for what we're doing right now. It could be that Sion, again, had uh, sort of an extended you know, oversight or had control over, maybe, maybe by tribute, maybe a vassal arrangement uh, with Midian, uh, that these princes of Midian were somehow under his authority. This isn't necessarily giant clan territory in Midian, but it has some relationship to what's going on there, again, as that we're going to read about much later. So that is a point of interest. Sarna goes on and says, the Midianites ranged over a wide area of the Near East, stretching from the eastern shore of the Gulf of Aqaba. So if you're thinking, you think of a map, think of the Red Sea, it has those two prongs. The left prong you know, sort of points toward the Delta region of Egypt. The right prong, uh, that's the Gulf of Aqaba. And to the east of that, on the other side of that watery prong, is what is now you know, Saudi Arabia. It's that, that prong you know, sort of delimits, in modern terms, the, the, you know, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. You've got Jordan as well. Uh, also referred to as the, you know, the Arabian Peninsula, that idea. So Sarna is saying Midian as a land stretches from the eastern shore of the Gulf of Aqaba, so that right-hand prong eastward, up through the Syro-Arabian Desert, which again is going to be the Arabian Peninsula, Saudi Arabia today, Jordan, and into the borders of the land of Israel, west and northwest of Eilat. Uh, Eilat is right sort of at the tip of that right prong. Uh, if you're looking at a map again, that right prong of the Red Sea. So north and northwest obviously would take us into the land of Israel, probably not as far as Bashan, but maybe the lower region of Bashan. I mean, who knows uh, precisely how this would have been defined. It's just, again, general territory. So we, we can't you know, take this as, as evidence, again, that, that Moses has fled into giant clan territory. I mean, it's possible, but it's more likely that there was some sort of overlordship relationship between the king of the Amorites, you know, Sion and Og, and the Midianite confederation, you know, that the latter was somehow subservient or answerable to uh, the former. So let me just add, throw in one other thing, because we're going to get into, you probably already have sort of picked up on it. Uh, this is going to directly relate to, to the location of Mount Sinai, okay, the location of the burning bush incident, which we'll actually get into more next week when we hit Exodus 3, because that's the passage for it. But we'll, we'll say a few things about it in this episode. But I want to add uh, what Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary says here about Midian. Uh, let's read a, a selection here. The origin of the name Midian is unknown, though it has been suggested that the root, Madi, is non-Semitic and possibly cognate to the designation of Medes of much later times. The biblical genealogy, and he references, the writer references Genesis 25 too. Uh, the biblical genealogy includes two variants, Midian and Midan, cognates of, bo- cognates of both of which appear in Greek sources of the Hellenistic period, as names of towns east of the Gulf of Aqaba. So there's that location again, east of, of the Gulf of Aqaba, over in what we would now think Saudi Arabia, you know, and then a little bit north of that, you know, Jordan. Biblical tradition listed the eponymous ancestor, Midian, as one of six sons born to the patriarch Abraham by his second wife, Keturah. That's Genesis 25, 1 through 6. So again, that's, that's what the writer was referring to by the biblical genealogy of the name Midian. It shows up in Genesis 25, 1 through 6, specifically verse 2, as one of the six sons born to Abraham by Keturah. Back to the quotation. According to this account, Abraham sent these sons away from Canaan to the East Country, a tradition that implies an origin in Canaan proper for these proto-Arabic tribal designations. This tradition is now powerfully reinforced by linguistic evidence that derives the pre-Islamic Arabic language and writing system from the Bronze Age Mediterranean coastal region. So there's a connection linguistically between Arabic before the advent of Islam. And, you know, that language and languages that, again, are, are closer to the Mediterranean coast, which of course would be Canaan proper. So the, the, the linguistic evidence backs up this notion of Genesis 25, 1 through 6, as far as um, you know, having a Canaan or Canaanite um, origin for the people of Midian. And again, through in, in biblical terms, through Abraham and Keturah. Now, on continuing on with Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary, it takes a, 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 what I guess is fair to say a liberal bent when it comes to some of this material. I'll just read it to you. The Midianites, as a historically existent society, are represented in the Joseph stories, Genesis 37, 25 through 36. As traders traveling by camel caravan, the Midianites as a historically existent society are represented, uh, again, in this passage, as, as this caravan traveling between Gilead, which is the north, northern, north part of the Transjordan, the other side of the Jordan, and Egypt. And in this case, dealing in slaves as well as gum, balm, and myrrh. The term Midianite alternates with the term Ishmaelite in that passage. Probably to be explained, here's the liberal, liberal bent, at least a little bit. 
probably to be explained by the fact that at the time the narrative reached its present form, the Midianites had ceased to exist as a distinct social group, but were identified with an ethnic group later called Ishmaelites. The narrative certainly is not earlier than the monarchy, time of Saul, David, and Solomon. And there's no reason to believe it is based upon any historical event. Now, that's from Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary. It's by Mendenhall again, and he's sort of playing his hand as far as his, his view of the historicity of the text. That's why I said a liberal bent. Now, Sarna, back in his, this is actually a different commentary. He has a, a Jewish publication society a commentary on Exodus, which we've quoted from before and we did a few minutes ago. And he also has the Genesis volume. Now, here's what he says in the Genesis volume. He's a little more charitable than uh, Mendenhall is in the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary. So in talking about the discrepancy between Midianites interchanged with Ishmaelites, because again, if the Midianites came from Abraham through Ketorah back in Genesis 25, then how can we possibly call them Ishmaelites? Because Ishmael is born by Hagar. So we, we have a, a disconnection here, a problem. And Mendenhall's solution is that, well, this is not historical anyway, and it's probably because the Midianites ceased to be a people by the time this was written, and they just got conflated by mistake, so on and so forth. Sarn is a little more generous. He writes this, the discrepancy in names has been variously explained by traditional commentators. Genesis Rabbah 8420, and this is rabbinic stuff, so that's what he means by traditional commentators. Genesis Rabbah 8420, followed by Rashi, postulates that Joseph was traded several times. Ibn Ezra identifies the Ishmaelites with Midianites on the basis of Judges 824, and I'll read that. Gideon said to him, let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings from his spoil, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Remember, Gideon was connected with the Midianites, okay? So I'll repeat that. Ibn Ezra identifies the Ishmaelites with Midianites on the basis of Judges 824, which relates that Midianites possessed golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. This passage suggests that the term Ishmaelite was used as an epithet for nomadic traders rather than in an ethnic sense. Midianite, on the other hand, indicates a specific ethnic affiliation. Even if the two names are indicative of originally distinct narrative strands that have here been interwoven, it must have been the close connection between Ishmael and Midian in biblical tradition, both being offspring of Abraham, again, by different women, that led to their fusion. That's the end of the Sarna quote. So again, he, he doesn't see this as any indication of it not being historical. So again, he's more charitable than, than Mendenhall was in Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary. The point here is that Moses is a distant relative of the Midianites before he gets married to Zipporah, okay? Uh, before he meets you know, Jethro or Ruel. We'll talk about those names in a moment. Moses is already something of a distant relative because Moses is a, you know, from the line of Isaac and Jacob back to Abraham. He's an Israelite. Uh, so there's some connection already. There's some family connection. But back to verse 15, Moses goes to Midian. As I mentioned before, you know, this is going to take us into the burning bush encounter, this location of Sinai, all this kind of stuff. So I, I'll just sort of telegraph this a little bit, deal with it a little bit, because we're going we're gonna to actually return you know, to this topic in other places you know, in the book of Exodus in the series. So in Exodus 3.1, Let's just look at Exodus 3 1, because right after our, our portion for today, Exodus 2 11 through 25, you know, Moses is in Midian, he flees to Midian, he gets married. He's got Jethro, or, or Ruel, his father in law, the priest of Midian. And then the very next verse, Exodus 3 1, it says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father in law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So Exodus 3 1 is typically read as though Moses is tending Jethro's flocks in Midian. And so the assumption is that the mountain of God in Exodus 3 1, which is named there as Horeb, seems to be in Midian. Now, you could read the verse that way, and some do, but the verse could also be read in a different way. Okay, think about it. I'm going to read it again. Now, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The verse could very obviously be read that Moses left Midian and journeyed to the west of Midian, or a wilderness west of Midian. In other words, Exodus 3.1 doesn't actually tell us with certainty that the mountain of God, Horeb, is in Midian. You can't really use that verse for it. Because if you read the verse, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. Now, Jethro certainly is the priest of Midian. Okay, we got that. But he led Jethro's flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb. So Horeb could very well be perceived and actually be to the west of Midian, somewhere where it wasn't in Midian proper. Of course, this, this, the difficulty here is, well, how do we define Midian with any precision? Because it could be this territory of east of the Gulf of Aqaba, all the way up north, you know, to where you hit Elad, and even beyond that into Canaan territory. You know, how, do we, how do we know this specifically? Now, I mentioned this. You, you can't read that. I, th I think. This is just my opinion. I mean, I used to be on this bandwagon that Mount Sinai or Horeb. But again, we have to deal with that as well. Why is, what's with the two names? I used to be on the bandwagon that Mount Sinai was in Midian, you know, specifically, you know, Jabal Allahs. I'm not anymore. I, I think it's possible, but it has some serious, there are serious uncertainties with it and, and problems with it. And frankly, the evidence used popularly to support the idea is, it ranges from anything, from, from something contrived to just being weak and iffy. It, it's, it's, it's just far from secure. Uh, let, let's put it that way. There, there are some significant problems with it. Uh, I think, you know, we can leave the door open to it. But certainly, you can't take this Midian language and go, you know, take a flock and go all the way west of the Gulf of Aqaba all the way down to the traditional Sinai. This is hundreds and hundreds of miles, you know, through arid desert country to hit the traditional site of Sinai. I, I don't see how Exodus 3.1 can really be reconciled with the traditional site. But what people fail to realize is there are actually more than two candidates for Sinai. It's not just a choice between the traditional Mount Sinai at Jebel Musa and Jebel al Laz in Midian or Saudi Arabia. There are other possible locations. They, they just don't get the press. And there, again, there are certain passages of scripture that, that would frankly rule out both the traditional site and a location in Midian. But it would actually work well if you're talking about territory that's just to the north or northwest of the Gulf of Aqaba, the tip there, you know, a lot. There are other candidates here. 
So uh, again, that's kind of as far as I really want to you know, get into that specific subject. We'll, we'll hit it again as we're going through Exodus, but I'm just you know, putting those cards on the table. That, you know, I, used to really, I used to think a lot more highly of, of the Mount Sinai in, in Arabia idea than I do now. It, it does have serious weaknesses, but the traditional view also has some pretty serious weaknesses too. But there are other possibilities. Um, let's, before we leave that, I mentioned about the names Horeb and Sinai. Now, what I just read just in Exodus 3.1, it, it takes us into other questions. You know, what's the relationship of Midian to Horeb? Because is, is Horeb in Midian or, or is it to the west of Midian? If, as you read the verse, you can read it that way. And then, and then also, what's the relationship of Horeb to Sinai? Here's, a, 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 I think, a significant passage. I'm just going to read you this and without getting into it because it's in Exodus 17. You know, we'll hit it at some point you know, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the course of the podcast. But Exodus 17, 1 through 7 says this, All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and they camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with, with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. And behold, I will, now catch this line, this is Exodus 17, 6. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? So this event occurs at Horeb. And if you keep reading Exodus 17, they're only going to get to Sinai just you know, right, right around Exodus 20, you know, in Exodus 19. They have a ways to go before they get to the place where they get the law. So here we have a, a disconnection. It's a clear disconnection between the mountain you know, or, or Horeb, just the term Horeb, and the mountain of God that they're going to end up at. So that's another issue for, for when we're, we're trying to determine, or at least come up with an idea of you know, where, where Mount Sinai is. Exodus 3.1 links the two, and it's not the only passage that, is link, that links Horeb and Sinai. And then there, you have other passages like this one that clearly distinguishes, distinguish them as, as separate locations. Now, Sarna comments on this. He says, many texts seem to identify this location. He's commenting on Exodus 3.1, Horeb. Many texts seem to identify this location with Sinai, but there are also indications that they may not be identical. Thus, while Mount Sinai appears frequently, Mount Horeb is rare. And there's no reference to the wilderness of Horeb as there is to that of Sinai. Further, an impression of some distance between the two is gained from the story of the water crisis at Rephidim, as told in Exodus 17, 1 through 7. There, the divine spirit is said to have been manifest before Moses, close by a rock at Horeb. Yet Rephidim was the last station of the Israelites before entering the wilderness of Sinai. We may be dealing with different strands or different tradition. Or Horeb may have been the name of a wider region in which Mount Sinai, a specific peak, was located. Perhaps that peak eventually lent its name to the entire area. Horeb means desolate or dry, and its location has not been identified. So again, we're going to hit all this again when we, hit, when we get into Exodus 3. But you should know, even at this point, that we've, we've, got some, we've got some problems here between Midian, you know, what is it, how wide is it, where does it go, where does it stop, you know, that kind of thing, like, or does it have borders, Sinai, Horeb, again, all, all these place names, there is variability, and, and, and there, there just isn't agreement. So we have to think about, well, what do the terms mean, in which context, and why, and all that, all that sort of stuff. The location of Sinai, again, is not a simple thing. So if, if, you have, if someone tells you it is a simple thing, all you got to do is look at this or do that, it just isn't. It just isn't. There's just more to it than that, that a close reading of scripture is, is going to take you into, into some of these problem areas. And if you don't deal with them, you're, you're really not dealing with the subject you know, very well anyway. So let's move on. In verse 16, we want to you know, keep going here in Exodus chapter 2. In verse 16, we read, now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. Then in verse 18, we read, when those daughters came home to their father, Ruel. And then in verse 21, we read about the priest of Midian named Ruel becomes Moses' father-in-law. But in Exodus 3.1, which we just read, it is Jethro who is Moses' father-in-law, and he is explicitly called the priest of Midian. So what's going on here? I mean, who is Moses' father-in-law? Is it Ruel? Is it Jethro? Who's the priest of Midian? Is it one of these two guys? You know, why the different names? So it's actually going to get worse because you're going to have a third name thrown in in certain passages. This is a well-known uh, historical problem, you know, historical textual problem in, in the book and elsewhere. So I'm going to read from uh, P. E. Hughes's article in the Dictionary of the Old Testament of the Pentateuch, you know, just to give you a, a flavor for it, you know, for how scholars, some scholars at least, you know, approach it. He writes, the priest of Midian of Exodus 2:16 is called Ruel in Exodus 2:18, but referred to as Jethro in a number of places. Exodus 18:1, you can put in Exodus 3:1. Uh, 18, 1, 2, 5, 6, 9, 10, and 12. In addition, Judges 4, 11, in that passage, mention is made of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. <laughs> he got three. I'll just read you that verse. This is Judges 4, 11. Now Heber, the, Ke- the Kenite, had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak of Zahananim, which is near Kadesh. So, okay, now we got three. Now, what are we supposed to do? Back to Hughes. Hughes says, cumulatively, not only is Moses' father-in-law given the three names of Ruel, Jethro, and Hobab, but the latter does not align with Numbers 10, 29 which describes Hobab as the son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law. It's starting to sound like I'm my own grandpa now, you know, the, the old you know, folk song. Back to Hughes. 
different proposals have been presented to solve this dilemma from source critical solutions like Jethro is is the guy for the E document, the E right, you know, the JEDD thing. Jethro is, the, is in the E source, Moses' father in law, and Ruel and Hobab belong to the J document. And this is why they're mixed because the Pentateuch is just a mixture of these different documents. The editor just goofed here or whatever. And that, that's sort of a standard source critical approach. So Hughes says, you know, you know, one of the, the approaches is to try to refer to source critical solutions. We also have, back to Hughes, we also have the suggestion that a misreading of the numbers passage may have influenced the identification of Jethro as Hobab in Judges. So again, then we have an error in, in, in Judges. To the proposition that we may be missing fine distinctions between personal and clan names, that's the third option. Some have proposed that we're just missing some fine distinctions between personal names and clan names. This latter perspective was advanced by W.F. Albright, who concluded that Ruel was a clan name and Jethro was his proper name, with the seeming reference to the same person in Numbers 10, 29 through 32, attributed to him by a misvocalization in the Hebrew text. So Albright's solution is, look, one of these is a clan name, the other one is a personal name, a proper name, and Numbers 10, 29 through 32 confuses things because the Hebrew text, the, some scribe at some point put the wrong vowels to the consonants. Remember, it, the consonants were the th- are the things that were, you know, the original part of the composition, and vowels were added much later. So Albright notes uh, that if you look at the Hebrew there, you can read the Hebrew term uh, as kotain, son-in-law of Moses, as opposed to father-in-law, which would get a different pronunciation. So this, is, this was Albright's solution. Sarna, we bring him into the picture in his Exodus commentary, writes this. Ruel is mentioned once again in Numbers 10.29, where he quotes, you know, Hobab, son of Ruel, the Midianite Moses' father-in-law. I mean, Albright saying it could be son-in-law, depending on how, what vowels you give it. Uh, Sarna says, Ruel is mentioned once again in Numbers 10.29, where it's uncertain which of the two is so designated. So Sarna points out that if you actually read Numbers 10.29, Hobab, son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, you can't actually tell which one is Moses' father-in-law. It could be Hobab, it could be Ruel. I mean, it, it just depends on syntactically how you, how you take that. You know, it's the relationship of the order, the word order here with the semantics. So he says, it's uncertain which of the two is so designated. Sarna continues, from Judges 4.11, it would appear that Hobab is the father-in-law, but in other texts, this latter epithet is given to Jethro. So Hobab and Jethro, two different names, who also bears the title priest of Midian. Sarna notes, rabbinic exegesis reconciles the discrepancies by assuming that Ruel was the grandfather of the girls, and that the other names all refer to the same person who bore several names. Many modern scholars prefer to assign the variants to different strands of tradition. However, it is to be noted that the title, priest of Midian, is only explicitly attached to Jethro. This raises the possibility that Hebrew Yitro, or Yeter, is not a proper name, but an honorific name, meaning something like his excellency. And as a, as a biblical parallel, he points to Genesis 49.3. I'm going to read you that verse. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruits of my strength. Preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. The word preeminent there, occurring twice in the same verse, is the word yeter in Hebrew. It's the same you know, that you'll find in passages for Jethro. And so Sarna is, is suggesting that Jethro really isn't a proper name. We should probably understand it as something of, a, of an honorific title, like his excellency. And he, he further bolsters that by appealing to Akkadian. He says, in Akkadian, Atru, uh, think about it, Yitro, Hebrew, Atru, Akkadian, they sound very much alike. Akkadian is East Semitic, Hebrew is Northwest Semitic. Uh, in Akkadian, Atru or Watru means preeminent or foremost, which would be very, basically the same as, as the, what we just read in Genesis 49, verse 3. In addition, several old Akkadian names begin with that element. They begin with Atru, again, which to Sarna suggests we have an honorific title here. Like Sir, or His Excellency. You know, like, I hate to use George, but George Washington is a good illustration. I mean, that's how George Washington was referred to, His Excellency George Washington, or His Excellency you know, President George Washington, something like that. It was a title that, that Washington actually, you know, later on, uh, when, they, when they were talking about what to call the leader of the nation, he, he didn't want to be called His Excellency because it sounded like too much like, like kingship. So president you know, was, was what they decided on. But this is, the, how, this is the way Washington was referred to routinely. Um, so it could be a similar idea. Lastly, uh, Sarna points out in Ugaritic, several personal nouns are known that are prefixed by the element YTR, exactly the same as Hebrew, Yater or Yatero. So that's the end of, of Sarna's contribution there. So it's very possible that the way to, to reconcile this information is just as we, you know, we, we tried to summarize there, that you might have a confusion between son-in-law and father-in-law in the one passage, just depends on, on what vowels you, you apply to the Hebrew consonants. You can have Jethro as a, as a title akin to his excellency. And again, th- these, these things, these elements remove the obstacles, uh, remove the contradictions. You don't ha- you're not forced to say, well, these passages are what they are because they're hopelessly contradictory because some editor goofed up when he was making the Pentateuch from these three different documents or two different documents, you know, J and E. You don't have to go there. You know, for, for some, that's just an easy solution because, again, they're, they're committed intellectually you know, to the JEDP idea. And again, I'm not an opponent of editing. I don't buy JEDP because I do think it's based on circular reasoning, as I've, as I've said many times on the podcast. But editing certainly uh, you know, happens throughout Scripture, including the Torah. But, but we don't need to appeal to that sort of thing when we you know, actually have a fairly, not only reasonable, but fairly easy solution here, repointing Hebrew, because again, the vowels are not original. And then looking at other occurrences of this Hebrew lemma, Yeter, and seeing not only in Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, but also in Akkadian and Ugaritic, that it refers to some sort of preeminence idea of, for a person. So the idea that it's an honorific title, that, that could make pretty good sense. Other items here. Um, let's talk about the name Ruel. And some of you, again, have already tracked on this. As, as just as hearing that, that term, you're, you're going to be on this point already. The name means friend of God. El is the generic, generic term for God. The other part is the word for friend or companion. Uh, friend of God or maybe friend of El. Uh, although uh, Nauf in Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary writes this. He says, the name means friend of God or God is friend. 
L in personal names does not necessarily refer to the god L. And he's right. He's right about that. So just because it's L doesn't mean it's a proper name. That, that's completely fair. And again, now isn't a card-carrying evangelical by any means. Um, mm-hmm. For those of you listening, think that, 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 that presume that these sorts of discussions sort of default to some sort of evangelical censoring, then you're wrong. Listen to more of the podcast and you'll see how wrong that is. Um, again, we're just going with, with you know, good, good scholarship here. Could, you know, it could mean either, but it doesn't have to mean L. You know, and there's nothing wrong with it, specifically because of some of the things we're going to get into here you know, about you know, going back to the Midianites and their ancestry and all that stuff. So it, it could be L, but that doesn't mean L was perceived as a different deity than the one that Moses is going to encounter, again, at the burning bush and later. So Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary uh, says this. And again, this is Nauf's article on, on that particular entry, Ruel. He says, Ruel is a son of Esau. Again, in, in, in one, at least one Ruel, this is where the, the name shows up. Can you be used of a son of Esau? Genesis 36, 4, verse 10, 13, 17, 1 Chronicles 1, 35 and 37. If the list of Genesis 36, 10 through 14 reflects the structure of the Edomite tribal system in the 7th century BC, then Ruel was one of the three major Edomite tribes and had four sub-tribes in Genesis 36, 10 through 14. And again, that would be no surprise because Esau is identified with Edom in Genesis 36 and elsewhere. Now continues, in Numbers 10, 29, Ruel is the father of Hobab, the eponymous ancestor of a Kenite clan that settled in the Negev among the tribe of Judah. This clan may well have belonged to the Edomite tribe Ruel before it migrated to the other side of Wadi Arabah. Therefore, Ruel, as Moses' relative, is possibly identical with the Edomite tribe. And he references Albright here, who you know, sort of went along the same trajectory. Now, the point of all that is that it's possible, it, it, it's quite possible, that Moses, therefore, represents both lines you know, from, from Isaac, both of Isaac's lines, Jacob's line, because Moses is from Levi. And again, if you have this, this connection here with, with Esau, you know, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Moses is sort of emblematic. It has, has some sort of blood connection with both sides, as well as being a distant relative of the Midianites who overlap with the Ishmaelites. And again, there you have Abraham's seed outside the line of Isaac, which is really kind of interesting. I mean, the, the person of Moses could represent all of the, the two lines within the, the one you know, Abrahamic line and then the line in, in another Abrahamic line. It's just, it's just kind of interesting genealogically. Now, Carpenter writes, you know, that you know, given the lineages involved, it seems, Carpenter says, it seems likely that the Midianites would have known of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but not by the name Yahweh as revealed to Moses in the third chapter of Exodus. I mean, Exodus 3, God is going to reveal his, this name to Moses. In other words, it's quite coherent. This is me now. This is not a carpenter. It's quite coherent to think that these people, the Midianites, knew of and worshipped the God of their patriarchal forefathers. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly compatible with, with, with what, we, what we're reading and what we know of them genealogically. It would be reasonable, you know, because you have, again, all these lineages going back to Abraham and Isaac, again, Isaac having the two lines, Jacob and Esau, that, that these people would have known about the God of their forefathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean that they knew that God by the name Yahweh. Because if we take Exodus 3 seriously, and you know, Exodus 6, 3 is another allusion to this, then you know, God's revealing something to Moses at the burning bush. I am that I am. I am who I am. Okay, and we'll talk about the meaning of the name when we get to Exodus 3 in the podcast. But if, that's, you know, if they already knew that, it wouldn't be a revelation to Moses. Well, it was a revelation. Uh, and he's, you know, he, he's identifying in Exodus 3, the same passage, you know, with the people in Egypt and their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, it's the same deity. Now, you know, people who are listening to this are going to think, well, that's just kind of weird, because in my English Bible, you know, I read the name Yahweh in passages before Exodus 3, and, and some passages that have to do with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I read, you know, the Lord, it's, it's, it's Yahweh there. That's correct, you do. And here's where, again, this, this is actually where the, the source-critical approach to the Torah really started, because you, you have revelations of the divine name in Exodus 3, and then when you have, you have the same divine name supposedly revealed in Exodus 3 to Moses at the burning bush, you have it show up elsewhere in the Old Testament with earlier patriarchs. Some people looked at that and thought, well, that just doesn't make sense. The Pentateuch must be, therefore, a combination of different documents, where you had one person writing about God using the name Yahweh another person writing about God using L or L derivatives, like El Shaddai, you know, something like that. And then somebody came along, again, in, in Israelite or Jewish tradition, and he wove these two things together into one cohesive narrative, and he mixed the names. Again, this is, this is the core of the Mosaic authorship issue. J and E documents, D is something else, P is something else. Okay, but this is where it actually begins because of issues like this. So we've run right into it. Now, again, you don't have to embrace the entirety of the JEDP idea to accept this. Again, I'm, I'm what used to be called a supplementarian. I believe there was a mosaic core. I believe we have material composed or, or heavily edited in Babylon, Genesis 1 through 11. I believe we have other material derived or get, that gets codified, put in writing from oral tradition of the people, you know, ancient people of Israel themselves. They, they knew these stories about their ancestors, and eventually those stories got written down. And, and yes, you, you do, I think you do have editorial evidence where you have it at some places. An editor must have used the divine name Yahweh in earlier scenes, earlier episodes, specifically so that his readers would understand that we're not dealing with two deities here, specifically. In other words, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would have known God by L and L names. Good. They're worshiping one God, okay? the God, singular, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when you get to Moses, Moses you know, encounters this same God who reveals to him another name, and he's going to relate to Moses by a different name. Well, the patriarchs didn't know that, but it doesn't matter because they're the same deity. But whoever is reading the Hebrew Bible centuries later sees and understands that both he and his own readers, you know, as he's you know, putting, they're putting the final touches on this thing that we're going to call the, the Torah, and wide, wider than that, the Tanakh, sees the need to make sure his readers understand that these names all lead to the same place, all lead to the same deity. And so an editor would 
insert the subsequent name, the covenant name, the, you know, Yahweh, he will put that into passages so that his readers understand that it's the same God. It's the same entity, the same deity, the same person. This is the way you would do it. You tie those threads together. Now, you can do that without having the Pentateuch be, you know, in terms of its origin, be completely you know, created out of four different documents. Again, my view, and again, it's, it's a minority view now. It used to be a majority view back in the day, is that you have a substantial element of oral tradition from the Israelites, the Hebrews. You have Moses writing material. And then that stuff gets edited later. It gets accrued to, and it gets edited later. See, JEDP, what, what JEDP really wanted to deny was any sense of Mosaic authorship. That's really what it was after. That's what was in the crosshairs. You know, and, and once you do that, you don't have a need for Moses. And they were questioning even the existence of Moses and so on and so forth. So that's really what that was about. It wasn't about trying necessarily to come up with a better way to understand why we have the Torah and, and let Moses be a contributor. See, that, that's the supplementarian position that I hold. I don't see any reason why Moses could not have been a substantial contributor to what we call the Torah. But if you're a JEDP guy, you don't, you don't say that at all. Even, even evangelicals who buy into JEDP, again, Moses didn't have anything to do, to do with this as far as composition. He's the subject of a lot of it, but as far as composition, he had nothing to do with it. And they'll still affirm the historicity of Moses, but he didn't touch the thing. I think that's too extreme. And ultimately, the way JEDP is articulated and defended, it, it does fall prey to circular reasoning at points. Again, I've, I've talked about this before and blogged about it, so I don't want to you know, keep going down this, this road. But this is a really good example where you know, you've, you've got this situation. You, you just run into it in the text. So again, there's nothing, you know, back up to the major point for our purposes. It's completely coherent that the Midianites if they're Edomites or Ishmaelites or you know, whatever, rights, okay, that this people group that Moses finds himself in their midst, it's completely coherent that this group would have worshipped the God that Moses worshipped while he was living in Egypt and his people, the God of their ancestors, because that same God is their, their he's their, their God too. All these other ancestors, these other people groups, you know, we know that by virtue of the genealogical comments that I've read here, you know, in the course of discussing the, the topic here, it's, it's just, it's not, it's not unreasonable to say, you know, to, to have this picture. So Moses wanders into Midian and they know who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is. It's interesting. When you get to Exodus 4, remember the, the, the famous or infamous bridegroom of blood episode where God you know, wants to kill Moses and then Zipporah has to save the day and there, there's something going on you know, with circumcision. Yeah, we'll get to that too. But she knows. She's the daughter of the priest of Midian. She knows that circumcision is a big deal. Again, that, that's right out of, out of the religion of the patriarchs. So again, it, it's very consistent. It's very consistent, even though, again, it requires us to think a little bit differently about some things. Now, to wrap, wrap up our episode, just a couple of other things. Let's look at uh, Zipporah, Zipporah. In verse 21, her name means bird, a bird. Again, it's a, either a term of endearment or to reflect you know, her beauty. Verse 22, we get Gershom. Gershom has an interesting meaning. You know, Zipporah gives birth to a son, she called, and he, Moses, called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Gershom, again, comes from the, 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 the main stem of the word is garage, which means to drive out or to drive off. Okay, it's the same lemma used to describe the action of the shepherds in verse 17. Okay, when, you know, when, they're, when the, the, the daughters of the priest of Midian, you know, are, are being driven off, you know, the shepherds came and drove them away. It's, it's the same lemma there, garage, to drive away. And it's kind of interesting that, that Moses, of course, witnesses this while he's in a foreign land, and he has been driven out of Egypt. Again, he's, he's forced to flee, you know, by Pharaoh. So the, just the name of the son sort of harkens back to the occasion where Moses met his future wife, and he was received into Jethro's family. But Gershom, uh, Sarna points out, also carries a wider national elusiveness. That's A-L-L, like an illusion. Its illusions are bigger. For later in the narrative, the stem is used three more times, Garash is used three more times, to underscore the abject humiliation of the stubborn Pharaoh as he is forced to reverse his refusal to let Israel go. And later on in the story, again, he, you know, he drives them out. You know, in other words, the term's going to be picked up by the writer just to draw connections between Moses being driven away and Moses rescuing these, these women from the shepherds, he, you know, shepherds who were driving them away, and then, of course, the name of Moses on the sun. There's an interconnectedness you know, throughout these characters and these scenes. Uh, the folk etymology that Sarna says, interprets the name as a composite of Ger, Sham, a stranger. There, Ger is stranger. Sham is the word for there. And so we get this, I've been a, for, a sojourner for, in a foreign land. That statement is still true because Moses was driven out. But again, scholars have pointed out that it, what we actually have here is, is, a, is the lemma garage to drive out. And it's used intertextually in a number of, of you know, other episodes here. Verses 23 through 24, or the end, 25, we read, during those many days, the king of Egypt died. There, you know, again, when we were discussing chronology earlier, you cannot say that you have the same Pharaoh who was the Pharaoh of the, the oppression and the one who was seeking Moses' life and have the same guy be the Pharaoh of the Exodus because he dies. Right here it is. And I don't want to re rehearse that, but this is something that needs to be accounted for. And it's kind of astonishing how many treatments of the chronology of the candidate for Pharaoh just, just omit this or, or just never seem to see it. Uh, again, I don't know how that is, but it's true. I can show you specific examples of you know, pretty good published stuff. And it just, it's not in there. They're you know, continuing in, in Exodus, 20, Exodus 2 and verse 23. So the king, the king of Egypt died. The people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel and God knew. That's the way it ends. And God knew. He knew what? I mean, haven't you ever wondered that? You get to the end of Exodus 2, and God knew. What? I mean, it, it feels like there's something that should come after that. The best answer is probably uh, found in Exodus 3, 7 through 8a, at least the first part of a, because 
it aligns with the third person narration of Exodus 2, 23 through 24. So if we read Exodus 3, 7, and 8, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know, here we, get, here we get what God knows, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them out of that land, so on and so forth. So what God knows is, the, is what's happening to these people. And that's what we read you know, in Exodus 2, 23 and 24. It's just odd that verse 25 ends that way. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. It's just, it's really abrupt, but that, you know, that's, that's what it is. As far as literary stuff, and we'll end with this, I mean, we've, we've sort of you know, picked around a few of the problems in the, in the passage and a few of the things that we're going to be picking up in later episodes with Exodus 3 and beyond. But there's some real interesting literary things going on. I just want to read a summary uh, by Hughes in, in the Dictionary of the Old Testament Pentateuch. I think he has a really nice way of summarizing kind of literarily what's going on in this, in this passage. He writes, Ruel's significance is further emphasized by the fact that he is properly named Ruel, meaning friend of God. In Exodus 2.18, which provides a sharp contrast to the oppressive anti-creational bent of the Pharaoh, who has just been described as seeking to kill Moses. So Ruel, the friend of God, God's companion, is set in contrast to Pharaoh. You know, one is the friend of God and the friend of Moses, the other wants to kill him. The hospitality of the priest toward Moses, the outsider, not only contrasts with Pharaoh and his banishment to Moses from Egypt, but also serves to illustrate the impending legal concern for upholding the cause of those on the margins of Israelite society. Again, Carpenter gets into, into the foreshadowing of all this. He writes this, the conclusion in verse 22 and the previous context, including Genesis 15, 13, and Genesis 50, 24 through 25. Again, verse 22 is um, the reference to Gershom, uh, and that Moses was a, a sojourner, a stranger in a foreign land. These things work together to indicate Moses' status in Midian is ultimately temporary, and to anticipate an open door for him to return to Egypt to lead Israel to their own land of inheritance. The event of Moses' deliverance, deliverance, think of the word deliverance. The event of Moses' deliverance of Ruel's daughters foreshadows not only Exodus 18, but the entire episode in Exodus 18, 1 through 12. In incipient form, it is Moses who informs Ruel or Jethro of Yahweh in chapter 18, not the other way around. This scenario involving meeting one's bride at a well recalls similar scenes in Genesis 24, 12 through 16 with Isaac and Rebekah, Genesis 29, 1 through 14 with Jacob and Rachel. All of these episodes stress the providential care of God for the persons involved, but in this case, it is Moses' exile and sojourn in Midian that is the most important. Moses' act of kindness had ramifications that he did not expect, but the reader will recall that he had been a favored baby, Exodus 2, 2, a status that also applies to him as an adult. That special status is revealed powerfully in the functions God places on Moses. God's chosen leader. And that's the end of the quote. Again, what, he, what he's saying here is that the, the whole thing, Moses winds up in Midian. Again, you've, you've, got, you know, you've got the association with Zion. You've got the kings of Midian. He's running from Pharaoh, but, but what happens to him? He runs into the friend of God, Ruel, and he is taken in by that family. He delivers, okay? He delivers. And, and you know, the, the word there is the same as you're going to get you know, with deliverance elsewhere in the Exodus story, but he delivers the, the, the women from these hostile shepherds who are driving them away from the water. And it foreshadows the deliverance that Moses is going to be the agent of for the entire nation. And really, it foreshadows even more than that, you know, with the salvation of God's people, you know, later on in the New Testament. You know, he is a stranger, you know, in a foreign land, that he's been driven out, and he refers to the driving out. I mean, all these, all these things are going to make you, to, make you to, to connect in your mind, Moses, Egypt, Midian, Ruel, all those things with what's going to happen later. Specific episodes, specific deliverances, specific places, specific people, you know, ultimately that Moses is going to be involved in. So there are these little seed words and seed thoughts in the last few verses, really 16 through 20, 25 of Exodus 2, that sort of set the stage. They become little spring, springboards or little, you know, jumping off points for the story as it's going to unfold later on, because some of the same verbiage is going to be used. It'll, you'll, you'll have seen it before, and it'll take your mind back here uh, in, in some clever ways. So I just wanted to throw that in because, again, I, I like intertextuality. If you don't, well, I'm sorry. But I like intertextuality because, again, the biblical writers are intelligent. They, they drop things, little breadcrumbs, words, phrases, imagery, because they want you to connect ideas in the present, what you're reading, and they also want you to, to remember them when you get to other places in what they're writing, and you can see how one thing foreshadowed the other. I think it's just interesting to be able to trace those things through. So next time, we will hit Exodus 3. We've got a lot to talk about. You know, Horeb, Sinai, Midian, the revealing of the name. Again, there's a lot of stuff there that we've, we've sort of seen the precursor of already here. Uh, and that's, it's not, it's not going to be unique to Exodus. There's going to be a lot of that going on in the book. I have a makeshift map that I'm going to uh, have Trey upload to the episode site. It's actually best if you're, if you're looking at the map or you've you got to get the map fixed in your head while you listen to this episode because we're going to be dealing with some geographical stuff. So there's a, a visual component here again, and visual stuff doesn't normally translate well to audio podcasts. But again, we're just going to make a good faith effort and put a map up there so that you can reference it. But we're just going to, we're going to get into some, some things that it's just essential unless you sort of have a really good sort of orientation uh, to the geography of Canaan and the Transjordan and, of course, the Sinai Peninsula and the Arabian Peninsula. If you know that already, well, then you're good. But most listeners will not, and they'll need to look at a map. So let's, for the sake of the episode, just rehearse Exodus 3.1, if it's not already fixed in our minds because we've traversed through here a bit before. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, some preliminaries here. We've already brought up, and now we're going to drill down into the relationship between Sinai and Horeb. The mountain here is called Horeb in Exodus 3.1. Elsewhere, it's called Sinai. Most of the time, it's called Sinai. And also the relationship between Sinai and Horeb and Midian, okay, the place known as Midian. Secondly, we are going to need to deal with the relationship of all that, Sinai, Horeb, and Midian, with 
quote unquote, Yahweh's march from the south traditions in the Hebrew Bible. Now, this is going to be unfamiliar to a number of listeners, but it's just sort of, you know, it's all over the place. I mean, you can't discuss Exodus 3 and really Exodus 6 without getting into this material. So this is why we're doing it specifically. And we'll look at all these passages that are relevant. Yahweh is said in the Hebrew Bible in a number of places to have come to his land or come to his temple from the south. And the passages explicitly define the south with geographical terms like Haran, Timon, Seir, and Edom. Okay, so if you're thinking already, well, the south, that would be the Mount Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula, the traditional site of Sinai. Or if you're thinking, oh, well, you know, Jebel el Laws, you know, in Midian, you know, I think that's Mount Sinai, and that's south of Canaan. So that's what, that's what those passages are talking about. Sorry, they're not. Again, they use specific geographical terms, Haran, Timon, Seir, and Edom. So either the association with Midian in Exodus 3.1, and at least another passage, for Yahweh's abode is reconcilable with those other places, or we have contradicting traditions. So there, there's, there's a real issue here. These other places are a good bit to the north, again, of where people typically want Sinai to be, either the traditional location, way, way, way down the Sinai Peninsula, at the V of the two forks of the Red Sea, right in there. Or again, as, as th- this idea comes and goes, but the idea that Sinai is in Saudi Arabia at Jebel el Laz, which is to the east, you know, about, I don't know, midway, maybe, maybe a, a two-thirds of the way up the fork, the right-hand fork of the Red Sea, the, the Gulf of Aqaba. Again, those other places are a good bit north, uh, or excuse me, they're, they're a good bit south to Edom, Timon, Paran, and Seir. So we have to figure out either a way to, to reconcile some of this stuff, or we've got contradictions. Now, I'm going to suggest that there's a way to understand all of the data collectively. But the way that I'm going to suggest undermines both the traditional view of Sinai and the Jebel el Laws location of Sinai. Both of them, I think, go out the window. If you are going to try to reconcile holy mountain, you know, Sinai Horeb stuff with Yahweh coming from the south, both of those locations are too far south of Timon, Paran, Seir, and Edom. They just are. It just doesn't work. So this is another reason why I said, if you think, you know, if you come across people, I know for sure where Mount Sinai is. If they are not dealing with the passages we're going to deal with today that have Yahweh coming from these regions that are much farther north, but of course still south of Canaan, if they're not dealing with these passages, you can politely dismiss them because they have not dealt with important data. So I'm, I'm hoping that, again, that being the case is going to be clear. Now, you might ask, well, why bother you know, with all this? I mean, again, we're into the weeds here. And for me, there's three reasons. I think we do need to be faithful to the details of the text and offer a coherent resolution to what seems on the surface contradictory. At least some think it's contradictory. And I'll, I'll add that, that if we do that, the resolution that I'm going to offer here will also be helpful in the next episode next week with the Kenite uh, hypothesis, uh, you know, that, that whole issue. Second, I would say I'm hoping that this will convince listeners to not get sidetracked on rabbit trails like the idea that Mount Sinai is in Arabia or that determining the location of Mount Sinai has any theological importance. It really doesn't. I think those are distractions that can grow into dogma as though something crucial has been discovered. There's nothing crucial here in the way of theology or eschatology or anything like that. The reality is that it's pretty unlikely that either the traditional location of Mount Sinai, again, deep in the Sinai Peninsula in the V of the two prongs of the Red Sea, otherwise known as Jebel Musa, or the alleged Mount Sinai in Arabia, Jebel al Laws, it's really unlikely that those are the real locations of Sinai. Again, if you care, and I do, and I'm not the only one, if you care about reconciling the mountain of God idea, again, Horeb Sinai, with the tradition of Yahweh coming from the south, then both of those locations are just not going to work. And I do care. I think it's important that all of the data be reconciled. And again, that issue itself might be new to listeners, but again, it's in your Bible. I don't write the stuff. This is just the reality of the text. We have to deal with it. Third, I think the point needs to be made that, again, the Yahweh from the South traditions can't be ignored, that they they not only need to be aligned with Exodus 3, but this is also an issue for what we're going to run into in Exodus 6.3. Let me just read you that verse where God says to Moses, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, El Shaddai. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Okay, that is actually wrapped up in the Yahweh from the South traditions. And here you have Moses, you know, in in a conversation with God, and you have that statement made. You know, critics have acted like the revelation of the divine name in Exodus 3, and that statement in Exodus 6, 3 justifies some sort of notion that there are separate, and this is a key word, utterly distinct origins for Yahweh worship. They act the same way with respect to Yahweh traditions from the South, Edom, Seir, Taman, Paran. And the descendants of Jacob in Egypt. The, the, the Bible presents us, I think, with a coherent picture, not one that should shock us into thinking Yahweh religion, again, another key term, originated somewhere other than with the Israelites in Egypt. The Bible's picture is that the deity is the same, but the names are different. And that the name revealed to Moses was already in use by an Abrahamic people, i.e. the descendants of Esau, doesn't undermine anything in biblical theology. I mean, that would be expected. The Old Testament picture is that Abraham's descendants went separate ways. The, the line of Jacob went one way, the line of Esau went another, because of the whole birthright issue. Now, it's quite logical that both lines knew the God of their father Isaac and their grandfather Abraham and continued to worship him. The real issues are how Yahweh name use is known in Edomite or Esau territory, but seems to be new in terms of Moses in Exodus 3 and in Exodus 6. Now, we'll get into that more in more detail in later episodes. Uh, we'll touch on it here. A short version, it's not impossible that the name Yahweh was known by Semites in Egypt long before Moses, who took it to the Edomite regions. I mean, there is a textual argument to be made specifically in Egyptian texts 
that the name Yahweh was known among Semites in the Sinai region, uh, like in mines, you know, mine, mining contacts and whatnot. And you know, it's conceivable that some Semites knew the name Yahweh there and took it up north into Edom, Seir, Paran area. I mean, that, there's, that's not impossible. I mean, the name does show up you know, in Egyptian material uh, associated with you know, this, this region. So you know, Exodus 3 doesn't undermine that. You might say, well, Exodus 3 might undermine it. It sounds like Moses didn't know the name. Well, let's not forget where Moses was raised. He was raised in Pharaoh's household right after being weaned. Yes, he knew who he was ethnically. He knew he was a Hebrew. But it's quite possible he didn't know the name Yahweh. Why would Pharaoh's household, why would the people there be teaching him about that? He's not trained by his mother. His mother has him until he's weaned, and then he is in Pharaoh's household. It's quite conceivable. Again, while he knows what his ethnicity is, that he, does, he has not heard the name of Yahweh. That, that's possible. Uh, again, his break with Egypt, if you read the Moses story, is about injustice toward his people. He didn't like the fact that they were enslaved. It's not about religion. Moses doesn't break from Pharaoh's household because of religion. Okay, he, he's upset at what is happening to his ethnic kindred, and then he gets into trouble by murdering a man. And he escapes to Midian, where again, providentially, he runs into descendants of his forefather Abraham, who do happen to know the God of their fathers by the name Yahweh, historically. And then the name is revealed by God himself to Moses. This is a, this is a quite, you can take all this data, and you don't have to talk about, oh, well, this, this source used this name, and this source used that name. And, and you know, the dirty little secret of Yahweh religion is that you know, the people, the descendants of Jacob and Esau, they never heard of Yahweh. And, you know, this is a different God than, than what we see in the South in Edom and Paran. And they knew the name Yahweh. Yahweh or religion has its origin somewhere else. And the Bible is trying to cover this up. Or, you know, look, this is a quite understandable picture. It's just, this is the kind of thing that source critics love to, what's the right word? They love to grab it and then leverage it in all sorts of ways. It's quite unnecessary. And you know, if you listen to this podcast, I'm not an opponent of editing in the Torah. Okay. How many times do I have to say this? I'm not an opponent of that. But typically what happens is source critical theory exaggerates and overstates data. And I think this is a good example of it. Again, it is quite conceivable that Moses had not heard this name, but he had heard of the God of, of his fathers at some point. You know, I mean, he knew who the, the Hebrews were. Again, the, the name could have been, re, you, know, you know, circulating in Egypt, you know, at least among, you know, the slaves working the, wine, the, the, the mines in Sinai. Again, you, you, you do see this uh, with certain, at least one people group that are associated with the Negev and, and with, you know, the, up, up, even upward north you know, to the regions we're talking about here, Edom and Paran and Taman. You know, again, they're still part of the line of Abraham, and you know, they, they have this name, and maybe Moses doesn't. Now, I say all of that to say this. Exodus 6.3, which, which generates a lot of this discussion that Moses didn't know the name, may actually not be translated the way it should be. I've commented on this on my blog, that Exodus 6.3, if you follow the work of Francis Anderson, specifically in his book, The Sentence in Biblical Hebrew, translates this quite different, where you don't have Moses not knowing the name. You have the opposite. And that's a, that's a little factoid that is almost never mentioned in the discussions of Exodus 6.3. Almost never. It, it's really rare. But Francis Anderson, again, I think he's still alive. This is, this is the Anderson of Anderson Forbes, the database that we developed where I work uh, at Logos. Francis Anderson is a premier Hebraist. That, that's probably the, a, a humble way to, to, to describe him. There are few who know their Hebrew as well as Francis Anderson. And so his work in this verse ought to be taken seriously, but it's rarely even mentioned. Because again, people, writers, scholars want to leverage an idea, source criticism, alternate hypothesis for, for Israelite religion, you know, whatever the case may be. That's just the way it is. So, so all of this is preliminary. I mean, we're going to get into the weeds again here in Exodus 3, but I'm, I'm telegraphing some of the things that we're going to run into. And some of what we'll do in this episode will actually, again, factor into some of that discussion. But for the sake of our episode at this point, I think it's really important that the Yahweh of the South traditions be reconciled, uh, be, be understood alongside of passages like Exodus 3 and the Horeb and the Sinai traditions. I think they need to be understood together, and they can be. But if you do that, you really can't have Mount Sinai being in the, in the southern Sinai Peninsula at the traditional location. And the Jebel El Law's location doesn't really work well either. Uh, that one, you know, it's not impossible uh, for it, it to work. I would say it's, you know, it, it's really, really, really unlikely. Uh, and that means that you'd have to come up with some other mountain. And, and there have been lots of proposals for Mount Sinai. It's not just those two. And, and my, my gut would tell me uh, that if you're going to take this, the Yahweh from the South tradition seriously, one of those other possibilities might be the right one. So let's just jump in here. Uh, to refresh your, your memory, again, Exodus 3.1, now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And as I mentioned in a previous episode, the verse is typically read as though Moses is tending his father-in-law's flocks in Midian. And so the mountain of God seems to be in Midian. If you're, if you're doing the Jebel El Laws thing, that's the way you have to read this, that Sinai is in Midian. But the verse may also not be read that way. Uh, again, the verse could be very obviously saying that Moses left Midian and journeyed a little ways to the west. We actually do not know where in Midian Moses was. And, that, and that's a problem. I mean, Midian's a, a pretty big area. We don't know exactly where he was. And if we're going to read it as Moses goes somewhere else and then he comes to the mountain of God, well, that opens the door to, to you know, other possibilities. You have to decide to read Exodus 3.1 in a specific way to have Moses tending his flocks in Midian at Mount Sinai. And this is what the movie does, the Ten Commandments movie. If you remember the Ten Commandments movie, it's like Mount Sinai is like you know, a couple hundred yards you know, from where you know, Moses is and where, where you know, he and Zipporah are living. You know, there's nothing in the text that tells you that. 
Nothing at all. So all we've got is Moses is somewhere in Midian. The text is clear that he leads the flocks, quote, to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb. He has to go, so he has to, t- has to make a journey to get to the mountain of God. That's what it says. It doesn't say that he was already at the mountain of God, like the Ten Commandments movie have, uh, has it. Like it, doesn't, it, it. The verse doesn't suggest that Moses had to lead the flocks of Jethro a few hundred yards. No, it, it, I think it's much more coherent to say Moses had, had to take him somewhere else. And that somewhere else, to the west of Midian, is where we find this mountain of God. That's where Moses' encounter with Yahweh occurs. Now, that's important to keep in mind that Moses has to essentially leave Midian, or at least leave the part of Midian where he was, which again, we don't actually know precisely where that was. You know, where Jethro lived. Okay, we don't know where that is. We just know it's in Midian. It's a big area. But the fact that he has to leave and he winds up going west, well, again, we, we know he's not at Jebel el Laws because if he went west, he'd run into the Gulf of Aqaba, the ocean. Okay, it's not, it's not a wilderness where you're going to you know, have herds, okay? So that, that's an absurdity. So he, he, he's going to have to go beyond the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba somewhere. He's going to have to go north and northwest. You know, the, the west would be you got to clear the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, the right prong of the Red Sea, and now you're in, you're, you can find some area where you, you can take your flocks, okay? So that much we know. Well, if you go far enough north, you're in. Paran, Timon, Seir, Edom area. I mean, there, there's a place where Midian blurs into Edomite territory to the north. And if it's a little, if it's northwest, it's also going to blur into Canaanite, you know, Canaan territory. Again, we just don't know where, nobody's out there with surveyor's poles and marking land, okay? But these three regions, Midian, Edom, again, Seir, and the Paran, Timon area, there's going to be a place where they're, they're basically kind of on top of each other, one to the north, one to the northwest, okay? And so you, you can imagine very easily that Moses would have taken the flocks northward, you know, from some point in Midian. And frankly, since we know that Moses wasn't like living at Jebel el Laws, okay, that, that's not where he was, because if he goes west, he's going to run into salt, you know, he's going to run into the Red Sea, okay? So he's probably somewhere already north in Midian, and then he would have migrated west, just like Exodus 3 1 says. He took the flocks to the west, okay? The edge of the, the, the side of the wilderness, okay? West side of the wilderness, you know? So, so he, he's already going to be up there, and the move west again could take him into where these other areas converge. And we have to use our imagination because we aren't. We aren't given latitude and longitude in Exodus 3 or anywhere else. We're given approximations. But again, my concern is that we take the material of Exodus 3 and passages like it, and then the Yahweh from the South traditions, we need, we need to understand them collectively. That's, that's important you know, for consistency. Now let's refresh our, our memory a little bit as to you know, what you know, Midian was. So you know, Moses is somewhere in Midian. Again, the place of encounters associated with Paran, Timon, Seir, and Edom. So we have, uh, like, I think I read this last time or a previous episode from Sarna in his Exodus commentary, the Midianites ranged over a wide area of the Near East, stretching from the eastern shore of the Gulf of Aqaba up through the Syro-Arabian Desert and into the borders of the land of Israel, west and northwest of Eilat. Now, Eilat is right at the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, the right prong of the Red Sea. And so Midian is, is sort of all of that. And again, that helps orient us. If you need the map, you know, please look at it. Now, how, how would we start to kind of pull all this stuff together? You don't know what the Yahweh from the South Passages are because I haven't read them. I'm going to do that now, but just be thinking about Midian. Thinking about the map or looking at the map, you've got the Red Sea, the two prongs, the right-hand prong is the Gulf of Aqaba. The tip of that is Eilat. Midian is going to be to the east of that and also, again, to the north of that, the west and the northwest of Eilat. So right when you clear the tip, again, Moses is somewhere in there. Midian's going to encompass a good part of what we call today the Arabian Peninsula, where Saudi Arabia is. And he's going to be somewhere in there, and he's going to move to the west, you know, to, to the west of the wilderness, all right? So he, he's moving you know, either west or northwest. Okay, we, we, again, we don't, we don't have latitude and longitude. But that's going, to, that's going to move him into the areas where Midian touches, you know, overlaps with, you know, the, the borders are fuzzy with these southern places, Paran, Timon, Seir, Edom. Now, let me read you a few passages. Deuteronomy 33.1 says, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death. He said, the Lord, Yahweh, it's the divine name, came from Sinai and dawned from Seir, S-E-I-R, upon us. Let me repeat that. The Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. Oh boy. <laughs> Not only do you have Sinai linked to Seir, which is, again, this Edomite region south of Canaan, but we have Mount Paran as the place that Yahweh came forth from. Well, I thought it was Sinai. Oh, I thought it was Horeb. Well, the answer very well may be, yep, yep, all of those terms could apply to the same place. They could. Now, critics, of course, want to split them all out, uh, you know, as though they must be different places. They don't have to be different places. I mean, in theory, they could be. You know, then you'd have different conflicting traditions. Again, this is where they want you to go. But they don't have to be, is the point. They don't have to be. Again, Mount Paran, if you read this verse, would be the same as you know, Mount Sinai, which would be Horeb. So, but, but where is that? Well, I don't know. Neither does anybody else, is the point. Again, you can't reconcile the traditional location of Sinai with Deuteronomy 33, 1 and 2. Because the passage reads, again, pretty transparently, that Sinai is associated with Seir and Mount Paran. These regions are, are south of Canaan. So they, these, these are part of a, of a matrix of, of passages, matrix of ideas, really, uh, in biblical scholarship that, are, that scholars call the, the Yahweh from the south traditions. Okay, you, you know, and, and Midian, sorry, but Jebel el Oz is not in Seir and it's not in Paran. It just isn't. Let's go to Habakkuk 3. God came from Timon. This is verse 3, Habakkuk 3, 3. I'm going to read 3 through 7. God came from Timon 
and the Holy One from Mount Paran. There it is again, just like it was in Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand. By the way, that language, some of that is reminiscent of Deuteronomy 33. Okay. There he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. Here's verse 7. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. So now this brings Midian into the picture, also with Timon and Paran. And there's only one way you can do that. Again, to have, to have this, whatever's happening here and whatever peak this is, that it's in some area that it could be perceived as Midian and Seir, and we're going to get Edom. Again, these, these places converge or overlap. And again, when I, when I say that, you can't be thinking of like maps of countries today where there are strictly defined borders. You, you just don't have that. Again, these, these, are, these, are, these are regions that, that don't have that level of precision as to their border lines. There's a fuzziness to all this. Okay. And the passage, Habakkuk 3, associates Mount Paran, which Deuteronomy 33, 1 and 2 link to Sinai and Seir. It links Paran to Midian. So Timon, Paran, and Seir, and Midian are somehow interrelated. Now, this is possible, again, if by Midian we mean that northernmost, northwesternmost parameters, where it borders Edom to the north and southern Canaan to the west. And by the way, I would think that if you took that, if you thought about that, then you read Exodus 3, 1, where you have Moses taking his flock to the west side of the wilderness. You, you can reconcile those things. Again, especially since we don't know where Moses' starting point was. He could have been due east of, of, of where all this is happening, and then he moves, due, he moves straight west. We don't know. We just know from these descriptions, the Yahweh from the South traditions, which, which again, link Midian into this, you know, some portion, some, some part, perceptively, of Midian, with these southern regions, Edom, Seir, Paran, Timon. Judges 5 is another one of these, 4 and 5. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. So there you get, there you get apocalyptic, you know, this, this, this uh, cataclysmic language that we just read. We just read from Habakkuk 3, where God was coming from Timon and Mount Paran. But now we get Seir and Edom. The earth trembled. The heavens dropped. The clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. That's Judges 5, 4, and 5. Now this passage juxtaposes Seir and Edom and once again makes Sinai part of the picture. Verse 4's association of Seir and Edom, of course, makes sense because Seir, according to the archaeological encyclopedia of the Holy Land, was the name of a mountainous region southeast of the Dead Sea. And if you're looking at the map, you're, you're going to see that. It was formerly inhabited by Horites, Genesis 14, 6. And boy, isn't that interesting. And we, we can't really get into the people groups here or in the next few weeks either. Formerly inhabited by the Horites where Esau lived later. Esau lived later. Okay, I, I can't resist it. Go back and read Deuteronomy 2 and 3. <laughs> okay, I'll get that spasm out of the way. Uh, where Esau lived later. Again, this, this area identified with Edom in Genesis 36, 8 and following. So how are we to deal with the data? Now, we, 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 you know, we got three passages here. I would say, you know, just in, in basic terms, there's no way to get the traditional site of Sinai near Edom. So I, I'm not a believer in the traditional site, Jebel Musa, for being Mount Sinai. I also don't think there's a way to get Jebel el laws into Edom or near Edom because it isn't. It's farther down, you know, adjacent to the Gulf of Aqaba, you know, in, in sort of, you know, in that portion of Midian. It's just not, it's not in Edom. It's not near Paran or Taman. So my suggestion is, let's stop trying to defend either of these views. Here's a proposal. Again, it's sort of like a working hypothesis, and then we'll, you know, we'll get into some of the nuts and bolts of it here. I would say that, that maybe this is what happened. And this is a working hypothesis. It's a, it's, a, it's a working process as well. Moses leaves Midian proper, which is east. And again, we don't know where he is, possibly even already north of the Gulf of Aqaba, northeast of the Gulf of Aqaba. He's somewhere in Midian up there. He takes Jethro's flocks westward or northwestward. He's going to be clear the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba where Elat is located. And he's moving again westward or northwestward, at least slightly, you know, to honor Exodus 3, 1, the language there. He winds up somewhere in the vicinity of the northwest fringe of northern Midian, where Midian borders the southern border of Canaan, and where it also blurs into the land of Edom. And look at the map. It is somewhere in this location, somewhere in this region, where all these things are possible, all these things are in play, that Moses encounters Yahweh on a mountain, variously called Sinai or Horeb. We saw last time that Horeb, again in a previous episode, Horeb may simply refer to a dry area. That's what it means. May simply refer to a dry area that included a mountainous region. As Sarna said, Horeb may have been the name of a wider region in which Mount Sinai, a specific peak, was located. Again, and that Horeb could be in this, you know, this geographical region we're talking about. You know, Edom, Seir, all that. Because Seir, again, is a mountainous region, as we just read. You know, there, there's going to be some peak there that eventually lent its name to the entire area, perhaps. Horeb, again, means desolate or dry. But maybe Horeb becomes later associated as a term with the specific mountain in this region that could be spoken of as being somewhere you know, still associated with Midian up north, associated with Edom and Seir and Paran and Timon, that, that, that area. Okay, somewhere in that area, all this stuff happens. I'm going to take you back to um, Sarna a little bit again here. We've already mentioned that Horeb means desolate and dry. We read earlier Exodus 17, 1 through 7, and this is the incident at Rephidim. So we, we read that, uh, read it again, we'll just start from verse 1. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. There was no water for the people to drink. So then they cry out for water, so on and so forth. And then Moses cries to the Lord in verse 4, what am I supposed to do with these people? They're ready to stone me. And then God says in verse 5, the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff 
with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it and the people will drink. Now, again, this Horeb reference here, Sarna pointed out that if you look at the Israelite itinerary, you know, their, their journeyings, Rephidim was the last station of the Israelites before entering the wilderness of Sinai. So this place where they're at, Rephidim, which has this rock at Horeb, is not Sinai. It's the last station of the Israelites before entering the wilderness of Sinai. And then Sarna says, we may be dealing with different strands of tradition, or Horeb may have been the name of a wider region in which Mount Sinai, a specific peak, was located. Perhaps that peak eventually lent its name to the entire area. So, you know, this, none of that, again, the separation of, of Horeb from Sinai, that doesn't undermine, again, what I'm proposing about all of these terms being interrelated, because, again, the region itself might be what Horeb is referencing. And again, if, it's, if it is associated with Seir and Timon and Paran, Seir, again, is a mountainous region. You could have one specific peak somewhere, you know, in that geographical zone that we really can't define, but somewhere south of Canaan, because Yahweh comes from the south, somewhere that's still adjacent to Midian, so we can talk about Midian. And again, it's going to be north, possibly northwest of the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, okay? you, you, somewhere up there. You know, if, if you factor this in, we can, the, the hypothesis is still workable, that there's a you know, distinction between the mountain you know, Sinai proper and, and, and Horeb. Okay, good, fine. Dry place that later becomes known by a single, you know, who knows? Ultimately, who knows? What I'm trying to get you to see is that these disparate data points are not irreconcilable. There is a way that they can be imagined as functioning together and including inclusive of the Yahweh from the South traditions. Now let's go back to Exodus 3, 1 real briefly. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now the way ESV has that translated, it suggests that the mountain of God was called Horeb. But the Hebrew text actually doesn't require that and and might even contradict it. So again, we don't have to have Horeb even be specifically in this verse associated with a a singular peak. So this whole regional idea, and then by tradition, one part of one mountain in this region becomes identified. I mean, that's workable. But I just want to point out here in in this particular verse that ESV might be a little misleading, you know, unintentionally. The Hebrew has El Har Ha Elohim Korbah. Literally, it's he takes the flocks to the mountain of God, to Horeb. What we have here on the the proper name for for Horeb, this Chet Resh Bet, we have a He on the end. It's called a locative He. It denotes location. In Hebrew, sometimes the letter He, the H, is added to a noun to denote a you know, going to that place. It's, it's called the locative He. So Horeb might merely denote a dry place that Moses goes to. You know, he went to the mountain of God, to Horeb. So in other words, the mountain of God is in Horeb, but the mountain of God isn't necessarily named Horeb. It could very well be the understanding of Exodus 3.1, but the ESV doesn't give you that impression. And other translations as well. Again, consequently, why am I bringing it up? Because it's another factor here that if Moses left Midian and traveled to the mountain of God in or at this region, this place called Horeb, which was in a wilderness area or at least adjacent to one, that doesn't seem incompatible at all with Exodus 17, 1 through 7, where Horeb, dry area, and Sinai, the mountain, are not synonymous either. So they don't have to be synonymous in Exodus 3, 1, and they don't have to be synonymous in Exodus 17. Again, these things are compatible is the point. Now, there are other data that can be factored into this as well. And in the next two episodes, you know, we'll, we'll hit more of that, especially when we hit the Kenite issue and the revelation of the divine name. But I want to, you know, we're going to, again, say more about what I'm going to jump into now in those episodes, but I want to sort of get into it a little bit here. And that is with respect to Yahweh traditions, the name Yahweh in other places. Now I'm going to read from DDD. This is uh, the entry on Yahweh, where the author is uh, Vandertorn says, there are two Egyptian texts that mention Yahweh. In these texts from the 14th and 13th centuries BC, BCE is what he uses. By the way, that Again, the 13th century would be the, the late date uh, century. This is still, these two texts are going to still be too late for the early date of the Exodus. There are two Egyptian texts that mention Yahweh that date from the 14th and 13th centuries BCE. Yahweh is neither connected with the Israelites and in these texts, nor his, is his cult located in Palestine, i.e. Canaan. The texts speak about, quote, Yahu in the land of the Shasu Bedouins, unquote. The Egyptian is Ta Shasu Yahuwah. So the one text is from the reign of Amenophis III, which is the first part of the 14th century BCE. And the other one is from the reign of Ramses II, 13th century BC. Again, that's the late date, fair, late date option anyway. In the Ramses II list, the name occurs in a context, which also mentions, believe it or not, Seir. <laughs> oh, boy. It may tentatively be concluded then that this Yahoo in the land of the Shasu Bedouins is to be situated in the area of Edom and, of, and Midian, of course, the, the northern, northern, northwest edge of Midian. So you actually have a reference to Yahoo in Egyptian material in Seir, in Edom. Again, there you go. You know, it, 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 this, isn't, this isn't like explosive. This is in concert with the picture, again, my working hypothesis that I just you know, sort of you know, laid out. So another quote about this material, this is from Shavat, Mark Shavalis. This is from the Dictionary of the Old Testament Pentateuch in the Moses entry. He says, Yahu, Y-H-W, is also the name of a Shasu country in connection with Midian and Seir. These occur, again, these references occur in an Egyptian eponym list from the time of Amenhotep III, circa 1400 BC, and in a text dated to Ramses II, a century later. Some have seen them as consistent with the poetic language in the Bible associating Yahweh with the region of Sinai, Seir, Edom, Paran, Timon, and Midian. And then he references Deuteronomy 33.2, Judges 5.4, and Psalm 68. We didn't, we didn't read that one. 
Some have argued that the biblical Kenites, a branch of the Midianites, were the mediators of the Yahwistic cult, possibly by way of traders along the caravan routes from the south to the east. That's the end of the quote. Again, just another scholar, not only pointing out the Egyptian material, the, the reference to the name Yahweh in Midian and Seir, but also bringing the Yahweh from the South traditions into the picture. Again, this writer, Shavalis, is well acquainted with the fact that the Yahweh from the South traditions are part of this whole issue that we're talking about. Again, the, the Mountain of God traditions and the, you know, the divine name and all that sort of stuff. But there's more recent research on this. And I put this in the protected folder for those who are newsletter subscribers. This is a dissertation. It's available online, but I put it in the folder anyway. This is by Julianne Cooper, who is a, is a man. You might be thinking Julianne would be a woman's name, but Julianne with an E Cooper. Uh, who's at Yale now, but this was his PhD dissertation uh, from the uh, Department of Ancient History at Macquarie, I think I'm saying that correctly, University in Australia. And its title is Toponymy, a toponym, by the way, is a place name, Toponymy on the Periphery, Place Names of the Eastern Desert, Red Sea, and South Sinai in Egyptian Documents from the Early Dynastic until the End of the New Kingdom. That's his dissertation. Now, he says on page 185 that the, the place name, the Yahweh of the Shasu Bedouin, uh, he says, whether this place name can be used as evidence for an early cult, the early worship of Yahweh seems far from certain. And, and that's being honest. The name is at least used among a people, again, who are in the region of Seir, who by biblical standards would have descended from Esau. Again, they're still descendants of Abraham. But he's saying, you know, it's just a place name. We don't know that it's, it's evidence that Yahweh was actually worshipped there. Okay, that, that, that could be. I mean, we, we don't want to overstate the data. Um, it's just an interesting observation. But I wanted to bring Cooper into the conversation for a different reason. You know, while we're on the subject of etymology, what about the name Sinai? So Cooper, in his dissertation, discusses this name as well. On page 214, the other one was on page, I don't know if I gave it, 186, 185, 186. On page 214, Cooper writes this, the etymology of Sinai is usually explained through biblical Hebrew, Sena, the bush. Sena, Sena, is a name for bush, a word for bush. It actually shows up in Exodus 3, verses 2 and 4. So again, he's saying this is the way Sinai is usually explained as, as being a name derived from the place, you know, this, the burning bush incident, you know, where they, these bushes are, you know, and Moses has this encounter. However, he says, there's no consensus amongst biblical historians as to the etymology of Sinai. Connections to Semitic SN, tooth, Arabic Sina, stone, and Sin, the Mesopotamian moon god and the territorial entity of Sin, have also been proposed as equally valid as Sina, bush. So again, unpacking that paragraph, that's the end of the quote. What that means is that scholars have tried to figure out you know, where Sinai comes from, the term. The easiest and basically the most obvious is this, well, it comes from the passage, the, the bush there, Sina. But other, you know, others have tried to find a derivation from Arabic and Proto-Semitic, and then some want to say, well, no, it comes from the Mesopotamian moon god, Sin, and all that stuff, okay? But the context for this discussion in Cooper when he gets into this material, is an Egyptian term that is a hopox. That is a word that occurs one time in existing Egyptian texts. And it's chenhet in Egyptian. And Cooper theorizes, in, it's probably a Semitic loan word. It's, it's, a, it's a word that's brought into Egyptian from you know, a Semitic language. He says, in Semitic languages, the T, you know, the ch sound, the T underlined sound, corresponded to Semitic samek, which is the first letter in Sinai in Hebrew. Now, he goes on to discuss this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with him a little bit. I'm, I'm reading this because we have geeks in the audience who like this kind of etymological stuff. But also, if you read Cooper's material, you're going to be wondering what I think about this. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to just read a portion here. On page 214, he says, a difficulty with this connection, that is connecting it to Sana, the bush, but I'll admit his wording in the dissertation is a little bit ambiguous here. I'm going to assume he's talking about the bush. He says, a difficulty with this connection is accounting for the, the again, the, the final T in the Egyptian term, chenhet, which must be a suffix, possibly a feminine marker. And it, typically in Egyptian, the, the, the T at the end of a noun is, is the marker for a feminine singular noun. And my, com my comment to this is, why is that difficult? Sana is grammatically feminine and would have a T ending in the construct form anyway. So what's the deal? It, it's still the same grammatical gender. He continues you know, with what he's saying. In ancient Levantine toponymy, again, place names in the Levant, you know, the, the Fertile Crescent area, or you know, Syria, Palestine, the suffix T is witnessed in toponyms, place names, but its exact morphological role is not apparent. Rainy suggests it may be a nominal or adjectival marker. Wherever Chenhet was, it was a large area comprised of multiple kasut. Now, some of you who are paying real attention to the podcast know what that term is. The hekha kasut, the rulers from foreign lands. Again, this is what the Hyksos, you know, where the term Hyksos comes from, they were Semites. So lo and behold, we have Chenhet being a large area where there's lots of Semites there. Hmm. The only text where it occurs, again, Chenhet, the Egyptian term, mentions it in the context of, you know, he has a personal name there, which doesn't concern us right now. And it would seem to be in the environs of South Sinai or contiguous with Sinai. Now, this is me now. He's opining that on the basis of this personal name that he references, because the personal name he references happens to be from a text that talks about a mine in Sinai. So he's connecting these two things that don't necessarily be connected. If you have a large region where you've got Semites living, and again, you know, what's known as Sinai could extend on the basis of other texts, way, 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 way up north of the Negev, all the way up to, you know, to, to southern Canaan, then this is a conclusion. It's, it's a non sequitur, actually. It's, it's a conclusion that doesn't really follow the data. But he's making these, these comments based on this, on this parallel with this one Egyptian text with this property one that happens to be located in the southern Sinai. Now, he writes, an equivalence with the biblical Sinai is tempting on these grounds. But the caveat here is there's, there's about 1,000 years separating this toponym, this place named Chenhet, from the Sinai in the oldest biblical traditions, which he has here in 1,000 BC. Again, my comment here. Are we really to believe that no Semites used the term Sinai, Sinai, before the Hebrew Bible was written? Like, really? The term shows up in Egyptian texts from or near mines in the Sinai Peninsula, mines, mines which were you know, overworked by Semites. I mean, this is going to be part of the Semitic vocabulary before you get the Hebrew Bible written. So why it matters 
that the Egyptian text is older you know, than the biblical text, I don't see why that matters at all. Again, there's a difference between a spoken language and a written language. Okay, the spoken language is going to exist before it gets codified in writing. So again, this is another conclusion that just doesn't follow in his dissertation. But since you know, the, the, ch the chances are some of you are going to read this, I just thought I'd throw that in so you know what I thought. Now, my point here is that if you go out onto the internet, you know, when we're talking about the name Sinai, if you go on the internet, you have people writing about how Sinai was really a holy mountain to the moon god Sin. You're going to see that everywhere on the internet. You know, it's Middle Earth, okay? Know this. Know two things. One, that idea isn't new. Okay, there, there are scholars of, of you know, the pan-Babylonian era especially that, that propose this. And number two, there are quite coherent alternatives. So you're going to you know, you're, you're have people you run into that read this stuff, and they're going to think they've stumbled onto something you know, like the, this deep, dark secret of the Bible that you know, your, your, your church humanity you know, tried to you know, shield you from and all this nonsense, okay? You, you can find this in, in sort of antiquarian scholarship. And they'll, and they'll use, again, that material again for the 19th century, early 20th century. But the reality is that there are quite coherent alternatives that have nothing to do with the moon god sin, as far as the name Sinai. So let, let's just point that out, and that, that's, that's another freebie, just kind of you know, prepping you with that. Another thing that I put in the folder is an article by G.I. Davies, and it is entitled, The Significance of Deuteronomy 1-2 for the Location of Mount Horeb. Now, Deuteronomy 1-2 says this. Well, let's go back to verse 1. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness, in the Arabah, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Lavan, Hazarot and Dizahav. It is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. That's the verse that, that, that matters here. It is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Now, Davy's article I have put into you know, the protected folder. Again, some of you might want to read it. It's important because it's one that raises important issues for thought, but I find it personally unpersuasive for a couple of reasons. And in case you read it, I want you to know what those reasons are. And you'll probably be able to figure these out on, on your own anyway. But the first one is that, I mean, what, let me just cut to the chase. Davies goes through all this data about determining you know, where you can go, for, how far you can get in 11 days you know, from this point or that point. And he uses this to argue that the best location of Mount Sinai is the traditional site. Because you know, on average, it would take, you know, you know, and he has a number of standards for this. Like he, he, he looks at old you know, travel records. He looks at ancient records. He looks at modern you know, caravan you know, records and archaeologists going from one point to, to the next. Basically, you can travel about 20 miles a day or something like that in you know, 2022. And he says, well, 11 days, that's going to put you, you know, up in at Kadesh Barnea. And that's like 11 days from the, the southern, the traditional site of Mount Sinai. So that, that's the, the best you know, candidate for location. The other ones are, are, too, are too close for the 11 days. All right. So that, that, that's just in a nutshell. The, I disagree with that. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. But the article is still important because of the things it makes you think about. So my, my, a couple of reasons I think that this is a little wrongheaded is that it doesn't work really with the geography of the Yahweh from the South traditions. And those are important. You have to factor them in. And he doesn't. Okay. His calculations of how many miles can be traveled in a day all assume all of them, you can read the article, they all assume that the travelers are adult males, either soldiers or civilians. They don't assume large numbers of women and children and larger than normal herds. Now, I will grant, and when we get to this part of Exodus, you'll, I'll explain why, I will grant that the Israelites may not have been in the millions. I don't think they were. But the nation was considerably larger than your, than your normal caravan that Davies is doing his calculations by. His calculations do not conform to the conditions described in the Exodus itinerary. And I still think the point of Deuteronomy 1 and 2 is that it took the Israelites 11 days to go from one point to the next. Not that that the 11 days allows for some calculation of mileage. I think it's just, it's a report. It took us 11 days. Moving tens of thousands of people, at, and at a minimum, with at least half of those tens of thousands of people being women and children, along with the flocks, simply cannot be calculated by normal caravan travel. And that's what Davies is doing. To really know how far the Israelites could get in 11 days, during 11 day times, you need to assemble 30 or 40,000 people, have half of them be women and children, and then add thousands of head of goats, sheep, cattle, and, you know, et cetera, and then have a go at it. That's what you need to do. You're not getting very far, to be honest, because you're going to have to be stopping to water the flocks. You're going to have to be stopping at places. I mean, people can carry water. You're not going to be carrying water for flocks. I mean, like everybody's got, what, 50 pounds of water on them? I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. So Davy's calculations, while they might on the surface seem impressive, do not conform to the conditions that, that we're dealing with, with, with the Exodus travel. Secondly, he also assumes that Seir and Edom are not the same area. He's aware of some of these verses, obviously, in, in the article. And he, then, but then he'll gravitate to places where Seir is like a, a different place or a neutral term that doesn't overlap with Edom. You know, and then he'll say, see, you know, we got to keep them separate. And then he'll talk about the ones where they're, they're obviously together, like the March of the South passages we read. Then, then he'll, he'll, he'll say something like that they were put together, you know, because of, you know, sources. I mean, he, he does the source, critic, the source critical tango to divorce Seir and Edom from the equation that he uses. Yeah, I just don't think it's, it's a legitimate method. Frankly, I don't think Deuteronomy 1 to really helps us at all. I don't think it helps resolve anything. And it doesn't really help. I think that the whole point is that it took us 11 days from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir okay, to get to Kadesh Barnea. You know, again, it's not like you can make a, a coherent calculation from that because we just don't have the parameters to do that. So I wanted to mention that just in case some of you read that. So we're here at the end of our episode and we're going to come back to some of these things later when we get to the Sinai scenes of Exodus. But I wanted to, again, you know, say some things about, especially in this episode, the need for honoring both Exodus 3 and Exodus 17 and the, and the, the march from the South traditions. We need to, to not blunt or ignore or dismiss or dichotomize you know, one set of data from other, you know, other parts of other points of data. These things need to be and can be understood together. And again, if you, if you care to do that, and I do, 
and again, hopefully you understand why at this point, because those passages about the March from the South do, they, they are explicitly connected to Sinai and Midian, Exodus 3. I mean, they, they just are. So we have to take these things in tandem to sort of frame a picture of what's going on in Exodus 3, 1, and in these other passages, where, where Moses is at. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you care to do that, you either have to do what Davies does and just say, oh, these don't matter. You know, they're, they're later or they're the result of some you know, editorial snafu or whatever. We're not going to count them. You basically either cheat or you try to, again, honor all of the data. And if you do that, I don't see how the traditional location of Mount Sinai can work. And I also don't see how Jabal al-Laws works. I think we're dealing with a different location. That, frankly, my answer is, we don't know. We don't know where Mount Sinai, which, which mountain it was. We just don't know. Now, at this point, some of, well, well, Jabal al-Laws, there's, there's like you know, burnt tops of the mountain and, and there, it's, there's evidence for volcanic activity. So what? Why do we think we need a volcanic mountain? See, people assume that because they want a natural explanation to the fire of God's presence on Sinai. You know, frankly, if you're a theist, you don't need a natural explanation for the fiery presence of Yahweh on a mountain. You don't. But somehow, you know, the, this naturalistic explanation is adopted by defenders of Jabal al-Laws when they would reject it for the plagues or some other miracle or something like that. It's just at this point, it, it helps them make the argument for the, for the location that they want. And what I'm here to say is I, I believe that's inconsistent and, and frankly unnecessary. And what about, what about those, those pictographs of cattle? You know, they like the... You know, when the Israelites, you know, when Moses was up on the mountain, you know, they, they made a golden calf. Or we've got pictures of, of calves, you know, uh, Jebel al Laws, you know, and supposedly other sacred. I mean, I've seen the pictures. I don't really see some, some of what I'm, I'm told I'm seeing. And again, I'm aware of all these, but, you know, have those pictographs been dated? You know, there are experts. God forbid I would be one of them. You know, thank the Lord I'm not. But there are people who spend their entire lives studying rock art in Saudi Arabia and, of course, other places in the world. And there are ways to date these things. So my first question is always well, those pictographs that you, you, you say are proof of, of the, you know, the, the events of the Exodus, and you know, this, is, that this is Mount Sinai. Where's the dating analysis of them? I can tell you right now, Jebel Allah is getting the promotion of this. And I, I, used to, I used to like this theory until I realized, it, really until I saw the problems that were associated with it as I went on. I, for a long time, I've not believed in the traditional site, and I liked the Jebel Allah site for years. But then when you really drill down into it, especially the, the Yahweh from the South traditions and a few other things we'll talk about when we get to, to, to these other episodes in Exodus 3, it has serious problems. Even, even Paul's reference in Galatians 4 to Mount Sinai in Arabia. You know, I hate to just, again, pour water on this, but there's a text critical issue there. It may not even be in the original text. Okay, I mean, there are just things like this that when you drill down, you realize how uncertain they are. And Arabia, again, is a, is a vastly elastic term anyway in the, in the first century period, you know, Greco-Roman understanding. There's just, so many, there's just so many things that can go wrong, so many things that are assumed and not proven. And the pictographs is, is just another in a long list of these things. Where, where's the date for them? Can we date those things? Did you even check? You know, and, and please don't bring in you know, Ron Wyatt at this point about the Egyptian chariot wheels, you know, near the, you know, this or that crossing and whatnot. Um, and frankly, you can still have, you know, a Nueva crossing or you know, some other kind of crossing. That, that really isn't the issue because the Israelites could have kept going, you know, into, into the area where, you know, we're looking at. They, they could have crossed something at the tip of Aqaba. I mean, who cares? You know, but, the, but if you're depending on Ron Wyatt data, you're, you're just not wise. Okay. His stuff has never been tested. It's never been pulled out for testing. We have shapes of things that may or may not be Egyptian chariot wheels. You're, you're, and I also hope you realize that Egyptian chariot wheels, the design of them differed in different eras. Okay. And there ought to be hundreds of them. Not just two or three, and they're probably not chariot wheels to begin with. But again, I, I digress. You know, again, if you really want to prove it, pull one out and have it dated, have it tested, have it analyzed. But but Wyatt and others just simply don't do this stuff, or they'll claim to have found something that's now disappeared. You know, the dog ate my you know inscription. The dog ate this. The dog ate that. The Saudis took it. The Saudis stole it. Well, that's convenient. Again, you've got to do better than that. I mean, especially as Christians. As Christians, if we want to to do this kind of research, especially if there's an apologetic bent to it for some reason or along some trajectory, you just have to be more honest than this. You just have to be. Because if it's so, if it's easily underminable by very simple, straightforward, frankly, very obvious questions, hey, do we have a date for that? That, that specimen thing? Do we actually have it here that we can look at? You know, if it's always no and it's missing, the arguments are no better than the kind of stuff that you get with ancient aliens talk. Now that might sound harsh, but but honestly, that's where it's at. I meet people all the time, you know, through through email mostly that, you know, will, will show me things where people belittle faith in Christianity because of poor scholarship and the poor reasoning that Christians do in areas like this. And yeah, I'll grant you that the atheists they, they do a lot of poor reasoning too. We have a lot of poor scholarship too. But my point is that we shouldn't. So I'm hoping, again, that you see the complexity of something as simple as Exodus 3.1. And, and now you may have a new thing to factor in, the Yahweh from the South traditions. Again, these are all important. They are all in Scripture. They are all pertinent to the same events, the same you know, issue as far as you know, Yahweh and, the, and the, the, the knowledge of Yahweh in a given geographical part. They're all important. And we need to honor all of the data and struggle with it. And that's what Bible study is about. That's what Bible study is about. It's not about looking for quick answers and proof texts. You know, if that's what you want, you're not really doing Bible study. You're doing something else. And it could turn around and, and bite you in the theological butt, or it could you know, have a worse effect when, again, people aren't willing to listen to you about something that really is important, like the gospel, but you have not gained a hearing with them because of poor research in some other area. And that's a shame. It's a shame that, that those two things get married in the minds of some people, but they do. So we need to, again, be a little more circumspect about this. And as the next episodes we have on Exodus 3, parts 2 and 3, again, we'll get down into some more of these details and, and even, even more. Again, we're not done with Sinai once we get out of Exodus 3, trust me. 
that some of these other issues, some of the things we talked about even today will come back into our discussion. But again, I'm hoping that you see the complexity, but also, again, get an appreciation for you know, what's a distraction, what's not, and the need, again, to do good research. Well, yeah, we are in Exodus 3 still. You know, last time we, we did the whole Midian thing, you know, what, what, what's this about Midian and Horeb, you know, in Exodus 3, 1, and we tied that into the Yahweh coming from the South traditions in the Hebrew Bible in four or five passages. So I'm assuming if you're listening to this now, you have listened to that because I'm not going to repeat that. And I'm going to build on what we did last time. So if you have not listened to part one, you need to do that or some of the stuff here is going to be lost on you. But we want to focus this time on the Kenite, that's K-E-N-I-T-E, the Kenite hypothesis. And since the Kenites as a people kind of obscure in the Old Testament, are tied to the lineage of Cain. It's kind of interesting to you know, take a rabbit trail, a sidebar in the second half toward how the book of Enoch uh, looks at the genealogy of Cain, and specifically in relationship to linking Cain you know, to evil and the watchers and so on and so forth. So we're going to do two things in this episode. We're going to talk about the Kenites and the Kenite hypothesis, explain what that is and what the implications are, at least how they're perceived. And then the second part, we're going to do some of the, the Enochian crossover here uh, into the lineage of Cain. I think you'll, you'll find it interesting. I think you'll, you'll find both parts interesting, actually. So to jump in here by way of introduction, what is the Kenite hypothesis? This goes back to the late 1800s when um, a few scholars sort of drew attention to the Kenites and their lineages and how it overlaps with Midian and the Midianites. And then, of course, that takes you into an overlap with Moses and Jethro and all the things we talked about in part one. And once you do that, there, you know, it raises a question about, well, is it possible that, the, that Moses, I mean, this is, this is a, I'm going to use critical scholar speak here, okay? You know, scholars who and when I say critical, I'm not referring to critical thinking because all scholars, hopefully, you know, will use critical thinking. But critical scholarship is typically one that does not have a necessarily high view of scripture and is probably non-confessional. Um, you know, they don't assign any concept of inspiration, for example, to the text. And that's especially true when critical scholarship start, starts to come into its own in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and so on. It was about, again, around that time, late 19th century, that, that a few scholars raised the question based upon the Kenite, Midianite, Moses connections. Well, in, in view of the fact that Moses apparently, that's an important term, we're going to hit this next episode, apparently did not know the name of Yahweh. And we get that from Exodus 6.3. And typically, the way it's translated, it's pretty explicit there. We work where God says to Moses, by my name, Yahweh, I did not reveal myself to them, to the patriarchs. And then you get Exodus 3, where Moses says, essentially, hey, what's your name? You know, in this conversation with God, and God says, I am that I am. Okay, that, and this, this is where the divine name comes from. So certain scholars raise the question, well, maybe, maybe the Midianites worshipped Yahweh before the Israelites did. And Moses had to learn Yahweh religion from Jethro and from the Midianites and from the Kenites. Now, this sort of picked up steam later on when there were a couple of archaeological discoveries that did uh, locate the divine name in artifactual evidence in these areas, these geographical areas where the Midianites and the Kenites come from. So uh, the Kenite hypothesis has sort of been, uh, not, I don't know if it's, it's probably overstated to say it's a big deal because there are a lot of scholars who don't buy it uh, because they don't think Moses was at all historical. So that just sort of throws the whole thing out the window from the get-go. But it, it's still something that gets talked about in biblical scholarship. So by way of a sort of a, a well-written definition or overview, I'm, I'm going to read from Harper's Bible Dictionary here about the, the Kenites to get us into this whole, you know, what is this hypothesis? How does it work? And HBD says, uh, the Kenites are an ethnic group listed among the pre-Israelite inhabitants of the land of Canaan. So again, prior to the conquest, that means that there were people in the land called Kenites, okay? Their name, continuing with HBA, HBD, their name is popularly derived from Smith, as in like blacksmith, Hebrew, Kayan, Kayan, Kenite. Okay, you can, you can hear the, the similarity there. A theory supported but not proven by the fact that the Kenites lived in northern Sinai, a region of copper mining and smelting in ancient times. And then he gives the reference of Numbers 24, 17 through 22. Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, or Hobab, a priest of Midian, is identified in Judges 1.16 and Judges 4.11 as a Kenite. I'll read you Judges 1.16. The descendants of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palms into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev near Arad, and they went and settled with the people. Let me just look up Judges 4.11. We can read, read that one as well. We might as well since we're here. Judges 4.11. Now Heber, the Kenite, had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. Okay, that, that's the first part of the verse. So it, it's pretty, pretty explicit, pretty clear that you've got you know, the priest of Midian, Jethro, who's you know, part of the Kenites. Well, well, of course, Moses marries into that family uh, in the Exodus story. So back to HBD. In view of the fact that Moses first encountered Yahweh in the service of the priest Jethro, and since Jethro later blessed Moses and offered sacrifice to Yahweh and instructed Moses regarding delegation of authority, this is Exodus 18, it has been speculated by some scholars that Moses learned Yahwism from the Kenites, the so-called Kenite hypothesis. The evidence, however, is not adequate to support this view. So let me just stop there. HBD, again, is just being honest with us that there are a lot of people who just don't buy this. Um, and again, we'll get into sort of why, for what reasons they might not. Continuing with HBD, some Kenite families evidently accompanied the Israelites to the plains of Moab for the descendants of Moses' father-in-law, the Kenite, went up from the city of Palms, presumably Jericho, with the men of Judah to live among the people of the wilderness of Judah in the Negev near Arad. That's Judges 1.16. One Kenite family from this Negev community, Heber and his wife, Jael, or Yael, it's J-A-E-L in English, migrated north to settle in Za'ananim, near Kedesh probably just northeast of Mount Tabor. And Jael subsequently killed Israel's enemy Sisera in her tent. This is the famous story in Judges 4 and 5. 
In Saul's campaign against the Amalekites of northern Sinai, he sent word to the Kenites to separate themselves from the Amalekites. Saul wanted to spare the Kenites since they had shown kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. Okay, so there's, that's 1 Samuel 15, 6. And so when, when Saul is going to campaign against the Amalekites, he tells the Kenites to get out of Dodge because he perceives the Kenites, again, as, as being kind to Israel when Israel came up out of, out of Egypt. So there, even Saul knows at this point that there's some relationship uh, between the Kenites and, and the Israelites. I want to also quote a little bit from an article, and I'll put this in the protected folder. Uh, Marlene Mondrian, her, her uh, article is entitled, Who Were the Kenites? This is from Old Testament Essays, Volume 24, Number 2, in 2011. She writes, the Kenite hypothesis postulates that Moses was introduced to the cult of Yahweh before he was confronted by Yahweh from the burning bush. Scholars in support of the Kenite hypothesis advanced that these nomadic peoples from the regions south of Palestine venerated Yahweh even before tribes migrating or escaping from Egypt were introduced into the cult of Yahweh. And by the way, as I mentioned before in the podcast, when you read the word cult in uh, scholarly literature, you can substitute the word worship. Okay, That's all it means. It's not like a cult like we think of, but cult refers to ritual acts. So the worship of Yahweh. Back to Mondrian. In Numbers 24, 21 to 22, the name Cain is specifically associated with the Kenites. Now, that's going to be important. Again, Cain is associated with the Kenites, Kenites with Cain. Scholars have identified the Cain narrative of Genesis 4 as the possible etiological legend of the Kenites. Etiological is a word that means point of origin. And Cain, they've identified Cain as the eponymous ancestor of these people. In other words, the, the ancestor whose name they bear. Continuing with Mondrian, although presently not so much in the forefront of scholarly debates, the question of the origin of the Yahwist religion of the Israelites has as yet not been resolved. Scholars have thus reached no consensus regarding this contentious matter. So again, that's a nice way of saying, hey, you know, there's, this is a debate within scholarship. Now, there are questions raised uh, in brief from those short summaries. I want you to be thinking about these, these questions. Is it coherent to say that Moses got Yahweh religion from the Kenites? Okay, that, that's question number one. Question two, is it coherent to say that the Kenites introduced the worship of Yahweh to Moses? And third, are the Kenites scripturally and etymologically connected to Cain? So those are three questions to sort of be, have in your head as we start here. I'm going I'm to propose some other questions about what the implications of certain answers might be you know, for a, a person like you know, the, the people who listen to this, this podcast, those of us with a high view of scripture. You know, does, does, does any of this matter? And I'll propose a few questions uh, you know, momentarily here related to those kinds of issues. So just so we understand, though, when scholars raise these questions, they are not just fabrications. Okay? They're not just sitting there at their desks thinking, well, you know, how can I like, call the Bible into question? You know, what, what, what can I sort of suck out of my thumb you know, to you know, make the, the, sort of the, the face value story of the Old Testament to, to, to make that appear like it's not what it's supposed to be? That's not what they're doing here. These are questions that arise from the text specifically. The questions are raised by Exodus 3, which is the revelation of the name, the divine name to Moses in the region of Midian associated with the northern Sinai Peninsula, the area of Paran, Timon, Edom, again, where certain biblical passages have Yahweh coming from. And Habakkuk 3, 3 through 7, like we saw in the last episode, specifically loops Midian into that complex of ideas and that geography. There's also Exodus 6, 3. Again, the way the verse is usually translated, it seems clear that Moses had never heard of the name of Yahweh. So that generates, you know, this issue, this question. And thirdly, there is ancient material that shows the name Yahweh was known in the area of Edom and Midian. Now, as we talked about last time, these texts date to the 1300s BC or the 1200s BC, either nearly a century earlier than the time most scholars have the Exodus. Remember the late date? Late dates in the 1200s. So if you're taking the late date, which most scholars do, and you find an inscription, an Egyptian text, that has the name Yahweh in it, and you know, that's going to raise questions. Well, you know, they're not in the land yet, because one of those Egyptian inscriptions specifically situates you know, Yahweh or you know, of the Shasu Bedouin in the land of Yahweh and it, in Seir, which is, you know, again, one of, the, one of the place names where Yahweh comes from, from the south, Seir, Edom, okay, Paran, Taman, this area. So if you, if you look at that evidence, you're going to be thinking, oh, good grief, it looks like Yahweh was known earlier than the Exodus and not by the Israelites. I mean, it's a very logical question to ask. So again, they're not sitting there at their desk just thinking of ways to, you know, justify tenure or something, okay? They, these are real questions. Now, just to rehearse the DDD evidence a little bit more, there are uh, two Egyptian texts. I'm going to read again from DDD like I did last time. There are two Egyptian texts that mention Yahweh, and these texts, again, 1300s, 1200s, Yahweh is neither connected with the Israelites, nor is his cult, again, his, his worship, located in Palestine, Canaan, okay? The texts speak about Yahoo in the land of the Shasu Bedouins. The one text is from the reign of Amenophis III, that's the 1300s, and the other from the reign of Ramses II, that's the 1200s. In the Ramses II list, where this name, this place name occurs, the name occurs in a context which also mentions Seir. It may be tentatively concluded that the, the Yahoo in the land of the Shasu Bedouins is to be situated in the area of Edom and Midian. Again, this is why it's a question. Now let's get into the data here about the Kenites themselves. Now Mondrian writes this in her article, the Kenites were a nomadic or semi-nomadic tribe of coppersmiths. Think, or just hold that thought in your, in your head, coppersmiths, people who work with metal, okay? Who inhabited the rocky country south of Tel Arad, which was an important city in the Eastern Negev. As early as the 13th century BCE, they made their livelihood as metal craftsmen. Scholars have identified the Cain narrative of Genesis 4 again as the possible ideological you know, reference point to this. Now, if I go back to the HBD article, okay, remember that I read this line earlier. The Kenites are an ethnic group listed among the pre-Israelite inhabitants of the land of Canaan. Their name is popularly derived from smith, okay, like, like a blacksmith, or, you know, again, someone who works with metal, Hebrew kayan. So what we have here, right off the bat, in the name Kenite, which is spelled in Hebrew characters, I'll just give you the English, English letter names, Q-Y-N-Y. -Y. The name is Q-Y-N, 
Kyan, and then the Y on the end is called in Hebrew grammar a gentilic ending. It's a, you'd stick that little consonant there to turn a name into a people group. Okay, that's essentially what gentilics are. So you have Q-Y-N, Y ending, Kenites. The name Cain is exactly the same minus the, the gentilic ending. It's Q-Y-N, Kyan. So again, people who are, are working in the Hebrew text, they, they notice this immediately. Now, Rick Hess, again, we interviewed Rick uh, back in our, our series of SBL interviews. And Rick, Rick's specialty uh, is actually personal names in ancient texts, not just Hebrew, but you know, in Canaanite, Amorite. You know, he, he has a number of books and articles specifically on uh, personal names and topographical and place names. This is his thing. So in Anger Bible Dictionary, Hess wrote the article on Cain, and he writes this. Cain appears in Genesis 4 as the murderer of his brother Abel and as the progenitor of a line credited with the initiation of various aspects of culture. The name recurs in the Oracle of Balaam at Numbers 24-22 in a difficult text which associates Cain, Kyan, with the Kenites, again, Q-Y-N-Y. The name of Cain has its etymological root, Q-Y-N, which does not appear other than in proper names and gentilics in biblical Hebrew. A similarly spelled root occurs in South Arabian, okay, there we go, South Arabian personal, clan, and tribal names as early as the 5th century BC. And so we have a bit of a, bit of a chronological disconnect there, but this is where you get this kind of naming terminology in that part of, of the region. A QYN root occurs in later Aramaic and Arabic with the meaning of smith, again, someone who works with metal. Furthermore, a similar root appears in the gentilic with which the Balaam oracle associates the name Cain and Kenites. These people appear in the biblical text as smiths associated with the desert area of Israel's wanderings. Okay, so there we, you know, again, this is, this is all biblical data. It has, concludes with this line here. Compare Tubal Cain, the last mentioned figure in the line of Cain. He, he not only possesses Cain's name, but he is also described in the verse as a smith, again, someone who works with metal. So, Again, the, the biblical data are there. Back to Mondrian. Mondrian, again, just a brief note here. She says, according to Exodus 3.1, which is, again, where we're parked, and Judges 1.16, there is a clear connection between the Midianites and the Kenites. Exodus 3.1 refers to Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, as a priest of Midian, while Judges 1.16 names him as a Kenite. Cain and the Kenites are also linked in Judges 4.11, where Heber the Kenite is said to have separated from Cain. He's also identified with the sons of Hobab, the Kenite or Midianite, the father-in-law of Moses. So it really seems, again, that the biblical data are, are pretty clear as far as the, these connection points, anyway. And the location of the Kenites, again, in the southeast, on the border of where you know, Judah would be in the south of Canaan, right there, you know, where if you're, if you're under, again, the Dead Sea, when, when you start to move under the Dead Sea, you run into Edom. So there's this fuzzy border again. And of course, you know, south of, of Canaan, this is the region of Timon and Paran. And we, we saw last week, again, in Habakkuk 3, that th this sort of area is still connected with the Midianites you know, in some way. Again, you, you get this picture that, that you know, all these things converge again. And so once this archaeological data was discovered, you know, with, with, again, since most scholars take the late date of the Exodus, when you have Yahweh specifically said by an Egyptian to be a place name, a place name that includes the name Yahweh in this area, you know, in the time of Ramses, okay, then you have to wonder because, you know, even if, let's just say I'm a late dater and I think the Exodus happened in the reign of Ramses, again, there are problems with that. We've, we've talked about them in several episodes already, but let's, let's just throw it out there. You know, let's say the movie Ten Commandments, that that's the right, right thing. It's, it's still only going to be much later before the Israelites actually get into the land. I mean, you have to have the conquest. I mean, I mean, you, you at least have a, an encounter with Moses. But, but when you read, again, the biblical text at face value, when Moses shows up in Midian and he meets Jethro, and of course, you know, his daughters, it's like they already, they already know this. They already know the, the, the name Yahweh. So, you know, what Ramses, whoever wrote this text from the time of Ramses, it, it would seem that this was already a place that the Egyptians knew too. The Egyptian army and Ramses aren't in Exodus 3. They're not scouting out Midian and running into the name Yahweh. It's already there. So, again, the, these things just, just create the, these questions. So our sources, again, at least biblically, seem pretty clear to, to create these associations. But I've already mentioned that some scholars just don't buy, you know, into the connection. So we, we ought to say something about why before we, we go any further. Um, you know, it seems kind of obvious. So why, why would this be a debate? At, at, you know, just we'll take out the whole, you know, chicken or egg, you know, did Moses know Yahweh theological question, if it even is a theological question. We'll get to that in a moment, too. But let's just put that on the, to the side of the table here. If we're a bunch of scholars, we don't really care, you know, if, if what we think conforms to, you know, the, the Bible alone or, you know, we don't have a high view of scripture, something like that. Okay. And we're just looking at the data. Why, why would anybody doubt it? You know, the hypothesis anyway. Well, Fundamentally, some scholars doubt, and here's a key word, they doubt a historical connection between the Kenites and Cain. They say, yeah, I know the Bible, there's a Bible verse for that. But they don't consider Cain real, they don't consider Moses real, and so they, they just think that the verse is kind of made up. They don't consider any of this historical, they believe the biblical writer just heard the same sound between you know, the, the literary name Cain, and then the, the, you know, ran into some Kenites and heard, that, heard their name or, or knew the, the, the people group name, and just sort of made up a connection with the biblical text. They don't think any of it's historical, it's just literary and made up. So that's why they, they don't put they don't really care about the hypothesis. They don't put any stock in it in terms of real history. You know, and, and some of them even doubt that the Yahweh references in Egyptian texts. They think that, okay, there, there's a place and it has these consonants in it, YHW. That doesn't mean there was a religion of Yahweh there. You can't just take the occurrence of a name and say there's a whole system of worship there. And, and, and they're right on that point. You, you really can't do that. You can't take a place name and assume that there's a deity there who's, who's worshiped and has a, has a priesthood and a cult. You know, that exaggerates. It way overstates the data because the data is like two texts. Okay? And only one of them actually puts them in, in seer. Okay? So they're, they're right. I mean, the people who are, who are doubting this are right at this point. They just, they just don't think there's enough data to make these connections. Plus, they don't consider it you know, historical anyway. 
And so they just don't assign a whole lot of importance to it. Who cares if the Kenites come from Cain? The Hebrew Bible is still pretty clear. The Kenites were related to the Midianites. And so the Yahweh from the south of Canaan stuff, you know, Seir, Edom, Paran, Talon, these scholars would say, well, that's still valid. I mean, because there's, there's other things going on here in this Yahweh from the south tradition. That's pretty obvious. But, but why do we have to come up with this Kenite hypothesis about where the worship of Yahweh, the worship of Yahweh comes from? They'd argue that where our attention needs to be, again, is in the general Yahweh from the south stuff and not really obsessing about which people group, you know, told Moses, you know, again, because they don't, they don't believe there was a Moses. We, we don't really need to care about distractions like this. Let's just look at the Yahweh from the south traditions and go from there. Now, I'm going to illustrate for you kind of how this works. And I'm going to quote from Vandertorn's article in DDD. This is his article on Yahweh because it spends some time on the Kenite thing. Um, and you'll just see how Vandertorn, Vandertorn is, is a guy who he knows all the data. He's, he's, he's not going to be a believer in, in the historicity of, of Moses. I mean, I don't want to say for sure that I know that, but I've only met the guy once, but I, so I can't really tell. But if he's sort of a mainstream European scholar that, you know, nine chances out of 10, I'm going to be right here. He doesn't assign historicity to Moses, but he recognizes all the data. So how would he talk about this? Okay. And that's what the DDD entry, at least this part of it is, is good for. Just, just how, how, how do they think about this? So he writes, before 1200 BC, the name Yahweh is not found in any Semitic text. That's true. Yahweh was not known at, it's true if you exclude the Bible, okay? Yahweh was not at Ugarit either. I get email questions about this all the time. What about, you know, Yahweh came from the Ugaritic stuff and Ugarit, no, he didn't. He just didn't. There's like one guy in the world who claimed this and I think he's still alive. Nobody buys that. All right, this is a good example. Van der Torn is not an evangelical Bible believer that thinks the Bible's inspired. He thinks that's, that's just silly. Okay, so let's jump back in here. Yahweh was not known at Ugarit either. The singular name U, YW, vocalization unknown, in a damaged pa- passage of the Baal cycle cannot convincingly be interpreted as an abbreviation for Yahweh. The earliest West Semitic text mentioning Yahweh, again, accepting, except for the biblical evidence, is the victory stella written by Misha, the Moabite king from the 9th century BC. That's the Moabite stone. The absence of references to a Syrian or Palestinian cult of Yahweh outside Israel suggests that the god does not belong to the traditional circle of West Semitic deities. The origins of his veneration must be sought for elsewhere. A number of texts suggest that Yahweh was worshipped in southern Edom and Midian before his cult spread to Palestine. Again, Palestine is politically correct terminology for Canaan here, for Israel as a land. There are two Egyptian texts that mention Yahweh. In these texts from the 14th and 13th centuries BCE, Yahweh is neither connected with the Israelites nor is his cult located in Palestine. Again, we read those before. So he says here, in these texts, YHW is used as a toponym, place name. Yet a relationship with the deity by the same name is a reasonable assumption, but whether the god took his name from the region or vice versa remains undecided. By the 14th century BCE, before the cult of Yahweh had reached Israel, groups of Edomite and Midianite nomads worshipped Yahweh as their god. He's saying this is apparently what's going on. These data converge with a northern tradition. North of Edom and Midian would be in Canaan proper. Okay? Uh, these data converge with a northern tradition found in a number of ancient theophany texts according to which Yahweh came from Edom and Seir. Judges 5, Psalm 68, Deuteronomy 33, Habakkuk 3, again, we've been over all this turf. All of those places in those passages, Vander Torn writes, Seir, Mount Paran, Timon, and Sinai, Sinai are in or near Edom. If Yahweh was at home in the south then, because Edom is south of Palestine or Canaan, how did he make his way to the north? Like, like how did it, if it started here, how did it migrate north? According to a widely accepted theory, the Kenites were the mediators of the Yahwistic cult. In its classical form, the hypothesis assumes that the Israelites became acquainted with the cult of Yahweh through Moses. Moses' father-in-law, Hobab, according to an old tradition, was a Midianite priest who worshipped Yahweh in Exodus 18, Exodus 3, all that stuff. He belonged to the Kenites, Judges 1, 16 and 4, 11, a branch of the Midianites. Now, Van der Torn says, the strength of the Kenite hypothesis is the link it establishes between different but converging sets of data. The absence of Yahweh from West Semitic epigraphy, inscriptions, Yahweh's topographical link with the area of Eden, or Edom, excuse me, which may be taken to include the territory of the Midianites, the Kenite affiliation of Moses, and the positive evaluation of the Kenites in the Bible. So he says, all, all that makes sense. Then he adds, a major flaw in the classical Kenite hypothesis, however, is its disregard for the Canaanite origins of Israel. The view that under the influence of Moses, the Israelites became Yahweh's during their journey through the desert, and then brought their newly acquired religion. I, that's questionable. I hope you're following there. It, because it intentionally separates Yahweh from the, who the, the Israelites were worshiping while they were slaves in Egypt. But again, that's, that's mainstream scholarship. They're going to say that El, and El Shaddai, El this and that, you know, in the patriarchal narratives of the Bible, that, that was a different deity than Yahweh. Okay, that, again, they're assuming polytheism. Okay, they're assuming lots of things. So let me repeat that sentence of Andertorn. The view that under the influence of Moses, the Israelites became Yahweh's during their journey through the desert and then brought their newly acquired religion to the Palestinian soil re- neglects the fact that the majority of the Israelites were firmly rooted in Palestine. The historical role of Moses, moreover, is highly problematic. It seems more prudent not to put too much weight on the figure of Moses. It is only later, in later tradition, that he came to be regarded as the legendary ancestor of the Levitical priests and a symbol of the Yahweh alone movement. His real importance remains uncertain. If the Kenites, if the Kenite hypothesis is to be maintained, then it is only in a modified form. It's highly plausible that the Kenites and the Midianites, and he includes the Rechabites, and we didn't even get into them, may be mentioned in the same breath. Perhaps they introduced Israel to the worship of Yahweh. It is unlikely, though, that they did so outside the borders of Palestine. So he's he's a skeptic of this. Um, you know, he, again. If, Yahweh, if Yahwism did originate with the Midianites and Kenites, and the evidence seems to point in that direction, it may have been brought to the Transjordan, you know, brought to Edom and these other places by traders along the caravan routes from south to east. You might think, well, well that's kind of a wild card. Where, where does he get that idea? Well, we're going we're to bring this passage up a little bit later. He gets it from the Joseph story. Who was it that took you know, Joseph into Egypt? And again, 
you know, th- think about think about where Jacob and his and his sons were. I mean, they're up they're up north in you know, quote unquote Palestine or Canaan or Israel. Okay, they're in that area. And and who is Joseph, you know, sold to? The Midianite tra- you know, caravan, the Midianite travelers, also called Ishmaelites. So what what Vandertorn is saying is, look, this is probably how the name Yahweh got into this region. That that this is his view. So he's skeptical of the Kenite hypothesis that Yahweh as you know as a deity. And his worship originated, that's the key word, originated in, in this area south of Palestine. He, he doubts that, even though he knows the data is there. And he knows the Bible connects these places with Moses and Midian and all that kind of stuff. He thinks, he's arguing that, that the name got there by some other means. He's not going to deny that this is consistent with Yahweh coming from the south. And that, that's an important you know, idea, you know, even from, I guess, you know, somebody that we'll call, you know, I don't know if he's an unbeliever, or, you know, who knows, you know, who knows where any of these people are at, unless you actually have a conversation with them. But someone who, again, is, is quite willing you know, to assign less historicity to this stuff than a lot of, you know, a lot of people listening to this podcast. But that, that's still an important point. Uh, that, that's entirely plausible. And that's going to factor into the whole question of Moses learning about Yahweh okay, from the people in this region, as though he had never, he, he would have had no idea who the God of his fathers and his forefathers was, or that the Israelites down there in Egypt were, were worshiping some, some deity. And then they, they flipped deities, they changed deities. Oh, we're going to get rid of the, the El stuff. You know? We're not going to worship the God of Abraham anymore, El Shaddai. We're going to go to this Yahweh, this new one. Okay? If, if what Vander Torn is suggesting, that this name was circulating around even down into Egypt, the Joseph story, and then winds up in this area, this, this region. That's that's significant because it undermines this notion of a polytheistic deity flipping later on when you get to Moses. So I'm hoping that, you know that that, that rings you know, rings a bell in your head. So let let's try to you know just wrap up and assess the Kenai hypothesis part of this episode now. For someone who doesn't believe that there was a real Moses or an Exodus, the biblical material about Yahweh from the south and the external Egyptian material gives them a Yahweh origin explanation. It, it does that for them. They might complain that it isn't entirely accurate, you know, like Vandertorn did. You know, they might have that complaint. They might see some conflict with other biblical material, maybe something else archaeologically, but they don't care. Who cares? They're not looking to harmonize anything. They're just, you know, they're nuts and bolts, you know, kind of people. They would say the Bible's not accurate on other things anyway, so who cares? But, but for them, it, it gives them kind of a working explanation for how Yahweh became known because he is not. The name is not in any West Semitic text, okay? Any Canaanite, you know, Israelite, you know, that, that part of the world, you know, north, okay, of, of Midian and Edom and all that stuff. The Bible, the name Yahweh is not found in any inscription, okay? In that part of the world, earlier than the, the Moabite inscription, which is 900 BC, which is the time of, of the Amride dynasty, Jehu, you know that that, that bunch. Okay, so if you say, well, we have the Old Testament. Yes, we do. That, that's a literary source, but they're they're saying, look, if this is just odd, you know, if the Israelites come into Canaan, you know, real early, 1200 for the late daters, 1200 BC, 1400 BC for the early daters, it's kind of unusual. We wouldn't see the name pop up anywhere. Not a seal, not an inscription, nothing. I mean, again, it's it's thousands of times you know the Bible, but again, for for scholars who either don't regard the Bible as a historical text or they don't think it any more significant than any of these other historical texts, this is this is a chronological oddity to them. So the Kenai hypothesis helps them understand or at least have a working model for how the name Yahweh would have been known in this, this part of the world prior to 900 BC. Okay, so it, it does that for them. The real question, though, for us is, you know, for, for those you know, of us who do believe in historical Moses and who have a high view of scripture, does the Kenai hypothesis pose a problem? And this takes us to some questions that I think are required for good thinking, coherent thinking about the data we've just covered. In other words, what we want to do is we want to think about the data and ask, well, what do the data say and what don't they say? Because we don't want to just fill in gaps with our imagination. All right, what do they say? What, what, what do they not say? And how do we think well about the data that we have? So here are just, again, some, some questions that are important. Does the Bible, now think about this, does the Bible require that Moses knew the name of Yahweh before he flees to Midian? See, now we assume that as readers and as, you know, in the, in the Christian tradition, you know, what, what little of the Old Testament actually gets taught to people, you know, most of what people know about the Old Testament they get from movies. I mean, I hate to say it, but that's kind of true. So we assume this, that, that, well, of course, Moses, you know, he's a little boy, they've got the little, little, you know, basket, and he gets rescued, and, you know, it's just a wonderful story, and you know, he gets raised in Pharaoh's household, but he's weaned by his mom, and he knows he's a Hebrew. Of course, you know, he knows about Yahweh. Really? Does the Bible require that Moses knew the name of Yahweh before fleeing to Midian? Okay, Moses is taken from his mother when he is weaned, two or three years old. He is raised in Pharaoh's household. Now, somehow, we aren't told, and this is, this is the key idea, what does scripture actually tell us and what, what do we sort of mentally fill in culturally, okay? We're not told how Moses learned that he was a Hebrew. It's evident that he does know that, you know, because you know, the argument that he breaks up and he kills an Egyptian, you know, we know the story, okay? But we're not told how he knows that. And we are never told that he knows the name of Yahweh. How, how would he? It's not like he's going to, to Yahweh, Yahweh class, you know, an early release from Egyptian school every day. He's raised in Pharaoh's household. What do you think they're going to teach him? They're not going to teach him about Yahweh. You know, chances are actually good he would never have heard the name. They're not letting their little boy, their little, you know, little Egyptian boy now, go off and observe Sabbath with a bunch of slaves. How would he know? I would suggest to you that the Bible doesn't require that he knew it. All that, all that we know that he knew is that he, he knows he's a Hebrew. And he doesn't like what he's seeing. And he gets in trouble. And he has to flee the country. That's what we know. Second, if Moses did not know the name, again, which is an assumption, but it's, it's not an unreasonable one, does that mean he didn't worship the God of his ancestors? This is kind of in the same bucket. 
did Moses know about the God of his ancestors? And did he like in his heart of hearts worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? See, we assume that too, to some extent. You know, surely Charlton Heston, you know, would have done, you know, come on. We just don't know. We don't know. We don't know about Moses' spiritual condition or his spiritual knowledge at all until we hit Exodus 3. And God basically punches him in the nose, okay? We, we just don't know. Third, if Moses didn't know the name Yahweh before the burning bush, does that mean he had no religion at all? I mean, that goes with the second one, with the one we just read. Again, we, we just don't know these things. The Bible doesn't require all of the, catch, catch what I'm going to say here. The Bible doesn't require all of the things that critical scholars think the Kenite hypothesis overturns. You know, say it again. The Bible does not require all of the things that critical scholars think the Kenite hypothesis overturns. It just doesn't. And so this is a manufactured problem on one level. It really is. But again, you, you don't let, I don't want to cast this like it's a conflict or a fight here, but, but, but when you're talking about interpret, interpretation of scripture, do not let your opponent insert details and get you to fight over them when they're not there. Okay, that's what happens in a lot of these debates. Fourth, if the name Yahweh was revealed for the first time to any of the line of Jacob, you know, Israel, for, for the first time at Sinai, and that would be Moses. Okay, so, so, so we're assuming in this question that the slaves in Egypt, they've never heard of, of the name Yahweh either. Again, because, based on what Vandertorn says, that, that, that may not be true because of the, the, the caravans and all that kind of stuff. And Joseph going down into Egypt, and of course, you know, generations later, they wind up as slaves. You, you would think somebody knew this, but let's just, let's just go with it here. If the name Yahweh was revealed for the very first time to anybody in Jacob's line, to, any, to anybody in Israel, does that mean they were not worshiping the same deity, even without that name? I would suggest to you, no, it doesn't mean that. What it means is that the two lines of Abraham, remember, one's down in Egypt, Jacob. The other line of Abraham through Esau, they're in this Midian, Edom, Seir, Paran area. Okay, that's where they live. You got two lines of Abraham. So what, what this would mean is that you have one line of Abraham down in Egypt. And let, let's just assume for the sake of the question, they've just lost everything. They've lost all historical memory, you know, of, you know or not all historical memory, but they, if they ever heard the name of Yahweh, they've forgotten it generations ago, and now they're slaves, blah, 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 blah. And if there's this caravan where you got a few Semites like Joseph who knew the name, Joseph's memory is history. You know, who knows about this guy, Joseph, anymore? And if you know about Joseph, you're not you're talking about Joseph's knowledge of the name Yahweh, and you're talking about the things he did to save people from starvation and whatnot. Let's just assume that nobody down in Egypt knows the name Yahweh. And, and when the Exodus 3 event is the first time that they hear it, that's only part of Abraham's lineage. Okay, they would have known about their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and maybe, they, maybe they knew, chances are really good here, that they knew of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's God by an El name, El Shaddai, you know, whatever, you know, El Olam, you know, something like that, something in the patriarchal narratives. So that's what they know. But the other side of Abraham's lineage, they would know the name Yahweh. Because that much of the Kenite hypothesis, again, that makes that a plausible argument. So, so that's really what, what it would come down to. If this is the first time anybody from Jacob's line hears the name of Yahweh, we can't necessarily conclude that they weren't worshiping the same God because they're both, they both could, could quite easily be worshiping the same deity of their same forefathers. Both of these lines come from the same source, Abraham. Now, we, we have it divided after that, okay? You've got Isaac. Ishmael, of course, is the, is the, you know, the, the, the non-promised uh, seed. But there are even promises about Ishmael. They become 12 princes. And, you know, they go settle again with the Midianites and all the South Arabia. Okay. Is it unreasonable to think that you know, the Ishmaelites would not have known about El or El Shaddai or El, you know, one of, the, one of these Abraham names for, for God. At that, you know, it's quite reasonable that they did because that vocabulary is in South Arabia. And so is the name Yahweh. Again, that's, that's the whole Kenite thing. So it's very conceivable they would have been worshiping the same deity, but with different names, different terminology. Now, this sort of raises a sub-question. Let's say that scenario is, is the case. We would still wonder, well, why, why would Abraham's other line, the Esau line, the Ishmael line or whatever, okay? Where would they come up with the name Yahweh? Because they didn't have a burning bush experience. Okay, what, what, where does the name come from? Now, in South Semitic, again, languages that are in Midian and Edom and Paran, all these areas, and in the, the Arabian Peninsula, there are a number of possibilities here. Um, and you can, you, know, you can read DDD's entry on Yahweh and get all of them. But I think one of the more reasonable is the South Semitic root HYW. It means he blows, and it refers to wind, like a storm. Okay? You could very easily see that the god of the mountain, you know, think of storm clouds over the mountain and lightning flashing, you know, like what you would have had in, in this region. And then this is a mountainous region. Again, we read that material last week. You could very easily see that if, there, if you're in the mountainous region of Seir, okay, you know, Edom, you know, the, the, these places, and you, you get these storms that come up and, and right there, you know, in association with the mountain, the mountainous area there, that you could, you know, you would think as an ancient person, you know, as an ancient person, they're thinking that this frightening weather is caused by the gods or God. And you could very easily see how they could name the God after the windstorm idea. And if they did, there you have the consonants right there in South Arabia. Now we know when Moses has his encounter, again, Moses is from the other half of Abram's lineage, okay, in our, in our little you know, sort of thought experiment here. Moses is from the other half, and he gets confronted, and in West Semitic, in Hebrew, it doesn't mean he blows. That's a different language. It's a Semitic language, but it's a different, you know, it's another dialect of Semitic. In Hebrew, it means to be. It's from the to be verb, just like Exodus 3 tells us. So at that point, they're both worshiping the same deity who has the same name, even though, in, again, in this scenario, the, the etymology, the derivation of the name comes from two different ideas. 
Again, all of these things are on the table. They are all parts, either collectively or, or partially, of a coherent explanation that doesn't require the Israelites showing up in Midian behind Moses and saying, well, you want us to switch gods? Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> and you, that kind of thinking, even though it's common in, in critical scholarly circles, overstates the data dramatically. And it fails to consider alternatives that are workable with the data. So we, again, we, we, need to, we need to be thinking more carefully about this. Um, again, the, you know, to leave the thought experiment alone, what, what, what I just want to get, have you go away from or, or go away with you know, in, in this part of the episode is that, look, you know, we have this data. Certain people draw certain conclusions from it. And what I want you to, to, to realize is that those conclusions are not necessarily valid. And, and in some cases, they're not necessarily even coherent because they are either sort of repackaging the data and including some things that aren't really there or they're just dramatically overstating the implications of the data. And one of the flaws, again, is to assume certain things about Moses that the text never tells us. These are all, these are all you know, in, in the bucket of silence you know, when it comes to Scripture, what Moses knew, who knew what and when. And all. Again, these are, these are guesses that are part of Christian tradition, part of Jewish tradition. I mean, they, they're, they're certainly a part of those traditions. But when you, when you just actually look at the text, you don't get some of those things. And some of those things are important you know, when you're looking at something like the Kenite hypothesis. I would say none of this material is a threat to those who believe in a historical Moses or the Exodus. We have to remember the Bible describes, you know, what the Bible does describe with respect to these people. Nobody has a Bible, folks. Both sides of Abraham's line have a handful of stories about a deity whom their ancestor Abraham encountered or who encountered him, and they hand down those stories orally. The people of both sides of Abraham's lineage worship his God. This deity had many L names. One of them was El Shaddai, God of the mountains, God of the wilderness. Is it really a stretch to think that one line of descent, you know, from Abraham and the other line that, that winds up in Edom and Seir and Midian? Is it really a stretch to think that one line of descent also described El Shaddai as Yahweh, even if, even if the name that they chose in the South Arabian dialect comes from he blows, you know, the blowing of the wind and the storm god? Is that really a stretch? Well, no, no, it's not. You know, we don't know, you know how the name you know, would have developed in one dialect you know, or the other. The Western, North, Northwest Semitic dialect we get from Exodus 3, you know, we get more information, there, we get textual information there. But on the other side, all we have to do is, is wonder you know, where, where they would have come up with that name without the text in their, their, their life context. You know, people assign things like weather, like I said, to the power of the gods. Well, God, Moses has his divine encounter with the God of his fathers at the burning bush somewhere near Midian, in the wilderness, at a mountain. <laughs> okay. Either Moses or the later biblical writer take HWI in South Semitic, maybe they knew about the South Semitic derivation, and they quote unquote convert it to West Semitic Hebrew, where it means to be. Again, that's entirely possible. There we go. You, got, you could actually have the, the biblical writer transforming the Kenite, Midianite, Southern Semitic name to reflect the circumstances of the God who was about to make himself a new nation of people after the deliverance of e from Egypt, specifically of the other, i.e. the Jacobite line from Abraham that is now released from Egypt. All of this is on the table. It can all make sense, and it can be quite consistent with a historical Moses and an Exodus. You don't need to pick one or the other. So don't let yourself be forced into these sorts of conclusions or be troubled by them. You just need to think better about the material. All right. Well, I'm excited. What, what are we going to be talking about today? It's basically going to focus on how a literate Israelite, again, somebody familiar with their Old Testament and with Second Temple Jewish text, so a literate person living in that intertestamental period, how they would have thought about you know, the, the connections in the Old Testament between Cain and the things that Cain's you know, genealogy was known for, uh, things like metallurgy is the obvious connection, but there are other ones, and how intertestamental literature linked that stuff, you know, that, those marks of civilization, if we will, to the watchers. So somebody who's familiar with the Second Temple material, like books like Enoch and then Old Testament, they're going to wonder, well, why in the world would the guy who wrote Enoch connect Cain to all this? Because aren't the Kenites good guys? I mean, they, they sort of preserve, you know, the, the knowledge of Yahweh or the name or, the, you know, something like that. I mean, there's something good going on there with the Kenites. You know, Moses marries into that group. So why this negative connection? How would they have, you know, perhaps thought about what the writers were doing? For this, we need to go back to the genealogy of Cain and the Kenites, okay? And I'm going I'm to refer to an article. I will put this in the, uh, in the protected folder again. There's an article online. Actually, I don't even have to here because this you can actually find online. By Philip Esler, E-S-L-E-R. The title of the article is Deus Victor, The Nature and Defeat of Evil in the Book of the Watchers. Now, that is a, that is a chapter from a book called The Blessing of Enoch, First Enoch in Contemporary Theology. It's published by Wiffenstock. Um, and this particular chapter of it is pages 166 through 190. So Esler, again, in, I just read you the subtitle, The Nature and Defeat of Evil in the Book of the Watchers. Well, he's talking about how the Book of the Watchers, which within the Book of Enoch, the Book of the Watchers is chapters 1 through 36, how that material sort of frames the problem of evil, where it comes from and you know, God's victory over it. In the course of, of those chapters of Enoch, Cain is a player, okay? And, and this, this, how the writer of, of, of First Enoch sort of deals with Cain is, is interesting. It's instructive here. And, and once we sort of see this, we have to wonder if the writer of First Enoch, he would have known biblically about the connection to the Kenites, okay? He would have known that because it's transparently in scripture. And for us, it gives us some real interesting things to think about because it, you know, here's the question. If, if the Kenites are sort of good guys, you know, they preserve the worship of Yahweh. Let, let's just say that, or they, they know who Yahweh is. If they're sort of good guys, why in the world would the Bible connect them with a guy as bad as Cain? You say, well, it's because they were metalsmiths. Yeah, I, I get that. But then if you, if you know the book of the Watchers material, again, think, think like a, a first century Jew here. Let's say you know all this material. You're sitting there thinking, oh, I get that metalsmith thing, but you know, isn't that one of the things that, that the Watchers you know, get blamed for teaching humankind because it led to self-destruction? 
So uh, if they're good guys, why do that? Why would the Bible writer do that? Good question. So Esler on page four writes this. To appreciate the nature of evil in the Book of the Watchers in a manner that is sensitive to the structure of the work is useful to draw a distinction between dramatic time and narrative time. Here, dramatic time refers to the time during which the plot of the work involving the secession of the Watchers from heaven and the description of First Enoch's activities takes place. Narrative time, on the other hand, means the much larger sweep of time that embraces all of the events referred to in the drama of the Watchers and Enoch, which actually extend from the creation to the period of the final judgment and beyond. I mean, Enoch runs the scope from creation to you know, the, the, the second earth. I mean, it runs the, runs the gamut. Esther adds, it should be noted that the text does not always describe events in strictly chronological order. Thus, the Watchers descend to earth in First Enoch 6, uh, loose, again, based on Genesis 6, 1 through 4. But it is not until First Enoch 12 that we hear that, quote, before these things, unquote, Enoch was taken, i.e. to heaven, which relates to an earlier period, Genesis 5, 24, which is obviously before Genesis 6. This is one of the several signs in the text that the author well understands the broad chronological course of universal and Israelite history, even though he is capable of jumping from one time to the other. On pages 10 to 11, Esther writes, Cain must be understood as the prototypical evildoer on the earth, the first person to engage in what for the Enochic scribe is the worst kind of evil, acts of violence. In the case of Cain, and by necessary implication others after him, homicidal violence. Abel is the first of many to petition heaven on account of this murder. Pages 13 and 14, Esler adds, the next evil in chronological order, you know, after the Cain incident, is that of the watchers desiring women and wanting to beget children from them, First Enoch 6 too. Their leader recognizes this as a great sin. So even, even the leader of the watchers, you know, if you actually read Enoch, he, he admits this is a great sin. When the watchers do this, they are said to, quote, defile themselves, unquote. The watchers also, as the story goes on, impart knowledge to human beings. And then Esther goes on to, you know, rabbit trail on that. You know, one, one of those false teachings was metallurgy, specifically fashioning weapons for war and bloodshed. Uh, was, that was one, you know, way that evil would proliferate in the world and destroy the image, destroy the imagers, you destroy humans, the imagers of God. Esther continues after he talks about the false teaching there. But the true horror of the Watchers' secession from heaven emerges only afterward in the actions of their progeny, the giants to which their wives give birth, First Enoch 7, 4, and 5. The core of the evil they produce is violence to the extent of killing and then eating human beings, the creatures of the earth, and even themselves, you know, cannibalism. Thus, violence, initiated by Cain, reappears in a most extreme form with the giants. And that's the end of, of Esler's selections, at least right now. But let's think about this for a moment. In First Enoch, Book of the Watchers, that, that material creates a conceptual link between Cain and the Watchers. The Watchers' crimes, which are various, reach a crescendo in the violence that ensues from their activity. Now, here's the question. Is there any indication biblical writers might have been tracking along the same lines? That is, connecting thinking of Cain as some sort of prototypical bad guy, murderer, and then connecting them with the giants, connecting Cain with the giants, connecting murder, you know, with all that kind of stuff. So is there any, is there any evidence biblically that they might have been sort of thinking, biblical writers might have been tracking with this? Like if you, if you, if, you know, if a biblical writer was here, you know, Moses or whoever of the Torah, and I read him, what I just read, would he say, oh yeah, you know, we, we know that, we got it. Is there any evidence for that? Well, let's think about that. In the Old Testament, Cain's murder in Genesis 4 is of course famous, but who's the next murderer? You ask yourself the question, who's the next murderer? It's Lamech. That's also in Genesis 4, 17 through 24, where we read, Cain knew his wife. This is verse 17, Genesis 4. She conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Now, I'm going to insert a note here. This is not the same Enoch as in Genesis 5, the one that goes to heaven, okay? That one in Genesis 5 is the seventh from Adam, according to the New Testament and Second Temple literature. Cain's son is obviously not the seventh from Adam in the biblical story, okay? So, on to verse 18. To Enoch was born Erod, and Erod fathered Mehujael, and Mehujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Adah, the name of the other was Zillah. Adah bore Yaval, Jabal in most English Bibles. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Yuval, Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. And Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Some observations here. First, Lamech is a descendant of Cain. Second, Lamech is a murderer, like his forefather, and he even references Cain's crime as some sort of badge of honor. Third, one of the sons of Lamech is Tubal Cain, the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. Another son was, quote, father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. In other words, people just like the Midianites. HBD, referencing that again, notes Tubal Cain is known as a forger of all implements of copper and iron. As descendants of the fugitive wanderer Cain, Tubal Cain and his relatives, and later the Kenites, typify nomadic tradesmen associated with the rise of urban life and commerce and with the sin and violence it occasioned. That's the end of the HBD quote. Lamech also had another son in chapter five. See, he has, he has these three sons in chapter four. Okay, we've got Jabal, Jubal, Tubal Cain, but he has another son in Genesis 5, 28. Remember who that was? Noah. And so here we go. Here we go with the, how do you get Nephilim after the flood question again? Because later on, we're going to have the giants. I mean, think of, think of Enoch now. Enoch, for the writer of first Enoch, links the violence of the giants with Cain. Just point blank, it does that. And we've asked the question, well, will biblical writers make those connections? Well, Cain is the prototypical murderer. You've got Lamech next. One of Lamech's sons is Noah. 
And after, you know, we know what happens with Noah, the sons of God, and they have giants, the giants, you know, well, here we go. Even though the biblical story doesn't have the cannibalism and all that kind of stuff, it does say that the giants were lethal enemies of the people of God. So I'm not saying that this is the, the best way to look at Genesis 6 and the Nephilim and all that stuff. I'm not saying it's the best view. I'm just saying that you can see the logic. If, if someone either in antiquity or today wants to create a genealogical line back to Cain to the giants after the flood, you could actually do that because Noah is a descendant of Lamech who is a descendant of Cain. You can, you can actually make that argument. I know a lot of people listening on it. Well, Noah was pure in all these generations. Well, and if you actually do a word study on that, it's not the normal word for lineal descendants. You know, this, this word door is used of generations as, as in the people living at your same time, like the generation of the 60s, that, that kind of thing. It doesn't mean they're all related. It just means they're alive at the same time. Now, in fairness, that word is used one time, in my knowledge, for lineal descent. So I guess it's possible. But one time versus a few dozen other times where it's never used that way or it's not used that way, eh, the odds are against you. And, and in fact, this is why in antiquity, you had some Second Temple Jews gravitate toward someone in Noah's lineage sort of being responsible for the survival in, in terms of genealogy, the, the survival of the giants after the flood. This is why they went there. And if you, if you do that, and I'm not saying the writer of First Enoch did, I, I, he doesn't spell that out. It's, again, we don't want to overstate the data here, but he does connect them, at least conceptually. Frankly, I think that's the better way to connect them with these conceptual connections. But anyway, I just want to make the comment here that if, if this was your predilection you know, to, to come up with some like real you know, biological genealogy, and that's your explanation for giants after the flood. And oh, now we've got Noah and Lamech and Cain, and that's the way the writer of Enoch saw it. Well, okay, you know, he may well have seen it that way. doesn't mean it's right. Just it's a workable thing, you know, at, least, at least on a textual basis. Now, again, if that's the way you want to go, you know, you, you'd have it. Now, this takes us into the genealogies of Genesis 4. And I'm telling you, I know the genealogies are boring, but there's some crazy stuff in the genealogies. <laughs> if you understand how they, people were thinking about them. Uh, and I'm going I'm to give you a quote here from uh, Wenham, Wenham's Genesis commentary on, uh, on Genesis 4 here. He's writing about the genealogy that we just, you know, we just read, the one that has Cain and Lamech, okay? He says, that here the genealogical structure of the account becomes apparent again. Verse 17 could have immediately followed verse 2, had not the long digression about Abel's murder been included at that point. Verses 17 through 24 include several brief comments on the vocations of Cain's descendants, but only the lengthy digression, the only lengthy digression is the Song of Lamech, in which he shows that he has all the violent traits of his forefather. It may be noted that these comments cluster around Enoch and Lamech, the only two men in this genealogy whose names reappear in the genealogy of Adam via Seth, which is interesting. We'll get to that in a moment. Apparently, to make sure that the two Enochs and the two Lamechs are not confused, both genealogies give more detail about these individuals than the others in these lists. For the most part, the other antediluvians remain simply names. The general similarity of the style of the rest of chapter four persuades most commentators that, again, we have, without getting into all, all of one of his discussion here, that we've got two separate genealogies. He says, parallels with the Sumerian flood story have already been mentioned, again, in his, earlier in his commentary. Mesopotamian sources make occasional mention of seven Apkalus who lived before the flood. The older texts are not explicit about the precise skills of these Apkalus, but the oldest Apkalu is called Adapa and is associated with Eridu, generally regarded in Mesopotamian tradition as the first city to be founded. Remember the first city in the genealogy, Irad, Eridu? Pretty much the same. Okay, so there, now, now, we're getting, now we're getting into the Apkalu first city traditions in the genealogical line in Genesis 4. Again, you have to think like an Israelite or like a Jewish reader. How would they have, how would they have what, are, what were the thoughts they would have been thinking when they read this stuff? Again, if you're a literate Jew, like these scribes were, they're seeing these, these sorts of connections. Now, when him goes on, he says here, he quotes R.R. R. Wilson, who has a very sort of well-known book on genealogy, genealogy and history in the biblical world. It's out of print, but you can still get it used on Amazon. Uh, Wenham says this, the parallels between Genesis 4, 17 through 26 and extra biblical traditions are not close enough to suggest direct borrowing by Genesis from the extant sources. It's possible though, that the biblical writer knew these old ideas and wanted to comment on them. He held that technology was a human achievement, not the gift of the gods. Indeed, by linking urbanization and nomadism, music and metalworking to the genealogy of Cain, he seems to be suggesting that all aspects of human culture are in some way tainted by Cain's sin. And now he quotes Wilson, by virtue of being Cain's descendants, the people named in the genealogy all inherit his curse. Thus, the Cainite genealogy becomes part of the Yahwist's account of man's increasing sin, unquote. You know, again, this, these are conceptual connections. So if, if you don't prefer the, well, now I've got sort of a, an argument to make for a literal genealogy back to Cain, you know, through the Watchers and the Giant, all that stuff. If, if that's not your cup of tea, then how else could we think about this? And again, this is sort of where I'm angling for, this is where I'm at. I think that the material or thinking about the material becomes more coherent, more, it makes more sense. At least it's more textually defensible. If we think conceptually, and that is, follow me here, Cain is the prototypical murderer. Again, we're thinking like a Jew about what we're reading in Enoch and what we know from the Old Testament. And the, and the, the interface there is Cain. Okay? Cain is the prototypical murderer, the archetypal human agent of chaos after Adam and Eve are driven from Eden. Sure, Adam and Eve fell, they sinned. But Enoch and other second temple texts don't have them as the reason for depravity. We've talked about this before on the podcast. That depravity, they assigned to the watchers. What the watchers did is cast as the catalyst for human self-destruction. Cain foreshadows human self-destruction. He typifies the havoc the watchers and their spawn, the giants, from whom would come demons, would wreak on earth by means of their false teaching, which spread idolatry and, of course, violence. And so these elements, Cain, watchers, giants, are conceptually and textually connected, even without throwing a literal genealogy into the mix. Maybe a better question to ask is, and here's the relevance to our episode, why the Kenites are made part of this in the Bible? Aren't they good guys? Sure, they descend from the non-elect line of Abraham, Esau. 
but they still worship the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham. God brings Moses to them to reintroduce himself to Moses, or maybe for the first time. Again, we'll talk about that next week. Why taint the Kenites the with Cain? After all, if the Torah was edited during the exile at some point, why would an editor both telegraph the good guy stuff and the, hey, you guys are part of Cain's line stuff? It just doesn't seem to go together. But we have to ask ourselves if we're in fact reading the association with Cain the right way, or whether we're seeing the correct rationale behind the association. Does the biblical writer connect the Kenites to Cain to villainize the Kenites, or is there some other reason that he might be doing it? I would suggest there is another reason, one that you can communicate with one word, and that is reversal. So let's rethink what we've been talking about, starting with the boring genealogies. And I, on, the, on the episode page, I have a map, or not a map, but I have a, a graphic, a picture of the genealogies in Genesis 4 and 5. So you know, if, you're, if you're listening to the episode now and you don't have it, you know, just know that you can go back and look at it. But there's three columns in this picture. Uh, there's, there's the genealogy. On the left-hand side from Genesis 5, it starts with Adam and it ends with Noah through Lamech. Then in the middle, there's Genesis 4, which is the real short fragmentary Sethite line, Adam, Seth, and Enosh. And then on the right-hand column, there's Genesis 4, which begins with Adam and doesn't end with Noah. It ends with Yuval, Yuval, Tubal, Cain, through Lamech. Okay? So have a look at that, and maybe you want to re-listen to this. But if you look at the picture, the genealogies actually telegraph some things. And you can add this to the dumpster of stuff you never hear in church. You know, that's basically all we do here, but here we go again. So if you're thinking about the genealogies, Wenham writes this, the three-member genealogy of Seth, that's the middle one, in Genesis 4, 25, and 26, acts as a trailer to the full 10-member genealogy of chapter 5. It has also been observed that the last seven members of the Sethite genealogy in chapter 5 parallel the genealogy of Cain in chapter 4, Genesis 4, 17 and 18. To be precise, Wenham says, of the six names mentioned in Genesis 4, 17 and 18, two, Enoch and Lamech, reappear in Genesis 5, 12 through 28. And only Lamech appears at the same point in the genealogy as its penultimate, its next to last member. If, however, again, Mahalel changes place with Enoch in chapter 5, and he says, you can, you can line these up just by place names. doesn't mean they're the same person, but the same place names. Or not place names, the same personal names, if you just flip a few around. They're all, they're all kind of there, just different order. But again, doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're the same people. Except for, you know, Lamech, you know, again, and, and his kids. That's the interesting point. Now, Wilson, again, that, that quote where Wenham had quoted Wilson, has pointed out, Wenham says, that peoples often retain variant genealogies alongside each other without sensing any contradiction between them. Certainly, the editor of Genesis did not regard these genealogies as identical or completely identical. Not only do they have different starting points, Cain and Seth, and different conclusions, Tubal, Cain, and Noah, but Enoch and Lamech, the only identical names within the two genealogies, are distinguished by additional biographical details, which show that they were, again, very likely regarded as different people. The morphological similarity of the other names would be explained by, you know, grammatical stuff, assimilation. That's what he's talking about here. He says, comparing the genealogies in the present setting in Genesis indicates the editor saw them as distinct. The different styles suggest they probably derive from distinct sources. But this is not to say that they must have first been brought together by an editor, for once again, the Sumerian flood story may have discussed similar topics. Again, so when he talks about topics here, he's getting, in, he's getting into this idea that the names in the genealogies, even if, even if they're different, the names convey certain things, certain concepts, certain topics in the flow of primeval history. I would suggest to you something. If you look at the genealogies, here's what's interesting. Just look at them side by side. In the left-hand line, you have the good guy. In the left-hand column, you have the good guy line. Adam to Noah incorporating Seth. Of course, Seth replaced Abel because Abel was killed. It's a good guy line because it leads to a deliverer. God calls in the days of the flood. Noah. God will preserve humanity through this line. Maybe we should call it the God's plan line. Genesis 4, on the right-hand column, is the chaos line, the bad guy line. It doesn't include Seth. It skips from Adam to Cain on up to Lamech, okay, Noah's father in the other genealogy. But instead of having Noah as Lamech's son, who do we get? Yuval, Yuval, and Tubal Cain. Tents and livestock, liar and pipe players, and then the metalworking thing. Big deal, you say. Well, it is kind of a big deal when you realize that those things, dwelling in tents, having livestock, dwelling in cities, that's also in chapter 5 in, in the genealogical section. Uh, it's also in chapter 4 in, in the bad guy line. Yeah, that's how I want to say it. It's, it's also in chapter four when, when uh, after Cain you know, has to leave, he has to, he builds a city or somebody builds a city. That's a subject for another episode. But the building of the city is also in the bad guy line. All of those things, the, the, the formation of civilization, the fashioning of weapons, metallurgy, all that, all that stuff that's interested here. And, and, and music is part of you know, what, you know, what civilization broadly encompasses. All of those things are the stock elements of the Prometheus myth from classical Greece. Remember Prometheus, the one, you know, the one, the titan, one of the titans that, that gives this knowledge you know, to human beings. And it, of course, it's not viewed as a good thing. <laughs> They are all elements of settled civilization. So there are actually some scholars, again, this is a rabbit trail we won't take, that wonder if the Prometheus story actually borrows or, or reflects some of the older biblical and ancient Near Eastern material about civilization, how we get civilization, either the Watchers, the Apkali, or something like that. But, but this is, these are the elements of the Prometheus story, which is really kind of interesting. You know, what you have here is you have the good guy line, the line of the plan of God being set against the line that produces not only depravity and murder and chaos, but also civilization. You say, well, why would that be bad? You know, why, why, would, why would those things be connected? Think about what it means to put the genealogies against one another and then loop the, Canine, the Kenites into this. Think reversal. The good guy line marks the line God will use to reverse the bad guy line, the chaos line. In fact, if the Torah links the Midianites back to Cain, it's a bit interesting that those Kenites or Midianites will wind up in territory associated with the non-elect line of Abraham, the Edomites, Esau. The Edomites and Kenites, both on the outs with God's plan, as it were, wind up in the same area. And it is to that area that God directs Moses to confront him with his mission of not only delivering Jacob's line from Egypt, but of rejoining the family strands back together. Remember, Moses marries into the Midianite line. And plenty of Midianites joined the ranks with Israel. 
God, of course, has been trying to bring the two lines back together and blunt the power of depravity for a long time before we get to Moses. He's been trying to, again, restore the nations. I mean, God called Abraham out of paganism. He divorced the nations, but not so that the nations would be forever excluded from his family. God made a covenant with Abram that through all his seed, all nations would be blessed. And those nations include places that would later become known as Midian and Edom. They're actually in Genesis 10. They're included in Canaan as a whole place, plus Aram, Uz, and Hol, descendants of Shem, the Semites. Okay, they're, they're, these places are included. They're just not called Midian and Edom yet. Genesis 10's promise even includes the land of a city builder and civilizer, Nimrod. Babylon is not exempt from redemption in God's overall picture. The covenant is a compassionate one. Later, the angel of Yahweh wrestles with Jacob on the eve of his reunion with Esau. It's through Moses, of course, that God gives the law, quote, added because of transgressions, unquote, Galatians 3.19, to restrain human evil until the Messiah would come, die, rise again, and ascend, triggering the coming of the Spirit, the primary agent in believers to reverse depravity, which was in turn laid out at the feet of the watchers, or laid at the feet of the watchers in Second Temple Judaism. And when we get to Exodus, God sends Moses into the land of the prodigal line, where God has been present through, though largely unnoticed, for a very long time. It's time to call a man, Moses, whose life's ministry will work to reverse the chaos of the world through the promised plan line of Jacob, the Israelites, whose descendants are supposed to be a kingdom of priests and through whom the ultimate reverser, the Messiah, will come. And of course, the reclaiming of the nations. We even get a foreshadowing of all this. Again, just to summarize all that, if you think about when you pit the line that, the good guy line, the line of, of deliverance, okay, Noah. I mean, we could, we could throw in a whole, we could, we could throw in the, right here, the fact that in Jewish tradition, as I've talked about, you know, with, the, with Revelation 12, the birth of Messiah, Jewish tradition had Noah and, and the one born on you know, September 11, 3 BC, Tishri 1. Jesus and Noah would have shared a birthday. Again, just using you know, Jewish tradition in that. So you have this deliverance line. It's set over against the line of chaos. And the line of chaos actually works its way into biblical history. And the lines converge in, in the Moses story. The, the, the non-elect line of Abraham is there. The Midianites, the Kenites are there. The ones who, you know, who are linked back to Cain, you know, this awful guy Cain. There, you know, symbols of chaos. You know, why, why is civilization, why is urbanization, why is human technology and invention viewed as a bad thing, just generally? Because it's not Edenic. It's of human origin. Everything of human origin is less than Eden in biblical thinking. Now, it can be used for good. It can be used for self-destruction. And of course, in the Enochian mind, it's, it's the watchers that, that give this to humanity de deliberately, intentionally, to encourage the destruction of the image of God, the imagers of God, human beings. So on the one hand, yes, technology and civilization, it, it's neutral in terms of the way it's used. But in the course of the, the big picture of the biblical story, it was viewed negatively. It was viewed, again, as something un-Eden, anti-Eden, less than Eden. It, it, it just reflects life not you know, it, it, it's, it's sort of like it's putting in human hands the restoration of Eden. And that is not God's plan. God's plan is to restore Eden through a single person, okay, the Messiah, Christ, the seed of Abraham, who again will unite all nations and he will unite the disparate strands of Abraham's own family, his genealogy. There's God's method for restoring paradise, restoring utopia, restoring Eden. And then there's everything else. And everything else is of human origin. This is what's working through the mind of the biblical writer, you know, of, of the Enochian writer. Uh, this is how they're thinking about their world and about the, the whole situation of the world. We have lost Eden. We cannot restore it ourselves. Any attempt to restore it ourselves is going to fail. And in fact, we now, with, as we learn, as, as, we, as, we, as we build, as we do things, you know, we, we are dependent on our own devices. And if you know, left to ourselves in a non-Edenic world, humanity will turn these things against humanity. I mean, this is, this is our world today. This is our world today. The, these categories of thought should not be unfamiliar. Everything that humans set their hand to is a two-edged sword, everything. It's, it's either brought into captivity you know, of, of, to, to, to the Lord, or it's not. So they're thinking along these same lines, but they're communicating the ideas through genealogy, you know, through, through the, the violence you know, of, of you know, the Watchers, through Genesis 6, through, through books like Enoch. Uh, even again, just the simple concept of civilization, it's less than Eden because we're doing it, because God is not doing it. You know, only when God is at the helm can Eden be restored the way it should be. That is the only path, the power of God is the only path to restore things as they should be, as, as God in, originally wanted them. So they're trying to communicate these ideas through, you know, really, again, to us, strange means. These, these episodes, these stories, you know, genealogies. And it's just interesting that when you get to Moses and you get the Kenites, if you're a literate Jew, you know about the Kenites. They're from Cain. Isn't it kind of ironic? Isn't it, isn't it you, know, you know, irony? It's a reversal, okay? Isn't it interesting that God would have, this, would have Moses go to the place where these descendants are and that God would use them in some way to save Moses' life, and Moses would become the deliverer. Okay, through him, the knowledge of Yahweh would either be restored or would proliferate itself. Through this, this man, Moses, that the Kenites, the Midianites, are instrumental in saving and preserving you know, this, this guy. God is using the unfavored line to do what he wants to do. He is using those who, again, have, have just fallen by the wayside to accomplish his plan. I mean, it, it, it's really a significant theological lesson, and, and the more you dig down into it, Again, you, you see the, the, iron, the ironic reversal of this. And we even get it telegraphed, like in Messianic prophecy. I'll, I'll end with this. You know, we get a foreshadowing of this. If, if you're into the birth narratives of Jesus, I would recommend uh, Father Raymond Brown's book. Raymond Brown was a famous New Testament scholar. He's deceased now. 
wrote this, he wrote some massive stuff on the gospels and he wrote a really huge book, thick book on the birth narratives of, of Jesus. But he writes this, he says, uh, the gold and frankincense gifts bestowed upon Jesus and his family derive from Isaiah 60 verse six and Psalm 72, 15. Those, those ver- in those verses, those items, gold and frankincense specifically, are associated with the desert camel trains coming from Midian, you know, in Northwest Arabia and from Sheba, the kingdom of the Sabaeans in Southwest Arabia. You could add Jeremiah 620 to that mix as well. This is me talking now. What about the myrrh? Remember the Ishmaelite Midianite traders from the Joseph story? Okay, let's read Genesis 37, 25 and following. And you're going to find, you're going to hear something interesting here. Genesis 37, 25. They sat down to eat, the Joseph's brothers, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites, ironic, coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Okay, then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hands be upon him for he's our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. By the way, Judah, Judah, Judah says that. Judah winds up you know, saving his life. Judah, you know that tribe from which the Messiah would come? His brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders, Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver and they took Joseph to Egypt. Can I think back to Vandertorn? I think it's entirely possible that the name of Yahweh does go to Egypt through Joseph. And it comes back and forth. You know, there's gonna, the, you got these traders, you got Semites running around all over the place. Again, I think what Vandertorn says is it's really worth considering. I don't know that it solves anything, but it's worth considering. You know, and, and here you have all the elements. You have all of the elements. You know, in, in Jesus' day, where does myrrh come from especially? It comes from the Nabataeans. There's an Anchor Bible Dictionary article in the Nabataeans. You get this. They're from South Arabia. You know, it, again, it's, it's the same thing as in these other two references. My overall point, again, in the foray to wrap this up, is the guy who wrote First Enoch, a second temple Jew, saw the genealogies again pitted against each other, God's plan versus chaos. And he saw Cain as a prototypical murderer, the archetypal human agent of chaos. And so that author aligned Cain with the watchers and the harm they did. The New Testament kind of does something similar in First John 3 when it links Cain to Satan. Uh, my view is that these are conceptual, not literary links, though. And ultimately, the teaching point is that the chaos genealogy expresses the idea that human civilization is invariably anti-Eden or less than Eden. It's human, as opposed to what could have been. So it's a biblical theological rationale that in my mind tells us why utopia always fails. Nothing we can do measures up to Eden. We can't recreate it on our own terms. We can't reverse Babel through our own plans and our own tactics on the way to building our own Eden. Only God can do this. And he inaugurated his own remedy through Christ, who fulfills the law of Moses and the covenants and is the key to uniting all the lines of Abraham and the nations. So I mean, this is big picture archetypal thinking. And the reason I wanted to include the Enoch stuff in here is there's just stuff lurking around in the Bible that if you read later texts, like Second Temple Jewish literature, they are tracking on ideas that wouldn't normally occur to you. But they're, when you go back, when you, when you listen to their idea, and then you go back in the Old Testament, you think, oh yeah, okay, I, I see where you could get that. I see, I see why you're, you could connect those dots the way you did. It's just instructive. It's just an, another way to think about material. And frankly, we've all wondered what in the world is Genesis 4 doing in the Old Testament anyway. The whole Cain story seems kind of interrupted. He is an agent of chaos. Lamech is an agent of chaos. You know, what Cain does, even the, even the building of the city, points to the futility, okay? Because Cain does it, the futility of trying to restore order and Eden. Only God can do these things. And again, it's big picture level thinking, but I think, again, for our purposes, it just gets us into it a little bit so that we can understand how um, people of Jesus' day in Second Temple period, how they would have been thinking about their, their, their material, their Bible. And in this case, it sort of leeches out to us through a book like First Enoch. Exodus 4 next week, but uh, part 3 here, what are we going to be talking about? Yeah, this, this is what everybody thinks of with chapter 3, the revelation of the divine name. So, you know, we're like, what does the name mean and some of that kind of stuff. You know, we'll try not to get too far into the nuts and bolts because I've got some stuff on my uh, website about this, but yeah, that, that's our focus this time. All right, well, looking forward to it. Well, let's jump in. I'm going to start by reading uh, Exodus 3. Uh, I'm just going to read for now the first, you know, 14 or so verses because again, this is the familiar part of the story uh, that everybody thinks of when they think of, you know, this this chapter in the book. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. 
So we'll stop there. That's the first 14 verses. And I just want to make a few you know, sort of sidebar comments on our way to getting to the revelation of the divine name. You'll notice in verse 2, we have the angel of the Lord appearing. The verb there in Hebrew is ra'ah. It is the same verb and stem. Again, I'm not going to rabbit trail into Hebrew stems, but they're important. Same verb and stem that we see in some other passages. Now, if you've read my book, Unseen Realm, uh, you're going to be familiar with chapters 12, 13, and 14, which deal with you know, God in human form in the Old Testament. And of course, this is part of it. The word, the word of the Lord is part of it. The angel of the Lord is part of it. Um, the, the name theology, the angel, we're going to get to this in Exodus 23, that has the name of God in him. It's another way of saying the presence of God, glory of God is in that particular angel, which is why he's identified with Yahweh. You, know, you should be familiar with all that stuff. If you have not read Unseen Realm on this con, uh, this con, these concepts, uh, I would recommend that you do that. And you know, I can't really reproduce the book content in, in episodes. So you're going to have to settle for a bit of a summary here, but that's the place to go. But part of that discussion is, again, God in human form, God appearing. And so you have a verse like Genesis 12, 7. It says, then the Lord, Yahweh, divine name. Again, when in your English Bibles, when Lord is in all small capitals, that's the divine name. The divine name is present there in the Hebrew text. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, again, so on and so forth. This is the call of Abram, but it's appeared. And we find out, again, this is connected to the word of the Lord. Uh, you get to Jeremiah where the word of the Lord appears you know, to, to Jeremiah. And the word of the Lord is actually called Yahweh in Jeremiah 1. And the word of the Lord reaches out his hand and touches the prophet. I mean, these are, this is God in human form. You know, even, even in some senses, some passages, it's a corporeal you know, encounter where God you know, touches somebody. You get the same verb and stem here. You, Genesis 17, 1. I'll just read a few of these. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram. Same verb and stem. 18:1. This is Genesis 18. This is when God and two angels show up at Abram's house and they have a meal. Okay, it's, God, it's Yahweh in human form. Verse, first verse of, of that section. Genesis 18, 1. And the Lord appeared to him, Abram, by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. Again, same verb. Genesis 26, 2. The Lord appeared to him. So he's going to, the same language is used of you know, Isaac and Jacob. Uh, other patriarchs, Genesis 35, 9, God appeared to Jacob again when he came to Padanaram and blessed him. Chapter 48, again, if you've read Unseen Realm, you're familiar with Genesis 48, 15, and 16, where the angel and God himself are fused by the grammar. They are co-identified with each other in, in Jacob's prayer when he says, may the God of, you know, God who did this, the God who did that, the angel, you know, may he, singular verb form, may he bless the boys. And it's a tight identification of the angel with the Lord. And that chapter begins with, in verse 3, by, by this statement. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. Again, so referring back to some of these episodes where God showed up as a man in the Old Testament. First Samuel 3, kind of a classic instance, the, little story, the story of the little boy Samuel. When he hears his name called out while they're trying to go to sleep, we find out it is Yahweh appearing and standing. Again, if it's just an invisible, disembodied voice, you don't describe something invisible as standing. How would you know? Samuel is seeing God. Okay, again, in human form, this is anthropomorphic language. Uh, this verse here, First Samuel 3.21, the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Again, all these, all these verses, and there are more, of course, you can read Unseen Realm about this, but here, again, I think it's important to point out the language. The Luke in Acts picks up on this too. Acts 7.30, in Stephen's you know, speech there, we read, now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. So Luke, again, is an observant reader drawing attention to an appearance. Um, again, if you want more detail, you can read Unseen Realm chapters 12, 13, and 14. You notice as well in the verse, in verse 2, Exodus 3.2, there's just an interesting sort of comment. Moses looked and behold, the bush was burning and it was not consumed. Okay, And, and so you know, later on, we're going to read that Moses was afraid at the end of verse six. He was afraid to look at God. He doesn't say he was afraid to look at the fire. He was afraid to look at God. Again, he's, this is the language of appearance used of the angel in all those other passages. Plus this one, this is God in human form in the bush. And Moses is freaked out as I think we would all be. He's afraid to look at the bush. And again, you're not afraid to look at something invisible because it's invisible. How would you know you're even seeing it if it's invisible? Again, you got to think about the language being used here. It's important. You get to verse five. Uh, this is where God tells Moses, don't come near, take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And that, you know, is the same language repeated in Joshua 5, where you have the, the prince, like the captain of the Lord's host, you know, shows up and Joshua sees him. So again, we have, looks just like a man. And Joshua says, essentially, whose side are you on? Are you a friend or foe? And then the figure answers him, I'm, I'm the captain of the Lord's host. But on the one hand, you know, we don't have the term angel or angel of the Lord in that passage, but we do have two things. One of them is the same language drawn from Exodus 3. The captain of the Lord's host tells Joshua, take your shoes off your feet because you're standing on holy ground. It's exactly the same language. So and that it's supposed to connect the visible form, the visible human form of God in Exodus 3 with that guy in Joshua 5. The other thing you have is you have the description in Joshua 5 that, that the, the captain of the Lord's host was standing there with drawn sword in his hand. Okay, that is a unique phrase in Hebrew. It's used only two other places in the entire Hebrew Bible. And I talk about this in Unseen Realm as well. And both of those places, it's the angel of the Lord, Numbers 22 and 1 Chronicles 20. So this is, again, the angel of the Lord. This is God in human form. It's, it's not that difficult to see if you're comparing scripture with scripture. And again, we know that biblical writers are very fond of, and, and they're very purposeful, they're very intentional about repurposing parts of the Bible in what they're writing. And they're trying to get you to read something in front of your face and then mentally connect with something else to essentially connect the dots. And so that's what, that's what we're doing here. And, and again, Unseen Realm is filled with dot connecting of this kind. Uh, it's, just, it's a close reading of scripture. So again, if you want more detail, you can refer to that. Let's go down to verse eight. In verse eight, we have uh, the statement, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out, out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
to the place the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Now, a couple of things here. They're on a mountain. So the coming down, again, has to refer to God coming down from the heavens, again, from the skies. You know, the, again, and and this, is a, this is a metaphor for where God would live. He doesn't live on earth. This is not his domain. It's our domain. Okay, it's a domain he created for humanity. He is transcendent. He, he, he actually resides, quote unquote. I mean, we have, to use, we have to use the vocabulary of embodiment, which is just, a, that's just the way it is because we're embodied to talk about a being, God, that doesn't have a body, that can be anywhere at any time, at all times at the same time. I mean, so again, we have to think a little bit about the language. The coming down, again, is a reference to God coming from his place, which again was perceived either as the heavens, the skies, or you know, somewhere that humans don't inhabit, mountains, the oceans. You know, this, this is where divine beings live, these, in, in these places that are not for human residents, that, that sort of thing. So he comes down, but I think what's really interesting about the, the let us go down, in, in, or the, that language, I have come down, then you have Genesis 11, it's the Babel incident, let us go down, it's the same verb, same Hebrew verb there. So God is coming from the heavens to act. Something's going to happen here when this language is used. And again, it's, it's another little technique of the writers to help, you know, help readers think about what's happening in the scene they're reading, and again, through similar language, what happened at other times, you know, when God came down. Uh, things happened, you know, God is acting, he's busy, he's getting to the task at hand. So it, it sort of preps the reader for you know, being prepared that God is a God of action, and here we go. Uh, so I, I think that's an interesting thing to observe. As far as the, the people group names, the Canaanites, the Hittites, and so on and so forth, we're going to wait until I hit uh, probably about Exodus 23 again to get into those names. Um, you know, they're, they're important, again, especially as it relates to the conquest and some of the, those other things. Um, so we'll, we'll wait at, at that point you know, to do that. Now, one thing I want to draw your attention to that I think is really important because of you know, what we've covered in the last couple of weeks about, you know, did, we asked the question, did Moses, had he ever heard of the name Yahweh? Like, like, like should, this, should this be a shock? You know, and, and does that mean he didn't worship the God of his fathers, you know, and so on and so forth. Here we actually have, I think, a pretty, a pretty good clue as to how we might want to answer that question. We alluded to it, or alluded to this earlier in earlier episodes, but here we go. He says in uh, verse, uh, let's see here, verse 13, then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, I would suggest to you that Moses is not looking for a password here. He's not saying, okay, you know, if I go back to Egypt and go to the leadership there in Israel, and uh, I say, or they ask me, okay. You know, you claim to be sent by God. What's his name? In other, in other words, th- th- it's not like a password situation. I would suggest to you that Moses is asking the question because he doesn't know, right? He doesn't know. Uh, otherwise, why would you ask the question? If you knew the, the answer to the question you're anticipating, you wouldn't need to ask the question. But since he asked the question, and now catch this, the answer is verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. That suggests that the Israelites back in, e- in Egypt, they had heard that name before. Now, again, you can go back to the previous episodes and talk about how that might have been. But Moses doesn't know, and, and that's reasonable for him to not know this name. It's, it's equally plausible that the Israelites back in Egypt did know this name. You know, and if you go back to the prior episodes, you know, this, this comes up. It's not just me. I mean, there, there are scholars who aren't theologically at all invested in this that I mentioned last time. Like Van der Torn was one where he says, look, you know, if, if the Midianites, if the Kenites you know, had heard this name, th- these guys are itinerant. They're travelers. They're merchants. They go all over the place, including Egypt. And they're going to be trading, not just with Egyptians, but you're going to have Semites down there who are in charge of Egyptian stuff, Egyptian households. They're going to either introduce this name based upon the you know, alternate line, the, the non-Jacob line of, of, of Israel, or this is a name that, again, both lines had heard of at some point. But Moses gets turned over to Pharaoh's household when he's weaned. You know, he's a toddler. He's, he's two years old or whatever, and he's raised in Pharaoh's household. It's entirely reasonable he has, he has never heard this, and he needs the answer. Why else would you ask the question? And again, since God gives him the answer that will satisfy the leadership in Israel, back in, or the leadership of Israel back in Egypt, they had to have heard the name. So uh, again, that, this is going to affect how we think about Exodus 6.3 as we, as we continue. We'll, we'll hit that point later on. But it's just an interesting thing to observe here in the text. Uh, another thing, again, this is just a little, a little bit scattershot here, but there's just some interesting things going on. If you look at verse 7, the Lord is the one speaking all this. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, so on and so forth, and I'm going to send you, Moses. And look at verse 12. God, Yahweh, is the speaker, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Yahweh refers to God in the third person. Again, this is akin to some of these other things. Again, if you've read Unseen Realm or if you've heard me lecture on the two powers in heaven, this is another one of these passages. Now, you know, it, one, you know, one instance of God referring to God in the third person, that's known as iliism. Uh, it doesn't necessarily suggest you know, a Godhead situation. It depends on the context of the particular passage. It's kind of interesting here you know, because you do have a second figure in the bush. Uh, you know, I don't know how far we can push it in this passage, but you know, there's certainly again in the history of uh, Jewish thinking about these sorts of passages. Uh, and I talk about this in my two powers lectures, that, that some of these really drew attention. And started the you know rabbinic thinkers down a particular road, and I would say you know not just rabbinic thinkers. I'm thinking of Alan Siegel's work there, the Two Powers in Heaven, because after the first century, beginning into the second century, the Judaism changed its theology uh, to make this the second power idea a heresy, and that's in part you know certainly in response to, to Christians and their idea of a Godhead. But the point is that there was a Godhead kind of thing going on in the Old Testament, and at one point in Judaism this was fine. You, know, you look at Second Temple literature, the intertestamental period. There's there's like eight or nine different candidates for who the second power is in the literature of that period. It was widely discussed in the Jewish community, and it was perfectly fine until the Christians came along. Then it was something that needed to be dealt with. But this is just another example of this kind of thing that would stimulate the discussion or contribute something to the discussion. Right here it is in Exodus 3, you know, the Lord referring to God in the third person. 
which is kind of interesting. Um, we get to verse 14. Again, here's where we're really going to camp for the rest of the episode. In response to Moses' question, you know, if they ask me, what's his name? What shall I say? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And this is the revelation of the divine name. Now, Carpenter, in his commentary, has, you know, I think a pretty succinct and helpful summary here of uh, sort of the options you know, that scholars have come up with as far as what does this mean? Because everybody wants to know what, well, what does the name of God mean? Because biblical names, I mean, this is pretty common knowledge, biblical names typically have meanings. Either their constituent parts, you know, form a sentence or, or something like that, or the name, you know, is corresponded to some other thing. Uh, so what, is, what does God's name mean? And scholars have just, you know, this is well traversed territory. Um, for, for anybody really interested, it's, it's kind of a central passage. You really have more than just that issue. It's not just the meaning, but there's also the issue of the pronunciation. You know, how should God's name be pronounced? So you've got kind of two issues here, but Carpenter, I think, has a decent summary. Um, and, and here it is. He, he says, you know, three main suggestions have been put forth to pinpoint the meaning of God's name and its proper translation. Uh, number one, uh, he says, one option stresses the presence of Yahweh. And so there are some scholars who would translate, I am here with you. I will be with you. Uh, Carpenter says, this is clearly a part of the context. I mean, verse 12 indicates that this narrowing of the name and its meaning is possible. Verse 12. Uh, God says to Moses, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you. And then that, that prompts you know, Moses' question, well, if they ask me what, what, what your name is, what do I say? But, so that this idea of, of the name actually meaning or sort of being uh, focused on presence is, is one sort of trajectory that has been followed in scholarship. So trying to take the context or, or take verse 14 and make, the, make its context verse 12, this idea of God being with uh, someone. So I am that I am meaning, well, God, just, God is promising to be, to be there. He's I am, and I'm going to be with you. So again, scholars try to connect those two ideas. Second, Others have championed something like, quote, I am he who causes to be all that is. I am him who causes to be, uh, unquote. So this, Carpenter says, argues for a, again, sorry for the, the grammar speak here, argues for a hifil stem, a causative vocalization of the verbal name phrase. So the, the name comes, as it's given here, from haya. And we talked about in, in South Semitic that the root might, might mean uh, to blow. And so you get he blows, which is a reference to the wind on the top of the mountain, the storm, you know, theophany kind of thing. We talked about that uh, a week or so ago. About it. if you were in Midian and you were a South Semitic language speaker, you might you know, be thinking of, of that verbal root in association with the YHW or YW name. Okay? On the West side, the West Semitic, when Hebrew is part of this, the, the root would be the to be verb, haya, which in older Semitic would be hava, HWH versus HYH. They mean exactly the same thing, and they are the exact same thing. Uh, again, without getting into historical grammar, the Y and the W were interchangeable in a number of words in uh, Semitic languages. So, if you're looking at it from the West Semitic side, you've got the to be verb. And so the translation in the first person is I am. Okay, I am who I am. But if you go to the third person, now you have something a little bit different, which is this number two option about causation. So if you wanted to drill down and get all the nuts and bolts details of this, I'm going to, I'm going to direct you to my website. Go to drmsh.com. Just put it into Google, drmsh.com and put in YHWH. You're going to find the page where I discuss all this in, in sort of excruciating detail. But when God answers Moses' question, I am, that is the first person. Uh, first person is is me. I'm number one. Okay. First person is I with verbs. I run. I pass. You know. I you know. I chase or something. That, that's first person language. Second person is you. You run. You chase. You pass. Okay. And then third person is somebody else. So it's I, you, and then everybody else. So he. Now in Hebrew, you take a verb like the to be verb, the haya, and the way you express the third person is to stick a y on the front, a prefix. So now now you have y h w h, which is the divine name in the third person. Now, how do we pronounce that? In in if you use the same Hebrew stem as the first person here, it would be yeh yeh. And it means he is or he will be. The problem with that, though, is in the Hebrew Bible, you have a short form of the divine name, just the first syllable, Y-H. And it's always with an A vowel, Yah, always. So Yah, we, instead of Yeh, we, or Yeh, yeah. Again, the Y and the W are exchangeable in, in, uh, in older Hebrew. So if you have an A vowel under the first syllable, there's only one way to sort of account for that grammatically. An A-class vowel followed by an I-class vowel is the hifil. It is the causative stem. And that's why many scholars argue, look, if you've got a to-be verb, and the short form has an A vowel, Yahweh, that means he who causes something to be. He who, 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 I guess that's the best way to say it. He who causes to be. He who creates, it's really a statement of creation, you know, creator, uh, a, a deity with the ability to make something real that has not yet existed. Okay? He who causes to be, who brings something into being. And this, is, you know, this has a long history in uh, scholarship and in discussion of the name. Uh, W.F. Albright argued for this back in the 20s. Uh, and later, um, Frank Moore Cross from Harvard, uh, who was Albright's student. Uh, you know, Cross is very familiar to anybody who read Biblical Archaeology Review in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, he argued for this position. Cross's article is kind of famous, Yahweh and the God of the Patriarchs, Harvard Theological Review, Volume 55, 1962, is sort of his, his full explication of this. Um, David Noel Friedman, in Journal of Biblical Literature in the 60s as well, argued for this. So these are, these are some top-tier scholars uh, of, of their time, their era, arguing for a causative understanding of the name. Third option, we'll return to the, to the, the causative in, in a moment, but the third option, is other scholars sort of opt for a more straightforward translation of the verbal phrase as it stands, this is Carpenter's wording, and as it is vocalized in the MT. So they, they would actually just not sort of 
favor, or I'm, I'm going to be a little bit blunt here, not really pay attention to the short form, the A vowel. They would go with ye, the, or ye, yeah, third person of the, of the verbal to be root. And they would translate, I will be who I will be. And the implication for those who take this position is that Yahweh will reveal who he is through the things he is about to do to deliver Israel. And again, I mean, you, you can make a good you know, argument for that in the context. But those are the three uh, views that, that uh, Carpenter outlines. I'm going to add a fourth view here. And this is from a, an article that I am putting in the protected folder. It's, it's actually something you could Google and find it online. It's, it's, you know, there's a link to it online in various places. It's by Charles Isbell. That's I-S-B-E-L. And the title is The Divine Name, um, and it has Hebrew characters here, but The Divine Name, Ehya, as a symbol of presence in Israelite tradition. And the publication is the Hebrew Annual Review, Volume 2, 1978, and it's 17 pages, pages 101 through 118. You know, I put this in the folder. What's interesting about this is Isbell's article focuses on the first person form, that, that God's name, in, not just in this passage, because look, look, look at what God says here. Moses asks him, you know, what, what's your name? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He doesn't say, no, you should call me Yahweh. You know, he, he doesn't use the third person. God says, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am, eh, yeah, has sent me to you. He doesn't say, say to the people of Israel, Yah, the, has sent me to you. If you actually you know, look at in the passage what God's answer is, he uses the first person instead of the third person. And so Isbel, his article is, is focused on this. He basically asks kind of a logical question. Well, are there other passages in the Hebrew Bible where the first person form is used as a proper name? And, and there are a handful. I mean, there's like a couple thousand in the third person. But there actually are a couple of instances where the first person form is used as a name. So I want to throw Isbel in here because this is a, a bit of a different trajectory that, that's interesting. And I'm going to read you a, a few things um, by way of summary here. Um, again, you can reference Isbell's work here, but just again, trying to summarize the content for the sake of the episode here. He, he writes, and again, part of this is him, part of this is me summarizing. It is necessary to establish from the beginning the fact that both in biblical and post-biblical traditions, eh, yeah, again, the first person form, is used as a proper noun, essentially as an allomorph of the more common form, Yahweh. Now, an allomorph is an alternate form. That's, that's all the fancy linguistic word allomorph means. So Isbell's saying, it, it's just a fact that you're going to have instances where the first person form is used like an alternative, proper name an alternative to the third person form that is much more common. Back to the content here, clearly the starting point for this understanding must be Exodus 3.14, as Bell says, where it has long been recognized that the phrase, eh, yeah, has sent me, is the precise equivalent of Yahweh has sent me in the very next verse. Now, let's go back to Exodus 3 now. I'm going to read it. I'm going to start in verse 13 again. I just look at what, what the text does. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Ehya, asher, ehya, okay? And he said, again, he, God is still the speaker. And he, God said, say this to the people of Israel. I am, ehya, has sent me to you. Now here's verse 15. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Both verses have God saying to Moses, say this to them. And they both have a deity has sent me to you. But in verse 14, it's ehya, and verse 15, it's Yahweh. Or Yahya, you know, however you want to you know, say that. Y, the, the Y and the W again are, are interchangeable. So Ehya, Yahweh, v- back to back, those two verses, first person, third person, in exactly the same formulation as God's answer to Moses, which is really interesting. And it's very easy to not notice that. So back to Isbel, he says the third example, again, in, in the course of his article, he has other examples, but he, 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 refers, he refers to a couple of things. Like one of the things, he refers to Psalm 50, uh, I think it's Psalm 50 or 51. I thought, yeah, it's Psalm 50, verse 21, he uses. And then his third example is one I'm going to pluck out here. Well, you know, I might as well take him in order. The three examples that Isbel uses are Psalm 50, 21, 2 Samuel 7, 6, and Hosea 1, 9. He says in all three of these, these instances, the, the Hebrew syntax, and again, if you know some Hebrew, you'll benefit from, from Isbel's article. If you don't, you, know, you, you can still get some things out of it, which is why I put it in the folder, and you can Google it too. But in, in all three of these verses, the, the, the grammar, the syntax, not only allows for eh, yeah, to be a proper personal deity name, but pretty much requires it. I mean, he makes a good argument. Uh, Hosea 1, 9, the ESV has, has it, translates it this way. And the Lord said, call his name, not my people. Again, this is the child of you know, Hosea and Gomer. Okay, call his name not my people, for you are not my people. And ESV has, I am not your God. But what Isabel says is the way you really should translate this is, you are not my people, and I am is not your God. Like it's an actual proper name. Second Samuel seven six, God says again to David, this is the Davidic covenant passage. I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. Isabel argues that the last part of that verse should be translated, I am has been moving about in a tent. Okay, for my dwelling. So that the point would be, eh, yeah, as a proper name, was the one you know, traveling in the tent and living in the tabernacle, that kind of thing. So again, his argument is going to be you know, grammatical and syntactical. Uh, what's the last one? Um, or the other one that we didn't get to yet. Psalm 50, 21. These things you have done, and I have been silent, and thought that I was, you thought that I was one like yourself. But now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. So that's ESV. Isabel argues this. He, he says it should be translated something like this. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I am was like you but now I'm going to rebuke you. Okay, so on and so forth. So he points out these three passages, and here's his conclusion. 
Again, if you're interested in this, I, I find it personally interesting. You can get the article. But here's Isbell's conclusion why I wanted to lump him in the, in the name discussion. He, he writes, The self-disclosure of Yahweh plainly included the willingness to speak a personal word about himself, to put himself on the spot promissorily. Like God's going to promise Moses some things here. And openly. It included his readiness to say, I will be with you. I will become God to you. And to say these things before his capacity to act changingly had been demonstrated in a given situation, but also before the capacity of Israel to be a people in a new situation had been demonstrated. In short, Yahweh's self-disclosure involved no less than his willingness to say to Israel, I am. In other words, this is my name, I am. And, and is, the Israelites were supposed to, to, to again think or conclude that, well, that that can only mean one thing. God is going to be with us. He's, he's promised to be with us and he will be with us. In other words, Isabel you know, is saying this is what their response would have been to the first person, I am. And that's your answer, I am. So he links it to, to the promise language that you're going to find a little bit you know, as, we, as we keep reading and, and then the acts that God does you know, in history for Israel. Isabel continues, for Israel, this divine willingness to say, eh, yeah, I am imply that faith must not be withheld until after a demonstration of divine power. Let me just stop there. When God says, I am, God expected them to respond with faith. Well, that's the answer. We wanted to know, you know what, what, what was going on, and God says, you know, here's my name, I am. They were supposed to interpret that as a promise to be with them and then respond accordingly before God ever even got down to business, before he did anything spectacular. He, was, he wanted them to respond in faith. Of course, look, look what Moses does. It's anything but a response to faith, and he's the leader. Um, but, but again, Isabel is arguing that, that this, is, this is the point. He, you know, faith must not be withheld until after a demonstration of divine power, faith which could be could so easily be retracted at the hint of a new crisis in which God had not yet acted specifically and openly to the satisfaction of everyone. Thus, if the saying of eh, yeah, I am, meant that God had accepted his covenant responsibility to Israel in advance, okay, in advance of and irregardless of particular untoward circumstances, it also constituted a challenge for Israel to respond covenantally as people in advance of whatever might lie in the future. For the faith of Israel to become as forward-looking as was the promise of God to be present would be to approach the real meaning of being a people and would make possible the desired relationship of covenant. That's the end of, the, of his conclusion. So I, I think this is a really worthwhile article. It's going to sound new because everybody's sort of fixated on Yahweh. And again, for the, I, I still for the life of me don't understand why people get hung up on this. Oh, the right pronunciation of God's name is Yahshua or Yushua or you know, you know, the alphabet soup with the two consonants or whatever. You know, why do we get fixed on this? I mean, people, there are people out there who spend more time on this and, and they're not linguistically informed than they do on the Great Commission or something you know, that, that Jesus told us to do. Or, you know, I, I still don't understand it. But what, what apparently they don't get is that, uh, yeah, guess what? That's a proper name for God too. And, and you'll never see that brought into the discussion because that you know, rattles the cage. It's, it's, it's a fly in the ointment you know, for, for, for these people that are fixated on this kind of discussion. Again, that for the most part, they don't get right anyway. Um, you know, I, I, some, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I can't tell what in the world, you know, where in the world they're coming from as far as the pronunciation is offered. Sometimes they're clear. You know, they have some relationship to, to uh, Hebrew, like, you know, it's like the first syllable especially. But again, this is not a hill to die on, the exact pronunciation. You've actually got, you know, I'll throw Isabel in here. You know, and that's just the first person. So you've got three reasonable approaches to the third person form. Um, and you've got one that focuses on the first person form. They're all viable. Uh, and, and I think regardless of which of the three third person forms you pick, the first person form is there. It, it just is what it is, pardon the pun. Um, so you have to accept that in, in, in your talk about God's name as well. You just must because that's what the text has in a few places. Um, where I'm at, I'm still at number two, uh, the, the Hithil form of the third person. People, again, can go up to my website. Again, put it in Google, drmsh.com and the four consonants, YHWH, you're going to find the page. I, I still think number two is appealing. I have a detailed discussion up there. Uh, I favor the second view of the third person translation. I am he who causes to be you know, all that is. And it, it just makes sense to me. I have also, um, we're going to have a link to this on the episode page. Uh, there's also a video of me on YouTube going through you know, some, some software. It's a screen capture video of, of why, the, why the pronunciation you know, is what it is, you know, that, that sort of thing. And it's not something else. So if you want more detail, you can drill down on those things. So I don't, I don't really see anything. There's no conclusive argument against number two. Now, people, scholars, you know, pick at it because they, they'll say things like, well, you know, the, the haya or the hava verb, we don't see that in the Hithil causative stem in any other of the Northwest Semitic languages. Okay. Do we, do we have to have a corresponding Northwest Semitic form for every blasted word in the vocabulary of, of the Hebrew Bible? Is, is that, do we have to have that? No. And, and it doesn't work in reverse either. I mean, nobody's going to say, well, look at this form in Ugaritic. You know, no, I reject that because I can't find that form in the Hebrew Bible. That can't be real Semitic. Nobody says that. So I think that that sort of criticism is skewered. Uh, again, I'm not going to get into what might be the motivating such things, but that's the kind of argument you'll see against taking the third person form as a Hithil causative stem form. I just don't find that persuasive. I, I don't really see any reason that this can't be. It, it makes a lot of sense. But again, the other options are, are viable too. And I do really appreciate Isabel's contribution with the first person form of the name. I want to take some, some sidebar notes now on the divine name itself. There are just a few interesting things that I think you know, this audience will, will appreciate and do a little bit of drill down here just to talk about the name in, in maybe a slightly different way. In Sarna's commentary, his Exodus commentary, he writes this, eh yeah, asher, eh yeah. And this phrase has variously been translated. I am that I am. I am who I am. I will be that I will be or what I will be. It clearly evokes Yahweh, you know, Y-H-W-H, the specific proper name of Israel's God. Again, that's the third person form. The one known in English as the Tetragrammaton, that is the four consonants. The phrase also indicates that the earliest recorded understanding of the divine name was as a verb derived from the stem 
HVH, Hava, or H, you know, YH, Haya. Uh, HVH is, is an earlier form of HYH, the to be verb. Either it expresses the quality of absolute being, the eternal, unchanging, dynamic presence, or it means he causes to be. And there's the Hifil you know, perspective. YH, WH is the third person masculine singular. Echya is the corresponding first person singular. This latter is used here because name giving in the ancient world implied the wielding of power over the one named. This is all a little sidebar to the sidebar. This is why, like in demonic texts, you know, uh, an exorcist will want to know the name of the demon because it was believed that if you had the name of the demon, you could exercise power over it. Um, this, this sort of thinking. Um, like back to Sarna. This latter is used here because name giving in the ancient world implied the wielding of power over the one name. Hence, the divine name can only proceed from God himself. So what, what Sarna is saying, the reason God uses the first person here is so that the person asking for the information couldn't use the third person and get it right. Now, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of an interesting note. Maybe that's in view. Again, it's, you're not going to find a whole lot of defense of that idea, but you know, it's interesting for what it's worth. And Sarna then adds an interesting note. I catch this. In the course of the second temple period, let me repeat that. In the course of the second temple period, Second temple period, roughly in round numbers, is 500 BC to 70 AD or 100 AD. We'll, we'll make it even rounder. Okay. In the course of the second temple period, the tetragrammaton came to be regarded as charged with metaphysical potency, and therefore ceased to be pronounced. It was replaced in speech by Adonai, Lord, rendered in Greek Koryos. Often, the vowels of Adonai would later accompany YHWH in written texts when vowels were added in the early medieval period. This gave rise to the mistaken form, the mistaken form Jehovah. The original pronunciation was eventually lost in modern attempts at recovery are conjectural at the end of the selection. What do I want you to notice there? That people only got the notion, as far as the textual evidence, okay, and then the historical evidence goes, they only got the notion of not pronouncing the name in the Second Temple period. That means earlier, we have no idea if Israelites felt free to say Yahweh or eh, yeah, they very well could have. So this, this, this notion that from the moment of the conversation on Sinai at the burning bush, people would not pronounce the name of God, there's actually no way to prove that and there's no proof for it. In the Second Temple period, there's a lot of proof for it, because that is the point. That's the point, textually, where we see these kind of changes with the divine name happen in the text. So it, it's an assumption that you, know, you couldn't pronounce the name as an Israelite really prior to 500 BC, but there's, there's, there's no way to establish that. Um, Anchor Bible Dictionary adds this. The form Jehovah results from reading the consonants of the Tetragrammaton, again, YHWH, with the vowels of the surrogate word Adonai. Now you say word, Adonai begins with A, Jehovah begins with E. How does that work? It's a feature of Hebrew consonants. Okay, Adonai is a guttural. It begins with a guttural consonant. And the shva, the vocal shva under a guttural is going to be the A class. The Jehovah begins with a yod. That is not a guttural. And so the vocal shva under that will be eh. Yeah, end of linguistic spasm there. But they're, they're the same thing. It's just they're linguistic reasons why one is a ah or a and one is e. Okay, back to the, to the, the selection. The form Jehovah results from reading the consonants of the tetragrammaton with the vowels of the surrogate Adonai. The dissemination of this form is usually traced to Petrus Galatinus, confessor to Pope Leo X, who in 1518 AD, transliterated the four Hebrew letters with the Latin letters, okay, J-H-V-H, together with the vowels of Adonai, producing the artificial form Jehovah. This confused usage may, however, have begun as early as 1100 AD. I mean, there is a manuscript or two that you, know, you, you can show to, to, to make that argument. While the hybrid form Jehovah has met much resistance and is universally regarded as an ungrammatical aberration, it nonetheless passed from Latin into English and other European languages and has been hallowed by usage in hymns and the ASV. It is used only a few times in the KJV and not at all in the RSV. And that's from Thompson's article on Yahweh in the Anchor Bible Dictionary. Why do I bring this up? First, Jehovah is an artificial form. It is an incorrect form. Uh, whether you want to tell that to Jehovah's Witnesses or not, that's up to you. And frankly, it isn't going to matter to them. They're, they're, Jehovah's Witnesses, A, they don't know Hebrew, and B, if, you know, they're not Hebrew linguists. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's not going to phase them. So I, I wouldn't bother with that. It, it's more something that you should know. Um, I used to, when I had uh, seminary students, again, who, who had at least a year of Hebrew, I would mark off if I ever saw Jehovah in a paper. And I would say, you should know better. Okay, just stop it. Why did you take first year? I mean, I wasn't this cruel, okay? What, you know, why did you take first year Hebrew? I mean, like, like, get with the program here. Know what's going on. So that's, I, I bring it up for that reason. And, and also, again, to show you how recent this is. I mean, you have a really good textual basis for saying, uh, this is like around the time of Luther. You know, this starts maybe earlier, but it's not anywhere close to being in the biblical period. At the earliest, this is 1100 AD. That would be over a millennium after Jesus. Okay, we're not we're in two millennium when you go back into the Old Testament period. That's a long time. So I don't want to hear this talk about Jehovah, you know, being the, the, the actual you know, name of God. It's not. It's not. It has a traceable history. Another publication, I put this one in the folder as well, uh, by Kristen Detroyer. This article is called The Names of God, Their Pronunciation, and Their Translation. Subtitle, A Digital Tour of Some of the Main Witnesses. Again, you can actually find that on the internet, but I put it in the folder anyway. The last name is D-E with a space and then Detroyer, T-R-O-Y-E-R. Kristen Detroyer, The Names of God. Put that into Google, you'll find it, or you can use the uh, protected folder. You have to be a newsletter subscriber to get to the protected folder. Detroit writes this on pages three to five. I'm just plucking out a few paragraphs here and there on, on pages three and five. What does one read in old codices, such as Codex Leningrad and Codex Aleppo? And I'll stop there. These are the two oldest, complete or mostly complete manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible that we have. Leningradensis is the oldest complete Hebrew Bible. And, and we know 
uh, I'm trying to remember, I always get this, I always have to look it up, but I didn't look it up before. It's either 1007 or 1107 AD, because the, the, the scribe, the copy has put, put the date on it. Aleppo is not complete. It's missing most of the Torah uh, because of a fire, but that's in the 900s, okay? What do those manuscripts, how, how do they point or vocalize the divine name? Good question. Most of the printed Hebrew Bibles, this is back to Detroit, most of the printed Hebrew Bibles are based on Codex Leningrad or Leningradensis. A codex dated to, there we go, 1007, 1008. Um, she has, I've seen the other one, but just, just say 1008 since we're dealing with her article here. Located at the Library of St. Petersburg, again in, in Russia. This codex is the oldest complete Hebrew Bible. Most scholarly editions of the Bible are based on this codex. Uh, that's certainly true. Uh, there is a Hebrew Bible project in operation now that's using Aleppo as its starting point, but you know, we'll wait for that to get completed. Back to Detroit. The usual form of the name of God, however, in Codex Leningrad is, now this is interesting, here's how it's pointed. It's YHWH, again, reading right to left here in Hebrew, or you know, in English, YHWH, it has the E vowel and the final A vowel. In other words, there is no O vowel. Let me say that again. The usual form of the name of God in Codex Leningradensis does not have the O vowel. So again, if you have people, oh, Jehovah, I mean, Leningradensis, no, 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 no. And may I add, no. It has yeah and then va, yeah, va. There's no O vowel. There's a, a you know, the, the scribe just didn't, that wasn't the way you, you pronounced it. That wasn't the way you pointed it. Uh, the oval is missing. So Detroit says, in other words, there's a whole one, an O sound missing in the printed form of the Tetragrammaton. The first form, um, this, this E, and Ye, Va, E, A, and with a missing O, her, her approach, it's not unique to her, but she says this, this form can be read as the Aramaic noun Shema, because that has the E, A, which is the word for the name, the divine name. So she, her, her view is that the reason why they took the four consonants in Leningradensis, or, you know, and Leningradensis, again, is early 11th century, and, and that's going to be a copy of a copy of a copy. It has a long history. So, you know, Back into the, into the early Middle Ages, we'll say, when they wanted to add vowels to the divine name, they added an E sound, it's a vocal shava, and then the comments on the last syllable. Taking the vowels not from Adonai, Adonai has an O vowel in there, but taking the vowels from Shema, the name. And if you take those vowels, put them into the four consonants, two vowels plus four consonants, you get Ye, Va. Okay? It, it's just kind of interesting. It's, maybe it's, it's a little bit of Masoretic trivia, I don't know. But it, it makes sense that they would do that. The name, okay, we'll take the vowels from the name and put them in the name. Makes sense. Yeah, but Jehovah is, does, does not have a, a, a traceable history back into the major manuscripts is the point. Uh, she, or, or Detroit, I don't know if it's a, a woman or a man, Kristen, with a K, probably, probably a woman, but I was going to say Detroit, continuing, writes this. Indeed, like many Jewish readers of the Bible today do, God is referred to in the margins of the Masoretic Bible as Ha Shema, the name, the Jewish Aramaic word for the name. The oldest complete copy of the Hebrew Bible does hence not render the Tetragrammaton with the Lord, I don't know, but with the name. Similarly, Codex Aleppo and the editions of the Rabbinic Bible have the same thing, have the name instead of Adonai. That's where they take the vowels too. Now she, she or he says, I acknowledge that there are a couple of exceptions to this rule, namely a couple of places where Codex Leningradensis has Adonai as a kere. Okay, the kere is, 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 is a note in the margin from another scribe that says this is what you should read. Uh, but what's actually in the text doesn't have the O vowel, but some scribe came along and in, in a few places put in the margin, read this. You can read it with the O vowel. <laughs> Again, so you, you had somebody at some point want to do it differently in a handful of places. Not at certain, nowhere near every place, but you know, a handful of places. So Detroit is acknowledging that. Then uh, he or she moves on to another point and asks, was the name pronounced or not? There is no explanation as to why the Tetragrammaton was no longer pronounced. Moreover, all hypotheses regarding the origins of the Kathiv Kare phenomenon, Kathiv is what is read, what you find in the text, and then Kare is this marginal note, here's what to read. All hypotheses regarding the origins of that system, the Kathiv Kare phenomenon, are speculative. In the Jewish tradition, there are plenty of statements regarding the non pronunciation of the name of God. In the Mishnah, Tractate Sanhedrin 10 1, for instance, it is clearly stated that the name of God cannot be pronounced. Now, that, let me stop there. That's the Mishnah. All right, this is, this is medieval. This is rabbinic stuff. This isn't biblical stuff. Uh, again, I recently posted something about why we shouldn't be appealing to, you know, to rabbis for, for biblical exegesis. The, you know, I, just, I don't know how much clearer I can make it. The rabbinic period in history is not synonymous with the biblical period. It's later. In some cases, centuries. Maybe, you know, in some cases, even a millennium. Okay? This is Mishnah. So by the time of the Mishnah, in your early midi Middle Ages, okay, there is commentary about not pronouncing the name. Only the high priest, back to Detroit, only the high priest, more specifically on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, can utter the name of God. All other Jews are not supposed to pronounce the name of God. This, this is the, the opinion that's in the Mishnah. Continuing, from a difference between the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible and its Greek Septuagint translation, Martin Rizal deduces that only by the time of the Greek translation of the book of Leviticus, the Tetragrammaton was no longer pronounced. And again, the Septuagint is Second Temple period. That's when the Septuagint was translated. Back to Detroit, according to most scholars, this was somewhere at the end of the third century BCE. The Septuagint of Leviticus reads, Quote, and he that names the name of God, let him die the death, unquote. Whereas the Hebrew text can be read as, quote, he who uses the name of God in vain, unquote. So the Septuagint gets interpreted there. It takes the Hebrew, he who uses the name of God in vain, or takes the name, of, you know, lifts up the name of the Lord in vain. The Septuagint interprets that to say that you shouldn't name the name of God. And again, she's quoting a scholar that says, this is the earliest kind of reference I can find to this sort of mentality. 
So again, back to Sarna, this is what Sarna had said. In the second temple period is when you start to see this transition uh, toward not saying the divine name. But before that, you don't. You don't have that. Um, there is also the Isaiah Qumran scroll. This is the great Isaiah scroll, 1Q Isaiah, A, that reads Adonai in 3.7, where the Masoretic text has the Tetragrammaton. So in that text, there's a substitution. The scribe of you know, the Isaiah scroll there did not write the Tetragrammaton, but actually put in the word Adonai. Detroyer says, this means that by the late 2nd century BCE, the presumed date of the Isaiah scroll, the Tetragrammaton might have been read as Adonai. So it's, it's suggestive of that. One uh, last comment from uh, Detroyer. The names of God section in her, or her or his you know, essay. There are two important collections of data that one has to take into account when dealing with the name of God, the Elephantine papyri and the Samaritan papyri from Wadi Dalia. They show that the following names of God were in use. Okay, so now you're going back to the 5th century BC. This is earlier. Well, it's earlier in the Second Temple period, you know, but almost back you know, to the, you know, the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. Let's just think of it that way. They show that the following names of God were in use. You have YHWH, YHW, YHH, Yaho, vocalized, or Yahoo, and YH, which would be Yah. The Elephantine papyri date to the 5th century BC. The Wadi Dalia papyri stem from the 4th century BCE. The Elephantine papyri contain the correspondence from the Jewish officials of the Elephantine community to the officials in Samaria and Jerusalem regarding the rebuilding of their recently destroyed temple. So if you push it back a little bit, there are multiple forms of the divine name in those texts. Again, and this is a period before the, the texts were, you know, before the vows were added. The, the vows were only added, again, in the, the Middle Ages. But in the Second Temple period, before the vows were added, you have things like scribes taking the divine name out and putting an Adonai, or you have you know, the instance that, that we just read where they'll do some other kind of thing in the text to, to make it seem, again, like you know, they're, they're trying not to write it or pronounce it. You only see that, you again, begin, and the evidence for, for that is right around the 3rd century BCE, or BC, right in the middle, you know, so to speak, of the Second Temple period. The, you go know, a century earlier, and you have texts that not only have the four consonants in there, but they actually have variations. And some of the variations can only be vocalized one way, like YH, yeah, um, even though they don't have vowels in them, but that, that's, that's the textual situation as it is. So at least back then, there, there doesn't seem to be any predilection towards swapping the divine name out. But a century later, you, know, you start to see that. And you, know, you, you go a little bit beyond that, and that's when, you know, back to Sarna, Sarna says, it's really in this period that you start to see this notion develop that you, you shouldn't pronounce uh, the divine name. But before that, you actually can't argue that. There, there's actually no evidence for it. So, you know, should we really be taking a second temple sort of custom, scribal custom, and presuming that when scribes sat down in the exile or earlier to write a biblical text or to edit a biblical text, that they were doing this kind of thing. We really can't. We don't have any evidence for it. So you know, just take that for what it's worth. It's just kind of interesting. Well, let's go to verse 18. We're going to finish the chapter here. Just a few more observations. We'll be out of chapter three finally. Verse 18, we read this. Uh, you know, we've had this conversation with God. You know, this is my name, so on and so forth. You, know, you go to the, you know, to, the, to the leadership in Israel. Verse 18, we read, they will listen to your voice. God says to Moses, look, they'll, they'll listen. They will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us and now, please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. I just want to draw attention briefly to the elders here. It's kind of an overlooked group. Uh, there's some, a lot of good articles on this. Uh, Elder in the Old Testament in the in Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, uh, Davies, uh, G.H. Davies wrote that particular article. He writes this Elders are thus represented as a constant feature of Israel's life from the days of Moses to those of Ezra. And they were as prominent under the monarchy as before it. Elders are mentioned over 41 times in the Pentateuch. And that's a lot more than you would think. Carpenter in his commentary adds Elders are mentioned at least 12 times in Exodus. From 3.16 to Exodus 24.14, Moses always works with or through them, never against them. But do you notice a bit of a problem here, or at least some would say this is a problem? You have back again in verse 16, you know, go and gather the elders of Israel together. And then verse 18, God says, look, they're going to listen to you. You and the elders go to the king, blah, 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 blah. Some would say, well, that's anachronistic because we only get elders in Exodus 18. You know, with Jethro, hey, you need some help here, Moses, you need to appoint people. But it's, it's actually not. This verse doesn't preempt or, or it's not misplaced before Exodus 18. Because in Exodus 18, you don't have the word elders. Moses, at Jethro's advice, appoints judges. It's a different word. Specifically, Exodus 18, 21, 22 uh, is where you get this. So we don't have anachronistic things. There's going to be anachronistic things in Exodus, and we'll hit them when we come there. But my point is that you know, if, you, if you see, if you come, come along, you know, this, this sort of thing, it's not anachronistic. There's not a one-to-one -one equation between judges and elders, okay? even though a lot of the discussion sort of assumes that. Sarna adds that the elders of verse 16 are the elders, Hebrew Zechanim, who are frequently mentioned in the Exodus narratives, though little information about them is offered. I mean, as you said, it's, it's more than a dozen times, even in the book itself. And over 40 times, you know, just generally. So, you know, what, what do we have here? When Moses goes to the Israelite leadership in Egypt, again, at, at the end of chapter 4, Exodus 4.31 is when he actually gets around to doing this. And when he meets with Pharaoh, which is Exodus 5, guess what? The, the elders, the leadership that's, that's already in Egypt, and this has nothing to do with the appointees under Jethro after they get out, after they, they leave Egypt. The elders who are already there, they, actually, they do. They, they, they do what God said they would do. They believe Moses. They believe him. So God had anticipated that. Uh, and again, he had anticipated Pharaoh's resistance as well. Uh, Exodus 3, 18. Again, they will listen to your voice. You and the elders of Israel go to the king of Egypt and say, the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go out and sacrifice the Lord our God. Verse 19, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it after he will let you go. 
and I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty, but each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. That's the end of Exodus 3. Exodus 3, of course, anticipates chapter 4, and you know, chapters 4 through 6, really. And really most of what follows, you know, with respect to the confrontation with Pharaoh and the plagues and all that, God is going to do something new. He has come down, and think of that going down, coming down language. He has come down to act and fulfill his covenant and guarantees the outcome by virtue of his presence. And again, back to what Isabel said, if the whole point of using the first person is to essentially say, I am, in other words, God has decided to act now and to be with them. And he expects their response to be the same before God ever even rolls up his sleeves and gets down to business. To me, that's, that's not only interesting, but it's kind of a compelling point. It's a good preaching point, actually, of what the name itself might convey in that particular form. So you know, we're set up now to get into Exodus uh, 4 and the confrontation with Pharaoh, I think, pretty well, you know, as far as what God expects, what God has promised both directly and, and implicitly uh, for the rest of the story.